Muito bom dia a todos. Vamos iniciar, vamos iniciar as nossas jornadas. Queria dar uh, as boas-vindas uh, às de, uh, 16ª Jornadas Internacionais de Medicina Veterinária, que decorrem em momento especial, um quarto de século, 25 anos, após a criação do curso de Medicina Veterinária nesta Universidade. Estamos de parabéns, estamos a comemorar as bodas de prata. Uh, merece especial, merece ser especial real e agradecimento os organizadores destas jornadas que à semelhança do que, tem, do que tem ocorrido ao longo dos anos investem o seu esforço e dinamismo nestas realizações dando o seu melhor aos palestrantes agradecemos a aceitação e presença com a qual enriquece o conteúdo científico, teórico e prático destas sessões ao nosso magnífico reitor o nosso bem-aja por toda a abertura e apoio concedido ao curso de medicina veterinária. Termino desejando que estas jornadas sejam proveitosas para todos nós. Vou dar a palavra. Hum. Vou dar a palavra à nossa diretora de curso, professora Felizbina Luísa. Muito bom dia a todos. Na qualidade de diretora de curso de Medicina Veterinária, as minhas primeiras palavras quero que sejam para a Associação de Estudantes, pelo seu dinamismo, por continuarem de forma permanente a colaborarem com o corpo científico do mestrado integrado e a permitirem uma, uma troca de conhecimentos, chamando a estas jornadas oradores de reconhecida valia internacional. Queria também dar, dar as boas-vindas a todos vós. Muitos dos que estão aqui são alunos de outras universidades, o que muito uh, nos agrada, no sentido em que uh, o conhecimento deve ser partilhado entre todos nós e é uma mais-valia para nós e para vocês este intercâmbio de experiências uh, e, e de conhecimento entre todos nós. Uh, queria também uh, dar uma palavra de boas-vindas a todos os juradores nacionais e estrangeiros que temos entre nós, Uh, e desejar que estas jornadas uh, decorram da melhor maneira possível e que todos uh, sintamos que este fim de semana uh, pode vir a constituir uma mais-valia uh, na, na nossa vida académica e também, muito importante, na nossa vida pessoal. Uh, e, e quero agora apenas terminar desejando que desfrutem bastante deste nosso fim de semana de, destas Jornadas Científicas Internacionais. Muito obrigada. Bom dia a todos. Na qualidade de membro da Comissão Científica, e sendo breve porque estamos já com, com algum atraso, dizer que foi um privilégio como membro desta comissão ter trabalhado com esta associação, encarnado enfim, muito bem em alguém que esteve quase ligado ao computador 24 horas por dia, o vosso, o vosso colega João que fez um trabalho fantástico eu na minha opinião, e estou cá desde o princípio das primeiras jornadas que se fizeram, e o tema neurologia já não é a primeira vez que se fala eu, enfim caio enfim, na tentação de dizer que são em termos de conteúdo programático, as melhores jornadas até hoje, em termos de conteúdo na área da Neurologia e Reabilitação Motora. O programa de exóticos é também excepcional, portanto os oradores, enfim, aqui presentes são de facto dos melhores a nível da Europa, nos seus temas, portanto dizer que, enfim, desfrutem, terem partido destes, deste fim de semana, é uh, uma palavra muito especial, um welcome para as pessoas que vêm dos Estados Unidos, a doutora Natasha, a doutora Diane Dunning uh, e também o, Vlad, o professor Vladimir Lorenzo e uh, o colega e amigo, que estive a ver se o vi aí, ainda não vi de Madrid, o professor Alfredo Bengoa, uh, portanto, eu tenho a certeza que esta sala ainda vai encher um pouco mais, espero que sim, porque, enfim, o Congresso assim o merece. bem já a todos. Uh, bom dia a todos. Antes de mais, queria cumprimentar a mesa e agradecer a presença aqui da professora Luísa Queiroga, em representação da direção de curso do Mestrado Integrado em Medicina Veterinária. Queria agradecer também à professora Aura Colasso, uh, em representação do departamento. Queria também agradecer a presença do professor Arturo Varjão, em representação da Comissão Científica destas jornadas. 
As Jornadas Internacionais já vão na 16ª edição, uh, foram 16 anos a organizar estas jornadas que têm sido um sucesso, espero que estas, estas 16ª jornadas sejam um sucesso, uh, aproveitem ao máximo, o programa científico uh, é pautado por excelentes oradores, uh, aproveitem estas jornadas. Por fim, queria desejar-vos uh, um excelente Dois excelentes dias, aproveitem ao máximo estas jornadas. Bom dia, obrigado. Eu gostaria agora de vos apresentar a professora Natasha Wolby. Dr. Natasha, uh, I want to first of all uh, welcome you at our university uh, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoy Uh, been with us uh, during these uh, two days. Um, Dr. Natasha uh, gained her, her veterinary degree from Cambridge University in 1991. Um, currently, she is a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and the past president of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine Neurology Specialty. Uh, her research interests are sp uh, spinal cord injury and neurodegenerative disease, and uh, it, was, uh, it is really, really a pleasure to um, uh, have you uh, with us uh, uh, for this um, scientific event. Please. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well. <laughs> Okay, if I hear applause, that means I've finished. I go sit down again. <laughs> I was listening, and I think I might have heard people say, bon, de, bon dia a todos. Bon yeah. dia. Bon dia a todos. <laughs> That's it. That's my Portuguese. It's perfect. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to say what a pleasure it is to be here today. I've been to Portugal before as a British tourist. So I've been to the seaside and eaten sardines and loved it. But I've never been further into Portugal and it is absolutely stunningly beautiful. So I'm delighted to be here and I'm very grateful for the hospitality that's been shown to us so far. So thank you very much for the invitation. I know we're going to enjoy it. Now, how good is your English? Do you all feel comfortable? Yeah? So if I go too fast, Just wave, stop me, ask a question, that's fine. I have an interactive talk here, but fortunately for you, I don't know your names, so I can't pick on you, okay? But I could still point to people. We'll see. So the first talk today is on gait analysis, and this is a critical, critical part, a critical skill for looking at orthopedic patients and neurologic patients, okay? So, let's just start. I would say we see a lot of really unusual gates. And this is really typical. Is it possible to have the lights down a little? <coughs> so look at this dog. This is a hairy dog. And we don't yet know whether it has any legs or not. Hard to know. It's a bit like videotaping a cat. A cat stays still or runs for its box. Okay, so this dog came in because it had a gait abnormality. And you look at a dog like this and you go, really? Okay, we believe you. So we can have a lot of challenges in trying to evaluate a gait. And my first tip, my first tip is that if an owner is holding their dog, it's paralyzed until you get them to put it down and you ask the owner to start walking out of the room. Okay, so many dogs that apparently are paralyzed, if you ask the owner to put them down, step away, and call them, suddenly they might be able to walk. Okay, that's my first tip. Okay, gait analysis. For me, the, more, the longer I'm a neurologist, the more I identify things from just looking at the gait. Hands off exam, and then I do the hands on exam to confirm what I've seen with observing the gait, okay? So it's very, very key. It's definitely one of the best ways to figure out is it an orthopedic problem or is it a neurologic problem, okay? 
I just realized I need to keep an eye on the time. I need to talk for like 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So yes, I will keep an eye on the time here. Okay. So it's very, very important. That's the main point about that. So you need to be very systematic. It doesn't matter what your system is. You can develop your own system. But try to have a system so that you will automatically always evaluate everything you need to evaluate. You need to take an accurate history. Obviously, do a physical exam. Every neurologic patient needs to get an orthopedic exam. We may not do it as well as the orthopedic surgeons, but we need to do one. Okay? And then, obviously, a neurological examination. And don't forget the gait. Now, if you have very slippery floors, slick floors, you need to take the patient outside to an area where it can walk without slipping so you can truly evaluate the gait. All right, let's talk some definitions. I guess the first question is, why do I have a picture of a little girl here? Because she's my daughter and I'm missing her. <laughs> so I put her in, OK? That's the only reason. She's not lame. At least I hope she's not lame. So lameness is really, by definition, decreased use of a limb because of pain. Okay? These animals have pain, and it makes them avoid using the limb properly. We can also see orthopedic problems that give you a gait abnormality, and it's purely because of a mechanical abnormality. So it may not be painful. It's just mechanically they can't put the limb through the normal range of motion. Okay? So then we have ataxia. And so ataxia, probably the word is pretty similar in Portuguese. It means an uncoordinated or a drunken gait. Okay? I'm sure none of you have ever been drunk, but you've probably seen your friends be drunk. And they get a <laughs> drunken gait. Okay? If you see an ataxic gait, I will tell you, for most people, it's quite simple to recognize that gait's ataxic. It's a gut feeling. You watch an animal and you say, oh, they're ataxic, OK? What you then need to do is step away and think, is it a sensory ataxia, a cerebellar ataxia, or a vestibular ataxia? Now, a sensory ataxia is really what you would see with spinal cord disease. So they cross their limbs, they knuckle their feet, they scuff their feet, OK? A cerebellar ataxia, wide base, good strength, Whereas with a sensory ataxia, they're often weak as well. So wide base, good strength, and really what you recognize is a hypermetria, an overstepping. OK? It's very easy to recognize. And then a vestibular ataxia, they've got a head tilt. They drift off to one side. They look very different again. So if you see a classic case, it's very easy to separate them. Some are not so classic and are a bit harder. Okay, so we've got some video. First of all, we have a sensory ataxia. So you can see this little dachshund, my favorite breed. I wonder why that could be. Um, and you can see that he's crossing. And he's got CP deficits. Okay. Here's a more obvious one. The dog is weak. It's parapyretic and ataxic. These legs are crossing and scuffing. The tail's working well. Very well. Okay. So these are sensory ataxias. Now, here we have a cerebellar case. It's got an intention tremor, in case you hadn't noticed. A wide base. It looks strong. And now we see the dysmetria. Very strong, normal strength, wide base, dysmetric gait, and an intention tremor. They may or may not have an intention tremor. This one's very dramatic. Okay, And then this is vestibular. A classic case, head tilt, falling to that side, walking in circles. This is a very dramatic one. If they're not that severe, they might not go in circles. They might just drift. OK, so three types of ataxia. You watch a gate. You say they're ataxic. You then try to classify that ataxia. OK, so then we have the motor side of the gate. So we've gone through lameness, orthopedic disease, ataxia, and now we've got the motor strength. So if they have de decreased strength, but they can still move the limbs, we say they're paretic. They have paresis. And we divide that usually into ambulatory. 
they're still able to bear enough weight to walk on that limb versus non-ambulatory. So they can move the limb, but they're not strong enough to actually bear weight. So if you give them a little support, they'll walk, take it away, they can't quite bear weight. If it gets more severe, they become plegic. So there is no movement whatsoever, okay? If we're talking about one limb, we say mono, to pelvic limbs, para. All four limbs, tetra. And four limb and hind limb on the same side is hemi, okay? All very obvious. All right, so now what are you going to do? So when you take your history, I would say when we're trying to distinguish a gait abnormality, orthopedic versus neurologic, we have some key questions for the owner. Question number one, when are the signs most severe, okay? So we all know that with spinal disease, typically exercise doesn't make much difference. Sometimes they do tire and get worse, but typically the owners won't be saying, oh my goodness, you know, if we um, rest them, they're much worse, etc., etc." Neuromuscular disease, exercise makes them worse, almost always, okay? Orthopedic disease, Usually, as they exercise, they improve. So that's the first question you need to ask the owner, okay? Other things I like to ask the owner, have they seen any knuckling? Have they seen them placing the paw on the dorsal surface? That's what I mean by knuckling. Have they seen a limb being held up, being carried, okay? And has there been any response to anti-inflammatory drugs? So many people will have tried an anti-inflammatory drug already. Has there been any response at all? So then we move on to the physical exam. So we really need to concentrate on certain things. First thing is, of course, are there any abnormalities on orthopedic exam? So you've got to do a careful orthopedic exam. But then for me, there are two really important questions. Question one, is the animal ataxic? Question two, are there any CP deficits? You all know what I mean by CP? Conscious proprioception. We also call it proprioceptive placing. It's that knuckling, okay? And remember that in older patients in particular, we often have both neurologic and orthopedic disease. So we will often see older German shepherds with multiple joints with orthopedic disease and then a neurologic disease superimposed. So our problem becomes trying to define which is the most important, which is causing the most problems. When I'm doing an exam, I will usually do a bit of a cheat orthopedic exam. I'll stand the animal nice and square, make sure it's got weight on all limbs, if it will, okay? And if it won't, then I can tell straight away which limbs it's favoring. And then standing over it, I'll palpate down each limb I'll feel the joints for fusion while it's still standing, and then I'll flex each limb up, okay? Just to make sure the range of the motion of the joints is normal. And then I will follow up with a good detailed orthopedic exam with them lying on their side, okay? <clears throat> now we have a couple of rules. Now remember, rules are there to be broken, okay? So rules are only useful so far. Sometimes they can lead you astray. But the first rule that I was always taught as a student is that neurological disease will cause CP deficits, so proprioceptive placing deficits, and will cause postural reaction deficits. You all know what postural reactions are? Like hopping, yes? That would be the classic one we would do, is get weight on one limb and hop them. So that's rule number two. One. Rule number two is that orthopedic disease causes lameness. So if you see lameness, that's orthopedic. If you see CP deficits, postural reaction deficits, that's neurologic. Now, you've got to be a little bit careful. So, for example, if you have an animal that's fractured its humerus, guess what? It's not going to be able to hop on that leg, okay? So that's why you always need to have your orthopedic exam and neuro exam done together. So one of the things I would say is the most common problem for students as they come through the rotation is checking conscious proprioception or proprioceptive placing. And it's very frustrating to them because they go into the room, they examine the animal, they come back out to us and they say, oh, it has CP deficits on all four limbs. And we go, really? And we go into the room, we say, no, it's got no CP deficits, okay? It's quite a subjective test. And it's all about getting the weight of the animal correctly supported. So for example, if you're testing CP in the hind limb, 
you do need to have a hand under the belly there to support some weight while you flip the foot over. You need to make sure you flip the foot over in its normal position, not way out to the side where you're giving it more stimulus. Okay? And you flip it over and then you move them a little bit to see if you move their weight onto it, will they flip the foot? So I can't really, it would be lovely to have a practical session and go through that. We can't really do more about that, but I'm going to show you a lot of videos and I'm going to show you one video in particular where a mistake was made by taking too much weight so the animal didn't care and didn't flip the foot, okay? So, as I say, very common that people have problems with that. So never take just the conscious proprioceptive deficit as your only evidence that there's neurologic disease. You always want more than one line of evidence. Does that make sense to you all? So if you see what you think is a CP deficit, but then you watch them walk, there's no ataxia, there's no scuffing, and you look at the toenails, no scuffing, then I would wonder if that CP deficit was real. Okay? So always try to look for scuffing, look for the ataxia, hop the patient, look for more things. So I said rules are here to be broken. So rule number one we said is if they, they do have a CP deficit, they've got neurologic disease. Great. If they don't, then they don't. Well, not quite true. So if you have compression of a nerve root, you tend not to have a CP deficit unless it's very, very severe. And we'll show you a little bit more about that later. If you have neuromuscular disease, so disease of the peripheral nerves, the junction or the muscle, Again, you tend not to have CP deficits unless you're totally paralyzed, okay? And then more tricky with spinal cord disease. Very young animals with progressive abnormalities. And animals that have had a severe spinal cord injury but are recovering. And they're now like six months out and they're still very weak. They're still very ataxic, but guess what? They don't have a CP deficit when you check them. Okay, so again, we're not ever going to just take the presence or the absence of a CP deficit as the only way to determine whether or not they have neurologic disease. Okay, and then finally with chronic myelopathies. So by that I mean myelopathy, I mean a spinal cord disease, usually a compressive spinal cord disease, like Wobbler syndrome for example. Some of those animals, well, very commonly, they don't have any CP deficits in their thoracic limbs, their forelimbs. And so veterinarians send them to us thinking they have a back problem, not a neck problem. Okay? So we'll show you more of that in a minute. So now we've got a few videos just to illustrate and compare disease in different parts of the body. And let's start with orthopedic disease. So we say if we rest these animals, they're worse. As they exercise, they improve. They're avoiding weight bearing, okay? They're avoiding loading the joints of that limb, okay? There's no ataxia and there's no CP deficits as long as you support their weight properly when you test them, okay? So if you have a look at this, it looks very dark, but it'll get a bit lighter as it runs. Here's a slow motion of a dog with bilateral stifle disease. It's still pretty dark. Um, but you see little short steps, no ataxia, tracking very straight, no CP deficits, okay? I'll show you another one. Here's a Labrador that was sent to us for possible spinal cord disease. As you watch this dog walk, you see again the dog looks lame, okay? Legs are going nice and straight, they're tracking nice and straight, and I think I have some video from behind. But because both limbs are affected, it makes it difficult for the dog to decide where to put its weight. So we see some bunny hopping. It's doing pretty well. I think we've got video from behind. So there's no scuffing. And when we get the dog going pretty straight, we can see there's no ataxia. Okay? All happy with that? We may have a CP, I think, I don't think we've got a good video there. All right. So then we've got spinal cord, and we've got to remember also caudal brainstem disease, but don't worry about that too much, mostly spinal cord disease. Usually stable with exercise, so don't get worse with exercise. Occasionally they do tire and get worse with exercise. Rest has no effect. You can rest them all they like. They're not going to miraculously improve or worsen. 
they tend to drag the limbs. So instead of like avoiding weight bearing in an orthopedic case, which gives them a short little stride, they tend to drag it because they can't use it. They are ataxic. They are ataxic. Okay, that I will say they were always ataxic. And they should have CP deficits, except for the exceptions to the rule. So here we've got a boxer. And as you watch in particular the hind limbs of this dog, you get a sense of the ataxia. You can see he's scuffing his feet a little as he walks. The stride length is erratic. He's a little bit weak as well. So we tend to see this paresis as well. There you can see the ataxia, the lack of control of the hind end quite clearly. And now we start to see the difficulties of checking CPs. Okay, we're quite slow to flip that foot again, but he can do it. So you could look at this dog and say, well, I'm not really sure it's got CP deficits. I wouldn't mind. This dog is so ataxic, it's got spinal cord disease. Okay? Anybody know what disease this dog has? Ten-year-old boxer. Guess? Oh, this is where I need to know people's names. <laughs> deary, deary, deary me. So this dog has degenerative myelopathy that we see very commonly in older boxers. I thought you'd all say cancer. It's got cancer because it's a boxer, which is also a good guess. Okay, so now we're going to talk about neuropathies. I'll show you some videos of neuropathies. Now, what I would tell you is that these are so frequently missed because we don't do a good job of teaching, um, teaching people how to recognize a neuropathic gait. I even find our residents will miss this most commonly. So what tends to happen with a neuropathy is often it affects the distal end of the nerve more severely. So they lose control of that distal end of the limb. And so as a result, you will see weakness, but then a kind of flipping gait. It's kind of mechanical to me, it looks like, because they'll pick the limb up and they'll flick it out to take that step, okay? The other thing that you will see is that the sciatic nerve's often really affected because it's a long nerve. And when the sciatic nerve's affected, the hock starts to drop. So the animals walk more like we do, in a plantigrade stance. So you'll see the hock drop. And you can see that with this case, okay? Um, they tend not to be uh, that influenced by exercise. They definitely don't get better with exercise. They might worsen and tire. There's no ataxia, usually. Some, there are some weird sensory neuropathies that are ataxic, but in general, they're not ataxic. Late in the disease, they'll have CP deficits. Early, they tend not to. And as I said, they flip that distal limb. We would expect to see muscle atrophy, okay? And we may see, if we did an EMG, we would see electrical activity when the muscle's at rest. But if we just look at this gait, now the grass is a little bit long at the start, but I want you to focus on these hind limbs, and in particular on this one with the bandage on it. So you see how plantigrade is going, the hock is dropping down, and then as you watch that foot, he's flipping it out. Yeah, so he's picking up the, the proximal part of the limb and flipping the rest of the limb. Is that, can you see that or do you feel like I'm inventing it? You okay? Yeah? All right. So then we have neuromuscular disease. And here we're really talking about junctional disease. And we're talking about the postsynaptic part of the junction. So these guys worsen with exercise. With rest, they improve. They do not have ataxia. They do not have CP deficits. They've got little short strides. Okay, so watch this little dog. This is a Jack Russell Terrier. And you know they usually just run away very fast. Well, here he is. He's resting, 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 trying to get the energy to get up. And there he goes. Little short steps, no ataxia. Head down. Legs coming in. Oh, collapse. Okay, we're doing something magical now. You all know what we're doing? Do you know what disease he has? So watch just one little minute. We don't have many magic tricks in veterinary medicine, but this is one of them, okay? So 
So let's say very abnormal behavior for a young Jack Russell. And now he's cured. You know what he has? Myasthenia gravis, yeah? So we've done a Tensilon test and we've reversed the signs just temporarily, okay? All right, then we've got muscle disease. And muscle disease is another difficult area because they can be very variable. So they may have stable signs with exercise. They may improve with some of the muscle cramping syndromes. They may worsen. <laughs> Rest may improve them or it may have no effect. But most importantly, they have no ataxia. They have no CP deficits. They often have very short strides. They can be weak. They can have increased muscle tone. They can have muscle atrophy. They can have muscle hypertrophy, dependent on what the myopathy is. So just a couple of examples. Here's a Labrador retriever with a Labrador retriever myopathy, now called CNM. And you can see it's very poorly muscled. It's tending to bunny hop because it's weak. And we find this dog's kind of exercise intolerant. It's seven months old. It should be crazy, crazy, crazy. That looks ataxic, but it's not ataxic. It's just got what I would call a cow hot stance. Okay? And look at the dog, it's sitting down. That's not normal for a seven month old puppy. In this particular disease, they don't have patellar reflexes. That's unusual for a myopathy, but very, very classic for this particular disease. Okay, I'm going to stop that one there. Look at this dog. So this dog's on the other end of the spectrum. It's got increased muscle mass. So it's got hypertrophy of its muscles, particularly around the neck and the throat. It's got a slightly stilted gait. Anybody know what this dog has? What we're going to do in a minute is percuss a muscle. And what you'll see is when we percuss it, the muscle contracts and stays contracted. Now, it's a little bit hard to see on a white dog. Do you know what it has now? No? So this is a disease where our muscles have got bigger. When you stimulate a muscle, it contracts and it doesn't relax. And here, the dog's asleep. The muscles are electrically noisy. OK? They shouldn't look like that. And in fact, they've got dive bomber sounds. And then look at this demonstration on the tongue. There, you can really see how we've got this prolonged muscle contraction. So this dog has myotonia, OK? All right, clearly, evaluation of the tongue is not a normal part of evaluating the gait, not normally. All right, one other little thing. Another rule we said is lameness is orthopedic disease. So it's always caused by orthopedic disease, except when it isn't, OK? So when do we not see it? being caused by orthopedic disease? Well, with nerve root compression. So here's a little dachshund with a disc herniation. Surprise, surprise. And you can see that he's holding that limb up, OK? We call that a nerve root signature. And this dog is lame on that limb. So when you have compression of the nerve root, you cause pain associated with that. So when they move the limb, it's painful, so they'll often hold it up. And it's difficult for them to bear weight on it properly. So they just look lame. They don't usually have a CP deficit. They will classically look orthopedic. Okay? All right, we've got case examples. So I'm going to show you a series of videos, and we'll just see how many we get through. What I want you to do as we, do, as we look at this is ask yourself several easy questions. They're easy, and then they get more difficult. All right? So I'll show you what qu the questions are in a minute. This first case is an eight-year-old female spade Dalmatian mix. And the owner's complaint is that it's got a progressive pelvic or hind limb gait abnormality. So they've noticed that the hind limbs are abnormal. OK? So the questions. Number one, you need to ask yourself, is the gait abnormal, yes or no? Is yes C si in Portuguese? And no is no? <laughs> All right, so I'll be saying si or no, <laughs> OK? How many legs are affected? All right, how many legs are affected if you think it is abnormal? And which legs? Is there any lameness? Do you see lameness? OK? 
Is there any ataxia? And if there is any ataxia, how would you classify it? Cerebellar, vestibular, or sensory? Okay? All right, here's the video. It's not a very long video, but you don't need much. It's going to come back down the path. You'll see it a little bit better. Ooh, sat down then. Okay, is the gait abnormal? Yes. How many legs are affected? Okay, let's just play that again for you. So the owner's complaint is a pelvic limb abnormality. Would you agree the pelvic limbs are abnormal? Yep. What about the thoracic limbs? They're also abnormal, yes? So four legs affected. Do you see any lameness? Yes, I hear some yeses. Which limbs do you see lameness in? Ooh, look at that weakness as well, yeah? Sat down, he's weak as well. Where do you see lameness? Yeah, the front limbs, both of them look lame. Yeah? Okay. Do you see any ataxia? Yes. And which limbs? Hind limbs. Okay, I like it. I like it. And I can tell you if we did CP deficits in this dog, front limbs, no CP deficits. Hind limbs, CP deficits. Okay? Hopping, front limbs, very short. Like that. Hind limbs, very delayed. Very abnormal, okay? So, we've gone through this. We're pretty happy about answering those. The gait is abnormal, all four limbs are affected. Pelvic limbs are clearly ataxic. I didn't ask you this, a sensory ataxia, yeah? Thoracic limb strides, short and lame. So we would call this a disconnected gait, okay? Very typical of having a caudal cervical problem. If I see that gait, I don't need to do anything else. I know where that dog localizes. Very, very useful thing to recognize. Will I do something else? Yes, I will. I won't be quite that arrogant. But really, you know where it localizes from the minute you see that animal walk past you. So why do we see that gait? Well, so usually the lesion's around C6, 7-ish, okay? So it's affecting the peripheral nerves that come out to the forelimbs. Okay? It's also affecting the white matter tracts that go down to the hind limbs. So for the hind limbs, we have a classic upper motor neuron lesion. So we have an animal that's paretic and ataxic with CP deficits. Okay? For the thoracic limbs, the forelimbs, we've got more of a nerve root signature. So we're seeing lameness, short strides, we're still seeing weakness. And we'll classically see the musculocutaneous nerve affected. So when we try and do a withdrawal reflex, that nerve flexes the elbow. Do you know how I remember that the musculocutaneous flexes the elbow? Well, you probably don't, but I have a trick. It's the beer drinking nerve, okay? Well, for England, we say it's the tea drinking nerve. For here, we say it's the wine drinking nerve, okay? That's how I remember. It may also affect the radial nerve a bit, okay? The radial nerve does the extensors of the elbow, carpus, and digits. So you need it to bear weight, okay? Very important for a quadruped, like a dog, less important for us. We want that beer drinking nerve, okay? Um, but certainly if you uh, compress that radial nerve, you see weakness as well, okay? So I just want to show you another classic example. This is a Doberman. So what disease do you think it has? Wobbler's disease, absolutely. Um, and what you're going to see is that really disconnected gait, big long steps in the pelvic limbs, little steps, lameness in the thoracic limbs. You will also see at one point as it walks past, you'll see atrophy over the scapula because of compression of the nerves coming to the, to the supra and infraspinatus. So you'll see the scapular spine and you'll also see that he's holding his neck as if she's just a little painful. See, neck's kind of, but look at that lameness in the front legs. Great big long disconnected steps in the hind limbs. Okay. And then as the light comes across, 
you're going to see over here, look at the atrophy, okay? So classic caudal cervical. So you've got that now, you'll always recognize that. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, now I'm going to show you two cases to compare and contrast. Both of these dogs presented with a history of difficulty rising and a reluctance to jump, okay? So over here we have a Rottweiler, a grotty rotty, young dog. Just going to let you watch that gate. I need music for these, don't I? I did at one point think I'd try and match music to the gate, but I don't know my music well enough to be able to pick out the most appropriate things. Okay, and then here we have Golden Retriever. Okay, two logs, dogs, same presenting problems, but they look quite different as they walk. All right, let's take the Rottweiler first. Is the gait abnormal? Okay, how many legs affected? Two, we like it. Which legs are they? Yep, hind limbs. Okay, do you see ataxia? A little bit hard to say, isn't it? I would actually probably, like for me, when I watched this dog, I didn't really think it was ataxic. When I watched the videos after, I go, oh, maybe it is a little bit ataxic. Uh, maybe it does cross a little bit, but not convincingly ataxic. Is he lame? <coughs> yeah, you see, I would say he's a little lame. But this is where, when they're not classic, they're not easy. Yes, no, maybe. And this is where your hands-on exam becomes so important. What would you say about his posture? And I think we'll get him side-on again in a minute, which to me is one of the real, let me show him side-on. There, look at this posture. Standing with his weight shifted forward, stifles a little flexed, almost holding a leg up a little. Yeah, almost which you kind of saw as he walked, it's like tentative walking, okay? Like, oh, this is going to hurt. And with the pelvis flexed, right here, okay? When we check CPs, no CP deficits. Hopping, hopping very normal, okay? So, gait's abnormal, pelvic limbs affected. To me, not clearly ataxic, but I allow the fact that some people say, well, I think he is a little ataxic. If life was all black and white, it would be easy, it's not. Weight shifted forwards, pelvis is tucked under, short choppy strides, look a little bit lame, yeah? So, orthopedic exam, totally normal. Surprise, surprise, when you evaluate him, he has severe LS pain. He tries to bite you, okay? So I show you this gait because this gait often gets missed as well, and to me it's a classic gait that's associated with lumbosacral pain. So we have nerve root entrapment, so they look a bit more orthopedic. But what I will try to recognize when I look at these guys is honestly, they look as if they've got something sticking up their butt, or their bum. They're like, oh, 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 yeah? That's what he's doing, yes? So I know that's not very dignified to show you that gait, but okay, let's contrast it with this. One. Yeah, and sure enough, he had an enormous LS disc and did great with surgery. So let's watch this one. Is the gait abnormal? You can be pretty sure for most of these the gait's going to be abnormal. Yeah. Okay, how many legs affected? Which legs? It's not a very long video, but you don't need much video. Hind limbs. I didn't show you the forelimbs, so that wasn't really fair. It's, it's the hind limbs. <coughs> Okay. Do you see lameness? I see lameness, yeah? Okay. Do you see ataxia? Boy, these are getting tougher, aren't they? So often people will say yes, because they're seeing this, okay? That's what this dog's doing. I don't have Marilyn Monroe hips, I can't really do it, okay? 
But that's what's happening. Now, the big tail and everything is kind of disguising everything, but you know what? Patients will come to you with big tails and big coats. They don't all come shaved so that you can see everything beautifully. Okay, so what's happening is he's avoiding moving those hips. So instead, he's moving the spine. Okay? So that's what can kind of fake you out and make you think it looks more ataxic. So gait's abnormal, pelvic limbs affected, not ataxic, but swinging the lumbar spine to advance the pelvic limbs. Lame in both hind limbs, but the right is worse, okay? And sure enough, on exam, very severe hip pain. No CP deficits, no hopping abnormalities, just orthopedic disease, okay? So once they have bilateral disease, it becomes much harder to compare and contrast and to pick out lameness from an ataxia, okay? All right, moving on, what do we have now? Oh, it's a good one. Eight-year-old male castrated Labrador retriever. An eight-month history of left thoracic limb, forelimb lameness, that initially responded to carprofen, okay? And then stopped responding. Gait abnormal? Yeah. How many legs affected? Yeah, one limb. Now look at this limb. Now we're checking, so this limb's affected. We're checking CPs carefully on that same side. Because if we had something up in the spinal cord, we might expect a CP deficit. And there wasn't one. Now we're palpating for any evidence of pain. Dog doesn't look that painful. It's moving his neck around pretty well. But if we find just the right spot, we actually do get pain. Okay. Did you see any ataxia? No, you saw lameness. Yeah. Did you see anything else that was really notable on this one, on the video? It's not strictly answering those questions I asked you. If you look at this limb, what do you notice? Yeah, severe, severe muscle atrophy. Okay. But he's been lame for eight months. This dog's really lame, yeah? So if this is an orthopedic problem, even I should be able to find it. Okay? Because it's very lame. So, clearly lame left thoracic limb. Very obvious muscle atrophy, not ataxic, no CP deficits, okay? So all of those things would fit better with orthopedic disease. But we got pain on the neck, and we've got this very severe atrophy, okay? Orthopedic exam is normal. And again, I would say, when they're that lame, anybody should be able to find the source of pain if it's orthopedic. So where do you think the problem is? So it's actually of the nerve root, okay? So we've got a peripheral nerve problem. If we EMG do electromyography of the muscles of that limb, we find it's very noisy. And that's telling us that the nerve supply to the limb is damaged, okay? And sure enough, we did the MRI, we found a big nerve root tumor, okay? So these nerve root disease can look orthopedic, very solidly orthopedic, okay? Um, so persistent severe lameness without an obvious orthopedic cause could be a nerve root tumor, NRT, a nerve root tumor. Signs will be progressive over time. They might respond to carprofen or something at first. You might find a bit of elbow pain or something. It's a Labrador, you'll probably find a little something, but this dog's very lame, okay? Muscle atrophy will develop over time. You can usually get pain somewhere. You may or may not, though. And here's why this is important and why I do this case. The sooner you recognize this, the more likely we are to be able to do a surgery to get clean margins, amputate the limb, and actually cure the animal. Usually, by the time they get recognized as being neurologic, it's too late. The disease has spread along too many nerves. You can't get margins. That was not the case for this animal. We amputated the limb. We dissected the nerves up and did frozen sections as we went until we got tumor free and that dog was cured. But that's really unusual, really unusual. 
Okay, we've got like, I'm okay for five, ten more minutes? Yeah? Okay. Um, let's show you this one, then we'll skip to another one. Seven-year-old female spade boxer. Progressive gait abnormality. Gait is abnormal, yeah? How many legs? Two. Which legs? Yeah, pelvic limbs. Do you see, see how useful that turn at the end is? It shows the weakness up quite nicely. Do you see any lameness? I've heard yes, I've heard no. Let's just show you that again. Do you see any of this? Yeah. Do you see ataxia? Yeah. So we see lameness and we see ataxia. We see paresis, yeah? And a CP deficit. So what's the conclusion we draw from that? Maybe orthopedic and neurologic. Need to do a careful neuro exam. So gates abnormal both hind limbs, paraparetic, ataxic both pelvic limbs, CP deficits, Lame in that left pelvic limb in particular. Orthopedic exam, left stifle effusion with pain on manipulation. Neurologically, the dog had degenerative myelopathy and had orthopedic disease. So we can treat the orthopedic disease somewhat. Okay, I want to... Oh, no, we did well with that. We're going faster now, so let's keep going on these. Three-year-old male castrated St. Bernard. Progressive difficulty getting up and walking. Okay? <laughs> Possibly did respond to both. It's had a course of prednisone from the local vet and it's had etagesic, so a non-steroidal. Not at the same time, at different times. And responded to both. Why is it important that I said that this information of pred and etagesic? Do you know why we would be interested in that? Etagesic, will that help orthopedic disease? Yeah. Will it help neurologic disease? No. <laughs> Prednisone help orthopedic disease? Yeah, it helps mask the pain. It's anti-inflammatory. Could it help neurologic disease? Yeah, so it might help neurologic disease as well, okay? Dependent on the disease. All right, now here's the dog. Quite difficult to examine. So gait's abnormal, yeah? How many legs affected? Four legs, yeah? All four legs. You can see it quite nicely as it walks back down here. Do you see lameness? Yeah, in multiple limbs, yeah? Ooh. Do you see ataxia? <laughs> the lameness is much more obvious to me than the ataxia, but the dog is ataxia as well. Do you see some of that kind of scuffing? Just occasionally it makes little mistakes like this. But the lameness is, is a more overriding picture to me. And it's very common that we will have cases, you see how he's kind of flipping his legs as well? We will have cases that come into orthopedics or into us that have both disease and our two services argue about, no, it's the orthopedic disease. We'll say it's the orthopedic disease that's the problem, not the neurologic disease. And they, of course, say the opposite. Okay. But this dog did indeed have both disease. So the gait's abnormal, all four limbs are affected. There is ataxia in all four legs, but it's quite subtle. A um, bit more clear in the hind limbs. There actually were no CP deficits in this dog. Okay. Appears lame in all four legs, particularly that left four. All right. And what did we find? So orthopedic exam, bilateral hip pain. So reduction in range of motion of both hips. Bilateral effusion and crepitus of the stifles but no instability. Reduced elbow flexion and extension. However, for the degree of reduction, the weakness and ataxia in the uh, forelimbs seemed to be more than you could explain by the orthopedic disease. It was relatively mild orthopedic disease. And so this dog actually did have Wobbler syndrome, relatively mild from a compressive point of view, but also really severe orthopedic disease. So this dog's in a really bad place. It was quite a young dog. So this does not look good for this dog maintaining mobility over its life. Okay, this is probably the last case I'll show you, and this one's quite important. 
eight-year-old female spade boxer, a two-year history of right hind limb lameness. Okay. Two weeks prior to coming to, into us, it had jumped onto a bed, and actually missed the bed, and ever since then had been much worse. So very reluctant to move at all. The dog was also quite aggressive, would bite. The orthopedic surgeon, the dog was sent to an orthopedic surgeon to have surgery on its hip. So this two-year history of right hind limb lameness had also been documented radiographically that its hip was abnormal. So it went to the surgeon for a hip replacement. The surgeon went, ooh, I don't know. I think there might be more going on. Okay? They were very sensible. So here we have the video. Here's the dog. You can only just see the limbs, I'm afraid. It's quite bright up there. The gait's abnormal, yeah. Okay? How many legs are affected? I'm hearing four out there. So interestingly, like everybody who'd examined this dog came back to me and said, just two limbs, hind limbs. It's partly because they weren't slinging it. So if we didn't, you see how we're kind of encouraging the dog to move forwards. If we weren't doing that, the dog would just walk a little way and sit down. So the thoracic limbs look pretty normal. But the more you encourage this dog to move forwards, the more you kind of go, hmm, it's re really reluctant to move. But look at those forelimbs. Look how short and stilted they are. And short and stilted in the hind limbs. OK? Do you see any lameness? Yes. OK, which limb do you see lameness in? OK, that right one is lame. It's a bit difficult to tell with the others. Let me just stop a minute. Did you, um, did you see ataxia? No. They're tracking really straight. OK, so we don't see ataxia. They're tracking really straight. Even though I don't have video from behind, you can see they're very straight. You see how the head's going down? Kind of reminiscent of something for you? But we certainly do have it favoring that right hind limb as well. Now, look at the CP testing. So the person who's testing this is holding the weight up. And they're saying, look, he's got a CP deficit. And then I said, look, saying terrible CP deficit. And I said to him, can you just take the weight off a little? See how he's adjusting? You see how that foot came straight down then? It doesn't have, we cured it. No CP deficit. OK? So very, very critical as to how you're holding these animals. OK, so let's just summarize this guy's gait. It's abnormal. All four legs are affected. Hind limbs worse. No ataxia. No CP deficits when you do them correctly. Definite lameness on that right hind limb. So we've got tetraparesis. We're weak as well as we force this animal to walk. Gets worse with exercise, yeah? Pain on manipulation of the right hip. So what do you think this dog's got? Where would you localize it? Do we think it's got spinal cord disease? Does it, do we have ataxia? No. Spinal cord disease? No. OK. Um, do we think it could? Well, let's leave it at that. How about that? So this dog could have muscle disease. It's got exercise intolerance as the overwhelming sign. So we would check CK. Could have a junctionopathy. Exercise intolerance, yeah. Legs came together, head went down, so we need to do a tensilon test. And we always, always, always would radiograph the chest in an eight-year-old boxer that we suspect could have myasthenia gravis. And we're going to radiograph that right hip. We've got this history out there of two years of lameness. So here's the tensilon test, and it's quite helpful. We've given the tensilon. Now look at this dog. Totally different, totally different affect. And yeah, he's lame in that right hind. Very lame in that right hind. And yes, radiographically, the hip looked abnormal. But how often do you see hip disease cause them to carry a leg? Not very often. Yeah, They'll be lame on it. So he does have myasthenia gravis. But unfortunately, he's got an osteosarcoma in that right femur. Okay, So that's why he's so lame on that leg. So the outcome was not good. All right. 
So we are done. We don't have time to go through all of these as well. I just thought I'd throw a load in just in case. I want to show you one video. Watch this one. Dachshund sent to us for tetraparesis. Do you see ataxia? No ataxia. We see a dog that's kind of lame. No CP deficits. And when we palpate the joints, you can almost even see it from here. It's got big joint effusions. So polyarthritis, see how he doesn't like us touching them? So, see if we can show you the joint effusion in a minute. No CP deficits. We see quite a few polyarthritis cases on neurology because they will have, be so reluctant to move because so many joints are affected and painful. And look at that carpus. You see the effusion on there? So, okay. So, ask your questions. Is the gait abnormal? How many? Which legs are affected? Do you see CP deficits and ataxia? Are they orthopedic exam abnormalities? And that will allow you to identify the problem. In most cases, not always. Some are really tricky. Okay? So, anybody got any questions about that? Thank you. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. I think uh, we have now uh, time for one question, if you uh, have, please. Someone has questions to put to Dr. Natasha? Is everybody freezing cold? No, I think uh, all of us need a coffee. <laughs> so, um, agora, uh, vamos então uh, ter um pequeno intervalo e regressamos. Às 11 h uh, Regressamos então às 11h05, fazemos um intervalo mais curto uh, para podermos uh, dar continuidade ao programa. Thank you, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Bom dia de novo, uh, enfim, especialmente que ainda não tinha a oportunidade de cumprimentar, nós estamos um pouco com atraso e teríamos que recomeçar a ordem de trabalhos. Um, it's a great pleasure to have with us today Dr. Dan uh, Dunning. Um, welcome to our university. Uh, a Dr. Dan Dunning uh, fez a sua residência um, no Colorado State, na área da cirurgia, e é, portanto, desde 2005, professora uh, associada uh, da Carolina do Norte, na área da cirurgia, e tem um interesse especial e dedicação pela área da reabilitação motora, que aliás, portanto, é o primeiro título da sua palestra, um, e queríamos começar desde já para evitar mais atrasos. Yes, please. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for hosting us here. Um, unlike Dr. Olvi from before, I've never been to Portugal, so I feel very fortunate to be here. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful, and I want you to invite me back again so I can stay longer. Um, the second thing is we had a tour of your veterinary college yesterday, and it's beautiful. Um, I was very impressed with your facilities, particularly what you're doing in rehab. I have to tell you that what you're doing with those pools and those exercise areas um, is you have more than I do in some cases. So that's very, very impressive. And I'm sure you guys are going to do some wonderful things um, with animals and their, their post-operative recoveries. OK, so this morning we're going to start off with talking about assessment, OK, and some strategies about looking at your patients before you even really start any therapies. And for me, um, this is the most important thing. You have to know what you're dealing with before you start a therapy. So we're going to spend some time on this, and it probably it's reflective of my philosophy. Before I start, though, can you hear me? Yes? Am I speaking too quickly? Do I have a southern drawl? Do I sound like I'm from the south? No? All right. 
Okay, so we've talked a little bit about this, but it is very, very important to document what is going on with each one of your patients. So we are going to review all the methods of looking at your animals, measuring what your animals can or cannot do, and we're going to talk about the difference between subjective and objective evaluation because both are really very, very important, but they'll give you quite different measures of what your animal is doing. Okay, why assess? Well, again, it's important for planning, it's important for prognostication, and it's very important for charting your patient and giving good updates. So when I went to school, bazillions and bazillions of years ago, okay, I, you know, we wrote on papyrus and we didn't have computers, almost, but how we dealt with things, and I'm a surgeon, I'm actually an orthopedic surgeon by training, we would do these amazing repairs. We would fix incredible fractures or put in new hips or new joints or do incredible um, neurologic surgeries. And then what we would do with our patients is we say, okay, I'm going to see you in six to eight weeks and this is what you need to do with your pet. Your pet. You need to put them in a kennel, okay? Don't try not to let them walk except when they have to go outside to go to the bathroom and certainly don't interact with them. And that's hard. That's really hard for owners to do and it's very hard for patients to do. And we had very little emphasis on anything in post-operative care. So who in here has had any kind of orthopedic surgery? Anybody? No? If I put my microphone down on my knees, you could actually hear my knees crick and crack. I've had arthroscopic surgery galore. And the most important thing for my recovery with my knees wasn't necessarily my surgeon. And I'm saying that as a surgeon. It was my physical therapist afterwards. So in people, we've known for a very long time. And actually in horses and in racing, we've known for a long time. It's very important what we do with them after the surgery, okay? We can get away with a lot during surgery. Um, so kennel confinement can cause longer recoveries. It can certainly cause a significant degree of muscle atrophy, and that's really important and problematic in patients that are going in compromised. Um, it can cause joint contracture and fibrosis, and that's a case that we're gonna talk about this morning and it can cause pretty significant cartilage degradation, particularly if you immobilize a joint for any reason um, post-operatively. Okay, but how do we measure? Well, I have a long list of things that we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about. We're gonna focus on a few of them this morning. Um, obviously, we're gonna go over an orthopedic and a neurologic exam, which Dr. Olby went through, so we're gonna skip over that, okay? We're going to do joint goniometry, which is the measurement of joint angles. We're going to do end feels, which is something that I really like to do. It's a very subjective evaluation of what a joint is doing, and it's very guiding with your therapy. Uh, muscle girth, measuring muscle atrophy. We also measure muscle atrophy with dual energy x-ray absorptometry, or a DEXA scan. Most commonly, that's used in women of my age and older when we're looking for bone loss, but you can also look at it for muscle mass content as well as fat content. So we actually have an obesity program or a weight loss program for animals in the United States and in North Carolina where we actually DEXA scan our animals before and after uh, nutritional um, alterations to their diet as well as exercise. We do gait analysis and lameness scores, pain scoring, um, because that's actually probably the first stopping point for any of our patients is that they have to be on appropriate pain management. We look at how they function, what their ability, what they can and cannot do, and what the owner needs them to do um, after they uh, recover, and then body condition scoring. This morning, in this next hour, we're gonna talk about these three middle ones, because the rest I think you have a good handle on, at least at the top part of the screen. Later on in the day, and on Sunday, we'll talk about the rest of these, okay? So we're gonna talk about one case to illustrate 
all the ways to assess a patient. And I think that that might be a little bit more interesting than me going over just each one of these topics. Um, and then we are gonna talk about a little bit, hopefully, if not this hour, next hour, um, how this case did after we assessed it. So this is Elsa, okay? And Elsa was a one-year-old female spade, mixed breed dog, okay? And she was adopted from the shelter by her owners a little while back, and she had a history of bilateral hip dysplasia for which the owners couldn't afford to put a new hip, but what they did do is a femoral head and neck ostectomy, which, which I think is something you learn within your curriculum too, okay? Where we remove the ball on the head and create a pseudo joint. And most animals do pretty well. However, Elsa had a weight, non-weight-bearing lameness in her right hind limb since the surgery, which is, where, which is the hip that we operated on. And, and additionally, um, the owner had had some issues with the post-operative instructions from the surgeon, and the post-operative plan wasn't optimal. So she was not moving around, and the owners didn't bring her in until um, July, okay? So she had about eight weeks of time where she hasn't been using her leg um, and they hadn't been working with her leg. And they were doing something with her called PROM, which is passive range of motion therapy, which is basically flexion and extension, usually with the animal laying on its side. She's the only dog in the house. The flooring is uh, carpeted and hardwood, so she gets around pretty well. There aren't any issues there. Um, she manages on the stairs, but she does it on three legs, and they really want their dog back, okay? She's actually worse now than she was before the surgery, which is not good, okay? Well, the first stopping point is uh, we need to ask about her medications, and she is on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti and a joint supplementation, Dosequin and Rimadil. The owner wasn't sure of the dose that she was on, um, and she probably wasn't always getting the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory as often as it was supposed to be given, which is twice a day. She had marked muscle atrophy in her hind limb, um, and it was very much over her uh, semi-membranosis and tendinosis, but also affecting her quadriceps mechanism. It was pretty profound, and I'm gonna show you a video. And this is what she looked like. She was occasionally toe touching, okay, um, on the hind limb. And it would increase when she was feeling uncertain about her terrain. Um, but when she could, like going on stairs, she would lift it up. And she was in fair body condition. She was about a four, not four out of nine, which is a little bit underweight or at optimal weight. Okay, this is Elsa, maybe. Okay, take a good look there. Okay, she's about eight weeks out, maybe a little bit, 10 weeks out from surgery. Is that how you'd like your femoral head and neck ostectomies to look after surgery? No, very disappointing. So that's at a slow walk, okay? And you, you note that she is really not using the limb very well, okay? Happy dog though, right? Happy, we always like them happy. Okay, we do our lameness scoring uh, zero through five. Is that how you do your lameness scorings? Are you familiar with this? So zero is normal, that's what you want everyone to be. One is a mild weight bearing lameness, something that you can see particularly when the dog is standing. So what they'll do is they'll casually, when you're looking at a room, just stand with one leg forward. But then when they go to walk, you know, they walk fairly normally, okay? Two is an obvious weight-bearing lameness, even at a walk, okay? Where they kind of just, they'll still walk on it, but they're just kind of ginger, all right? Three is a severe weight-bearing lameness and severe offloading, where they're, you know, standing their leg out and they're pretty much putting all of their weight on that one limb. Four is an intermittent non-weight-bearing lameness where they actually will walk three-legged lame, okay? Um, and, and they're just toe-touching the ground most of the time. 
and five is a continuous non-weight-bearing lameness. So based upon what you saw in the video, what do you think ELSA was? A five? That's, yeah, I would agree with that, okay? Probably a four plus five. Yeah, absolutely. So she's pretty darn lame. Not good. In terms of pain palpation, we do a zero through four, okay? A zero being completely non-painful, one being mildly resentful, kind of pulling back when you palpate her, when you put her through a range of motion, two, having a moderate withdrawal and actively resisting you putting her through a range of motion, Three, um, she'll actually try to forcibly withdraw, um, or the manipulation may vocalize or bite, so pretty darn painful. And five is when they actually try to leap out of your arms and get away from you, okay? And she really was on one limb, actually, her non-operated hip joint, her left joint of two, because remember, hip dysplasia is usually bilateral, and a four. Um, on the affected limbs. So she was pretty painful. And remember, she wasn't getting her medications, right? So she hadn't had a non-steroidal this morning. The next thing we did is we measured her muscle girth, okay? And we measured it pretty much only proximally um, in her forelimbs and her hind, okay? And what do you notice about her measurements here? They look good. Look bad. So if you can see this, so in our four limbs, she measures pretty symmetrically, okay, within striking range. In her hind limbs, her left is 36 centimeters in a circumference, and in her right is 26. There's a 10 millimeter or 10 centimeter difference. Is that normal? Yeah, it's pretty significant muscle atrophy, right? So muscle girth is a very accurate estimate of lean body mass, okay? Um, and, and also body condition score. So if you have an obese animal, that's gonna affect your measurements. But when you have a real disparity like that with significant atrophy, that's, that's um, very prognostic. You need to remember, though, it's a relative measure and it's fairly inaccurate. Um, there are no normals published, so obviously a dachshund is different than a Great Dane. Um, and there's individual variation from limb to limb, okay? So you always need to look at both limbs. So probably, you would probably say that this one may not be normal either, but we have nothing to go on. So it's affected muscle girth by multiple parameters. Obviously, hair coat, if you've shaved one leg and don't have the other one shaved, and they have a large, fluffy hair coat, that can affect it. Obesity um, and body condition scoring can make your legs larger or smaller. Sedation, if the muscle is relaxed, so you should note that in the record if you have a sedate patient. Your limb positioning, so normally we measure girth um, in standing position, but if you do measure it in lateral, you need to make sure that you do the other limb the same way. The point of measurement on the limb, so we're gonna talk about where I measure the limb. It doesn't really matter, okay, as much, as long as you measure the same place each time. And again, we mentioned standing versus lateral recumbency. Consistency is super important, okay? The same person in your practice, whether it be you or your well-paid, highly trained technician, um, who's very happy to, um, should be measuring um, each animal, okay? And I have a technician and she does all my measurements and she's much better at it than I am, okay? Do it in the same position on the limb, so a standing angle. Um, she likes to do it in lateral recumbency, and that's what the pictures are here. And a second person is often helpful for restraint, okay? And if you have a shaved limb and you know that you're going to be making multiple measurements, you can place a little Sharpie marker, and usually we do it on the inside of the limb, so we have a point of reference of where we're measuring. In terms of the rear, um, the proximal rear limb, where I like to measure is a quarter to one half the distance between the greater trochanter to the patella. This is obviously very much affected by obesity. So if you have a very large patient with a very pendulous abdomen, sometimes you can't get up that high, okay? So you just need to measure where you are. Sometimes we'll be down even towards the knee in those cases, okay? 
Um, in the distal rear limb, particularly if you have neurologic atrophy, pretty significant, we like to measure down around just below the knee, right at the greater trochanter. So a quarter of the distance from the tibial plateau to the medial and lateral malleoli. Again, you can use the tibial tuberosity as a reference point there. We don't do that in a lot of our orthopedic patients. We do that in our neurologic patients. And on the proximal forelimb, we measure from the one-third the distance from the greater tubercle to the olecranon. And on the distal forelimb, it's a quarter from the distance of the epicondyles to the medial and lateral styloid processes. Okay, the next thing we did was we measured her joint range of motion and we did uh, evaluated her characteristics of her joints and that's called end feels, okay? And basically we weren't able on her hip area to, do, to get great measurements because as soon as we touched her at this point, she had an anticipatory pain response, okay? She immediately struggled, she was very stressed and very painful. When we tried to evaluate her end fields or just even put her through any sort of range of motion, she cried out, okay? So we weren't really able to get anything, and that's actually called an empty end field, okay? She was more mobile in the left limb, which is the non-operative limb, but she tried to bite us. Let's talk a little bit about goniometry. So it qualitates the range of motion. It's actually a measurement and it establishes a baseline for your therapy, and particularly in this case where we're looking at trying to create a functional limb where it's non-functional, it's important to establish where we are to see if we're actually making progress. And you measure um, in normal limbs and in unaffected limbs, okay? Basically, it's an objective measurement um, of the range of motion in passive range of motion, okay? and you measure the joint at the isometric point. So that's the point at which your joint rotates around itself. So like in the hip, it's just at the greater trochanter. That is the isometric point for the hip. At the stifle, it's at the epicondyles, okay? It's again, the point at which the whole joint pivots around itself. You measure it in flexion and extension, and you use instrumentation, and this is actually called a goniometer, and it's basically a medical protractor, okay? Additional measurements may be made. You can also do this in abduction and adduction, particularly for if you're doing triple pelvic osteotomies. You can do internal, external uh, rotation and varus and valgus. You need to be uh, familiar with the published angles and also look at the contralateral limb because the published angles were all done in Labradors, right? So if you have a chihuahua or a little miniature poodle, that's going to maybe a little different, okay? And Dr. Marcelin Little actually published these a while back, I think in uh, 2002, okay? There's variation in measurement. Again, the person who's doing your muscle girth measurement, whether that be you or your tech, probably should do the measurement for goniometry at the same time. The dog's already in lateral recumbency or being restrained. There is inter and intra-observer variability. So again, it's helpful to have a, the same person measuring um, each time. And this intra-observer, um, the person doing the actual measurement, as they get more practiced in doing it, they'll have decreased variability as well. So you'll have more consistent technique. Okay, let's talk about end fields. Does anyone here use end fields in their practice or in your studies? Okay, maybe, no? Okay, so an end feel is basically the type of resistance you feel when you're moving a joint. It's a subjective evaluation, okay? Um, in either, it can be in flexion or extension, and it's basically how the joint characteristically feels beyond crepitus, okay? Um, and it's, again, it can be very diagnostic, and it can care, because it characterizes the movement, and it can also be normal or pathologic, and it very much guides your therapy. So there's six type of end fields, okay? Bone to bone, okay? That's just, that is more than crepitus. That's when you are having an ankylotic joint or a joint that is starting to fuse. Capsular, a fibrotic or osteoarthritic joint with a lot of fibrosis and medial buttress in the case of the stifle. Tissue approximation, okay, when you actually have tissue in between your joint that's prohibiting actually flexion or extension. 
a funny one called springy back, okay? We'll talk about that. And empty and spasm. Now, in Elsa's point, if you remember back, she had basically an empty end feel, okay? And her muscles were also very spasmodic and very tense when we were feeling her. No, I didn't check the time. So, will you like raise your hands at me when, okay. Um, okay, so, bone on bone, okay? That is very, it's called a hard end feel, because it's bone, all right? And it's an abrupt stop to your movement. It can be normal, that sounds funny, but if you think about your elbow, which is a gingamus or a hinge joint, when you get to extension, what stops you? That process there called your olecranon, right? So that's a bone on bone stop. You're not going anymore because that olecranon's there. And that's normal. You have to have your olecranon or else you don't have a normal elbow. But most cases, with the exception, a few exceptions like your elbow, it's pathologic, okay? And that means that you have an ankylotic joint, okay? A fused joint. And the thing that I want to impress upon you is a lot of people out there when they're doing rehab or when they're getting started, they're doing a lot of passive range of motion, okay, till all day long, and that's like a lot of what they spend their time on. But if you have an ankylotic joint, all the passive range of motion, all the therapy in the world, you're not gonna change anything, okay? So you need to think about something else, usually some kind of surgical intervention, all right? And um, it has a very poor prognosis. If you have a capsular range of motion, this is really the most common, okay? And again, it can be normal or pathologic. In stifle extension, when you go to that full extension, okay, you stop there, but it's a soft stop, okay? And that has to do with basically the ligaments and the tendons in, around the joint, that fibrous sheath, slightly elastic, okay? But if you have normal goniometry, um, that, that feeling is, is, is normal. However, most of the time, we're talking about it's pathologic, okay? It's decreased elasticity. Um, the most common thing we see is a chronic uh, osteoarthritic joint, such as a stifle, okay? And you really need to look at your goniometry for this to, to see if this is normal or pathologic. Again, this can be altered, however, by doing some range of motion therapy or therapeutic exercise ultrasound, there's, a, there's some modalities that we can use for this. Tissue approximation, okay, that's when it can't be moved because there's soft tissue impingement around the joint. Nor, it can be normal, so when you flex up your hip, if you have a big belly and you've just had a big meal, you probably can't get it all the way up because your stomach's in the way, okay? It can also be pathologic, okay, when you have postoperative hemarthrosis, okay? or if you have extensive soft tissue swelling that'll affect your range of motion or edema. And again, that's really gonna guide your therapy. You're gonna do some different things. So if I had tissue approximation in a really swollen joint, I would start thinking about applying some ice packs, some cold therapy, doing some massage, um, things like that to get that swelling and edema down, maybe even some wraps prior to um, starting in any other forms of therapy. Does that make sense? Okay. Springing back, obviously that's not normal, right? Okay, so that's the rebound of felt at the disease. That's seen in deranged joints. That's always pathologic, okay? And it's basically just a characteristic of a deranged joint. And empty and spasmodic. Again, empty is that there's no end palpated. The, the patient just reacts and it usually is in pain, okay? Always pathologic. And spasm, when the pain is very severe, having involuntary muscle contractions, okay? Again, always pathologic. And if you have an empty joint, painful joint, spasmodic joint, you need, this is, needs to be your first place you go, okay? You need to evaluate how you're treating the pain in this patient, okay? Before you do any therapies at all. Okay. Let's talk about Eli Eliza or Elsa, sorry, um, her problem list. So we've talked that she had empty and spasmodic and feels, okay? So she's got uncontrolled pain, all right? And it's in both joints, but it's worse in the right than in the left. Um, so we need to consider changing her pain therapy plan, okay? And we could give hours on what we would do here. 
She's got decreased range of motion, okay? Most likely, even though we didn't get a measurement, but we can guess that it's decreased. Even if she was doing well, it would be. That's an expectation of an FHO. We're gonna treat her not with passive range of motion, but with active range of motion. This is something that I would encourage you all to use when you're out in practice. Um, it's a more, much more effective technique that owners can employ rather than laying an animal down, holding them down, and putting their joint through a range of motion. Um, she also had severe, severe muscle atrophy, so we're gonna institute a therapeutic exercise plan, okay? Any questions? Easy? Easy as pie, right? All right. So in terms of pain management techniques, there's non-invasive drug therapies, okay, which is basically pharmacologic intervention, so she needs to go back on non-steroidals, right? And maybe in, add in some additional drugs. But we also have some non-invasive, non-drug therapies um, as well, which we can talk about. And we have invasive, one of which she's already had. She, we've ab ablated her joint, right? We've done an FHO. Theoretically, that should have helped with her pain management, but now she's having complications from that surgery. But we can do injections of the joint. We can treat her trigger points, which is an acupressure, acupuncture type of technique. And then we can also do implants, okay? Um, and even block the area temporarily. Non-invasive uh, drugs, obviously analgesic and non-steroidals, we can employ muscle relaxants. We do that occasionally, particularly with animals that are quite stressed and are having muscle spasms due to pain and, and um, other protective mechanisms, mechanisms of the joint. We can use narcotics. And then we can also use, and we use this quite commonly um, in our practice at NC State, antidepressants and anticonvulsants. Usually not by themselves, but in combination with the non-steroidals, okay? Non-invasive, non-drug, which is what we're gonna talk about more here, some techniques that we're gonna use, and it's after we get the appropriate non-steroidals on board, are therapeutic exercise, manual techniques, cutaneous stimulation, acupressure and electroacupuncture, okay? So we've got a whole cadre of things that we can throw at this animal in addition to giving drugs. In terms of therapeutic exercise, okay, um, this is really when we have physical exertion um, with the aim of training or improvement, okay? And they're usually both active and resistive forms of therapy. And this includes water therapy, flexion exercises, aerobic routines, and many others. So here's Elsa, Elsa on day one, okay? So you remember how she was? And then we're using actually the land treadmill, which is a wonderful modality, particularly when you're dealing with initial post-operative patients. One, because it's less work for her to walk than to actually just walk on the ground, all right? Because the belt is moving, right? And so she doesn't have to set her own cadence. She just has to react to it, okay? Also, it's a softer setting than just the floor, okay? The belt has some give and resistance there, okay? And we can modify how fast or how slow she walks, and we want her to walk slowly. Because the slower she walks, the more likely she is to use the, the limb. And then also, sneaky technique-wise, this is an unfamiliar environment for her, okay? And so she is more likely to put the limb down because she's feeling unstable or uncertain, okay? But you can see that she's already using the limb a little bit more in the land treadmill than she was outside, right? Or you can just agree with me, okay? Another therapy that we used with her, which is you all are, are getting up and running, is our underwater treadmill, okay? And we use an aquapause treadmill. It's about $60,000 US dollars. Uh, but it is a wonderful, wonderful platform to use in animals. It's one of our favorite go-to things, okay? Um, and basically, uh, in this medium, we're gonna have an entire lecture about underwater treadmills, so we're not gonna go into too much depth here. You have the belt moving, so again, she, can, she will move, right? You have the water, which is actually buoyant and taking the weight off of her, so she's, it's easier to move but you have the added resistance of the water that she's building up muscle mass there, okay? But you see that she's still having issues with putting it down, but she's putting it down more consistently. And we have the water up very high because we're taking off 
most of the weight. So it's a form of assisted ambulation, okay? And we don't have to worry about incisions or anything like that. Any questions? The water is also 96 degrees Fahrenheit. I should have translated that into Celsius, but it's very warm, okay? So I have to keep it warm for my therapist here. She gets cold, so it's, it feels good, all right? The other thing we can do in our, in our underwater tank, um, but you guys have pools. I want your swimming pool, so you can invite me back anytime, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll go swim some animals. It, um, is we actually have a tank and we can swim them. Now the interesting thing about this, we're gonna go back to all these videos, is did you notice the active range of motion that she's using in the different three different modalities from land treadmill to underwater treadmill to swimming? This is a highly, highly form uh, of aerobic activity that puts her through an incredible range of active range of motion that is fairly non-painful, okay? So you can see the degree of flexion and extension she's getting in these joints. Obviously more in the left, I look like I'm drowning her, and we're gonna talk about that, um, than the right, but she's moving both, okay? It's a great form of therapy, okay? But they don't do it for very long, they get very tired, okay? So this form of swimming, when we first start out, even in athletic dogs, is only about two to three minutes. Okay, so you can see how much range of motion, particularly in flexion, she's putting in here, right? If we go back, let's go back here. Okay, here's the land treadmill. Okay, I would say she's getting maybe 30 to 40 degrees of range of motion here on the land treadmill, which is more than on the ground, okay? Here's the land treadmill. And we'll show you in a better, this is day one, so she's not doing super great. But she will put it down more and she'll have more range of motion, probably about 50 to 60 degrees in the, in the water, okay? And then when she swims, we get max, her probably maximum range of motion there, okay? So if you wanna quickly increase your amount of range of motion that she goes through swimming is your man, okay? There are also manual techniques, um, chiropractic adjustments, okay, and massage therapy. Anyone here do chiropractic work? Are you taught chiropractic work in your curriculum? No? You are? Oh, you do chiropractic work? Great. Okay, it is actually a great form of pain management in animals, okay? There are special training courses that you can take um, within that. We're not gonna focus so much on here because that's rather advanced training. But as you know, when an animal actually has a lameness, whether it be to, due to a neurologic event or an orthopedic event, it affects the whole body. So it's more of a holistic form of therapy. The other thing is massage therapy. When we use massage in animals, there's usually, there's four classic techniques. The most common technique that we use is effleurage massage, where that's just basically light pressure to the limb fairly standard. It's what you naturally do when you massage a leg. Usually you do it distal to proximal when you're dealing with swelling or any kind of decrease in venous return. And it usually lasts anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, twice to three times a day. And what we'll do is we'll do this after every um, exercise session. Um, when we're dealing with range of motion, massage and um, pain, how it affects it, it, again, it helps with venous and lymphatic drainage. It reduces muscle spasms. Um, it actually has a reduction of sensory and effective pain, okay? Um, and it reduces the, it, it's a pleasurable experience for most animals, okay? And so that actually, that has a lot to do with how they perceive pain, and in people too, okay? Um, and it causes reduction of tension, fear, and some of that anticipatory, I think you're gonna hurt me um, type of reactions. Um, and it's great to work with our patients. You don't really think about working about working on their heads, but um, that is something that I think a phenomenon in animals. Um, we also use cutaneous stimulation in these guys using superficial um, heating and cooling of the skin uh, with cold packs and hot packs. And there's all sorts of voodoo out there on how people do it, and I don't think that there's any science to support it one way or the other. Usually postoperatively, we avoid heat, okay, and use cold for the first 72 hours. 
Um, and after any type of inflammatory activity like exercise, we'll apply cold, okay? The biggest thing I want you to take home from this is you, the time, okay? Because you can apply it for too long and actually have a reverse impact on inflammation and cause more inflammation. So normally we don't apply cold packs for more than five to 10 minutes at a time, okay? Um, and then allow the animal to recover. Um, oftentimes, it's, if it's a distal portion of the appendix, uh, um, appendage, we will um, apply it with compression for increased penetration. Okay. When we talk about acupuncture and electroacupuncture, there are many, and we're going to have an entire lecture on this tomorrow. Okay, so we'll just delve into it a little bit. The mechanisms of action really are both local, okay, which we use a lot in orthopedic cases, as well as systemic. Okay, um, and the easiest thing to understand is probably the local effects of treating right around the joint, and those are the needles that are in the affected area. The harder things to understand, unless you've taken some traditional Chinese medicine or some of the channel and meridian theory, and thinking about the patient um, in a very different way than you're taught in school, okay? Treatment points, and this obviously isn't Elsa, this is another dog who had the very same surgery, okay, um, are looking along the local points, which are here, right along the hip, okay, it's right along the wing of the ilium, over the greater trochanter, and within the sciatic notch. Those are these three points here. And in Chinese medicine, what we're saying we're doing is we're, we're actually resolving stagnation of qi, okay? And when you have qi, which is your life force, okay, and when it's stagnated, um, that can cause horrific pain and also dysfunction, okay? Uh, and blood uh, also is another thing. When you have stagnation of blood, that can also be even more painful. So in theory, these needles from a Chinese perspective are um, relieving that stagnation. From a Western perspective, we're probably, we're thinking that it's alterating the pain pathways that are innovating that joint and redirecting them or muting them, okay? Um, we also treated more distally right around here um, for treating some of the channels, okay, and the meridians, and some of the underlying patterns. And um, this is a more holistic treatment of the patient, okay? And some of these points are what are called master points for the entire rear limb, okay? And you can also do a electroacupuncture by collecting or connecting all these points together and either using moxibustion, which we don't use in our hospital because it smells like marijuana very strongly and we don't want to get a bad reputation. Uh, and it will, if you light it, it's amazing. It's amazingly hot substance once lit. It can burn you very badly and burn your patients, but used appropriately, it's very effective at applying energy to a joint. But, what, but because we can't smell funny for the whole day, all right, and have people look at us, we use electroacupuncture within our hospital. The units are fairly affordable, somewhere around the range of two to four thousand dollars. Okay, and um, in most hospitals, unless you have well good ventilated area, um, that's what most people will use, and it's it's very similar. Okay. Another thing we can use for pain, uh, treatment of pain, is cold laser. It's somewhat of a controversial um, type of therapy. It basically uses low intensity or low levels of laser light to reduce pain and inflammation. Um, it's thought to help with some types of uh, wound healing, um, but really the evidence is not out there, okay? If you look for evidence-based papers in some of these therapies, they're very equivocal at best or some saying they don't work at all. But you get a lot of anecdotal evidence um, on the curative properties. And you can't necessarily discount that, but before you go out and buy a $20,000 US dollar machine, um, I would definitely do your homework on this, okay? Um, the nice thing about these is that they can be used directly on or over the area. They're non-painful, okay, and very low stress for the animal, all right? And in some cases, animals seem to respond very well to this, particularly if they have a fibrotic joint, a very painful joint when you're trying to get it through range of motion. The low-tech answer to this is actually doing active range of motion, which we're gonna show you. 
There's also laser or LED forms of therapy. Again, probably even less evidence out there regarding this. Um, and it uses uh, infrared light to reduce pain and inflammation. It's very good if you have a patient who is needle phobic or you're trying to needle around the face or the eyes, um, if you have sensitive areas or superficial uses. And again, anecdotal evidence regarding this is that it is also fairly equal in terms of um, pain reduction as acupuncture, all right? But the, the evidence-based medicine is not in on these things. Um, again, the mechanisms of action for both these things are uh, vasodilation and increased blood flow, and that's the same for acupuncture. We, it works via endothelial changes um, and the blood flow changes within the body. You get cellular changes from that blood flow and biostimulation. You get intracellular changes and changes in your mitochondrial activation and improved wound healing. And then in, within your neural tissues, um, you get reduced synthesis of inflammatory meters, uh, mediators, and rapid maturation and re regeneration of axonal growth, in theory, okay? Those are the proposed mechanisms of action. So let's talk about some more proven, tried and true, and probably less expensive therapies. Active range of motion. Okay, this looks silly, but a therapy ball is a wonderful thing, particularly if you're trying to get a patient not to use a limb, okay? And this is a dog that just had stifle surgery. How am I doing about time? Am I okay? 10 minutes, okay, fabulous. Um, so, and the one thing that's really wonderful about this is it, if you don't have an underwater treadmill, a $20 ball, you know, that you can go buy at a, at a store is a great thing. Or steal it from your boyfriend or girlfriend while from doing their crunches. So um, basically you can put the entire animal on here if you have a larger dog or part of their body and load and unload the limb, okay, purposely and place, place it through an active range of motion as well as a partial weight bearing situation, okay, and that's a wonderful way. The biggest thing you have to do with animals to get them is to go slow the first time and not drop them, okay. If you drop them off the ball, they'll, they'll resist you, obviously. Okay, so here's Elsa. There are lots of balls out there. We have a ton of balls in our uh, rehab facility, but one of our favorite ones for large breed dogs are these large peanuts. And so we have Joanne, who's our therapist, sitting up there, rolling back and forth and giving the dog treats, which is always a positive thing. And basically what she's doing is she's gently rocking them into full extension and then rocking them back. It's pretty subtle, and the dog doesn't even notice either, right? Um, but that actually gets her fully extended out beyond what you could do in a passive range of motion situation where it's not fun. They're being trapped down in lateral recumbency and pushed and pulled around. But this is a, a good thing to do, and this is something owners can do at home, even just sitting in a chair and encouraging the dog to come up on their lap or encouraging them to come up and, and uh, you know, up on their arms, okay? Something you normally discourage, right? That's a trainer. Okay, does that make sense? Really easy stuff. So this is something we do with our owners when we want them to do range of motion. We don't have them do passive range of motion. Okay? The other thing we can use are things called Cavaletti rails, and they're very short ones here, okay? You can use ladders, you can use rods on the ground, anything to get the animal to step over. This is nice because we can, the, the poles are changeable here, and so, dependent upon if it's a Great Dane, we might decrease the number of poles versus a Chihuahua, we might increase it or lower it and raise it, okay? This, as they navigate through this, um, it encourages increased lengthening of their stride, increased active range of motion of their limbs, and um, encourages limb use, again, because it's a novel terrain, okay? And again, very low tech, very easy to construct. Let's talk about therapeutic exercise and perturbative training, okay? This is a very, very large balance board. If it were you or I, we would get on these little teeny tiny discs and balance around, okay? The great thing about balance boards is, again, surgery, even though we're doing surgery on one limb, oftentimes then we decrease our activity all over our body and we lose our core muscular strength, particularly in our neurologic patients, okay? So when we have these balance boards, 
And in the dog, we, we have a much bigger one. It looks like a cradle, okay? Um, we rock them back and forth, and that causes facilitated body awareness. Okay, I have to recorrect my balance and my center of gravity. Um, and we do this about three to five times, um, or uh, two to three times a day for three to five minute sessions, okay? And you rock them medial to lateral and anterior to posterior. And you can increase the difficulty by increasing the intensity, magnitude, speed, and the timing of these, but it can be actually quite tiring. And again, this is that dog. He actually, unfortunately, had a fibrocartilaginous embolus in addition to having a, a cruciate, a kind of a double whammy. Somewhat of a misdiagnosis, too. Okay? Make sense? Another extremely low-tech thing to do was um, gait patterning and cone training, okay? And again, that causes increased body awareness and then also increased loading on the inside limb, okay, um, as you work around the cones. Uh, I guess a good, um, happy, unintentional effect of rehab is most of our dogs ended up, end up better trained to um, walk on leash and listen to commands. The other things that we can use are weights and bands, um, and these are just some images. We don't use these as often, but you can get one to two pound weights for the limbs, resistance bands on the fore or hind limbs, or even resistance bands, and I, I'll show you this video later, okay? And then the final thing is using land treadmill, and I think I'm going to save this more for the next time because we're out of time, okay? But you can use low intensity stairs. Stairs are actually a good thing. It's just they can't leap on or off them or have falls. Um, and then land treadmill. The biggest thing that you have to pay attention to is control. I think this is funny. So I'll show you a couple of e uh, videos of this. But we often have multiple patients within our clinic at a time, and they're very interested in watching each other do things. So they'll sit by and just, you know, they'll all group around and watch one dog walk on, on the treadmill. Then they'll go over and watch another dog swim. So it's like a little group cheering session, I think, um, there of, of exercise. Okay. Should I stop? Yes. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. And for a nice lecture. We have time for one question or two. Can we put it? Uma doutora Leano vai ter mais palestras e seguramente haverá mais tempo, se não for agora. Em seguida teremos o professor Dr. Arturo Varejão. O Dr. Arturo Varejão é professor catedrático aqui na Universidade, fez residência em neuro, Neurologia Veterinária em Madrid, faz investigação na área de regeneração do neuro periférico e medula espinhal, é responsável pelo serviço de Neurologia do Hospital Veterinário da UTAD e vai-nos falar sobre convulsões e epilepsia no cão. Bom dia, um, pela terceira vez. Um, antes de mais, novamente, acho que nunca é demais, dar os parabéns à Associação de Estudantes de Medicina Veterinária da UTAD, uh, que cumpriram, enfim, e de forma em grande, uh, este, este, este congresso e conseguiram reunir um conjunto de palestrantes de excelente qualidade. Um, ora bem, eu, o tempo, portanto, já, já estamos um pouco atrasados, eu estou entre duas palestras excelentes duas oradoras americanas e um almoço que já está atrasado, portanto, acho que começo mal. Eu prometo dar, enfim, o melhor de mim, que vocês, enfim, consigam colher algo, enfim, que considerem útil e que se divirtam, que é aquilo que eu, que eu vou fazer. Hipócrates foi o primeiro homem que escreveu num tratado e que disse claramente que a epilepsia, que até então era julgada como como alguém que estava possuído pelo demónio, que não, que tinha uma doença cerebral. Portanto, havia uma causa, de facto, para que isso pudesse acontecer. Esta pintura, retrata é a pintura mais famosa sobre epilepsia, é de um pintor italiano do século XV, Raffaello Santi, 
a transfiguração de Cristo, onde na parte enfim, superior uh, podemos observar a transfiguração e na parte inferior, e infelizmente este quadro nunca foi acabado, porque ele entretanto faleceu, mas mesmo assim é uma pintura extremamente famosa, uh, podemos observar um pai vestido de verde, com portanto, um robe que simbolizava a esperança, com um filho a ter um ataque e onde é possível reconhecer um olhar fixo, uh, uns lábios sinusados e numa posição tónica. Portanto, está ele a pedir uh, ajuda a Cristo para que, de facto, o filho possa recuperar uh, desta sua doença. É uma doença neurológica extremamente comum, uh, está reportada entre 0.5 a 5.7 uh, em termos percentuais de presença em hospitais veterinários, pelo menos de referência. Um, em termos de definição, nós poderemos dizer então que é uma doença, a epilepsia corresponde, desculpem, a um conjunto de alterações clínicas que vão ter um clímax um, e que correspondem a descargas elétricas presentes no córtex cerebral, como, enfim, já tinha sido dito muitos anos antes. O pródromo, enfim, vamos falar de duas, três definições importantes, é um indicador a longo prazo de algo que vai acontecer, que infelizmente passa despercebido à maior parte dos proprietários ou então, pura e simplesmente, o animal, enfim, um, não o exibe, em que ele, durante horas ou até dias, uh, pode estar agitado, vocalizar. A aura, esta sim, uh, reportada frequentemente, enfim, durante a anamnese, onde o cliente uh, diz que o meu cão, antes de ter o ataque, costuma, enfim, ter um conjunto estereotipado uh, de, de, de manifestações. Corresponde já ao início da atividade elétrica, uh, tipicamente, uh, e durante segundos ou minutos antes, eles escondem-se ou, pelo contrário, procuram de forma ativa o proprietário. Uh, as pessoas que têm, de facto, este tipo de, de problemas, elas sentem que vão ter o ataque e, e geralmente sentam-se ou deitam-se uh, nos animais, enfim, uh, é sempre uh, difícil colher este tipo de, de problemas. Este é um boxer onde, uh, tipicamente, antes do ataque, este animal procurava esconder-se, refugiava-se e, passado uns minutos, portanto, iniciava o seu, o seu ataque. Isto é um vídeo um pouco longo, durou uns minutos. Uh, a cliente, quando trouxe este vídeo, tivemos a vê-lo com os alunos, portanto, o vídeo parecia que nunca mais acabava. E eu, portanto, fiz aqui algum corte e, mesmo assim, portanto, não vamos passá-lo todo, porque senão... Uh, é um, o animal ficava, portanto, notava uma, uma certa angústia, um ataque e pneu e refugiava-se. Passando ao próximo... Ah, o ictus corresponde já ao ataque propriamente dito, portanto. Um, e podemos ter alterações em termos uh, uh, motores, sensoriais, sempre difíceis para nós de fazer a colheita destes sinais, ou mesmo impossível em muitos casos, e possíveis também alterações de comportamento. E tipicamente duram 2, 3 minutos. A fase a seguir ao ictus, designada por pós-ictus, é o período portanto, que se segue ao ataque. Enfim, uh, o animal aqui pode exibir comportamentos muito variados, uh, animais que tipicamente se mostram desorientados, Uns vão defecar, urinar, procuram comer um, e outros mostram alterações enfim, tão graves como, por exemplo, a cegueira. Portanto, durante minutos uh, são incapazes sequer de uh, conseguir ver. Pelo menos numa fase inicial, este pós é bastante residual. Uh, o cliente, por vezes, nem reconhece. Quando o processo uh, se mantém uh, mais ou menos crónico, pode durar, em casos últimos, até alguns dias. Temos aqui um exemplo de um cachorro que tinha acabado portanto, de ter um ataque, mostra-se desorientado, com petialismo. Vamos ver uma breve enfim, avaliação neurológica onde ele é incapaz de ver. Isto não significa nada em termos de status neurológico definitivo do animal. O animal portanto, está ainda uh, sobre o efeito do ataque que acabou de ter. Isto é muito importante. Portanto, não podemos tirar conclusões pelo facto uh, do animal não estar a ver. Ele recuperou a visão passado uns minutos. Ele, após esta fase em que estava deitado. Ops. Desculpem, isto aqui. Vamos 
espaço. Ele vagueava pela sala, desorientado, sem saber por um dia. E só passados uns minutos é que ele regressou enfim, à vida dita normal e começou a ter um comportamento uh, de cachorro. Vamos avançar. Ora bem, o status epilético é um estado, em português diríamos um estado de mal epilético e definimos o estado epilético quando o ataque tem uma duração de 5 ou mais minutos. Ou então, entre dois ataques, sem que o animal consiga recuperar o seu estado de consciência. A epilepsia, enfim, que é enfim, o tema desta palestra, é, é por definição então uma doença cerebral crónica Uh, que têm por base ataques epilépticos que se vão repetir. Ora bem, nós sabemos hoje em dia que, em relação à epilepsia idiopática, também dita primária, em que a etiologia é desconhecida, portanto, nós possamos fazer o que quisermos em termos de exames complementares, não vamos conseguir encontrar uma causa para esses ataques, e sabe-se, enfim, há imensos artigos que estão a sair quase mensalmente, onde se diz que em determinadas raças, trago-vos aqui aquelas que existem mais em, em Portugal, Uh, que nitidamente há, de facto, uma componente genética um, importante nestes animais. Na secundária, ela pode ser secundária a numerosos processos, alterações congénitas, neoplasias, processos traumáticos, lesões vasculares, enfim, uma panóplia de situações pode estar na origem de uma epilepsia sintomática ou secundária. Os ditos uh, ataques epiléticos reativos uh, surgem quando uh, decorre, por exemplo, um processo de intoxicação, em que esta epilepsia desaparece, na maior parte das vezes desaparece, desde que seja removido o agente causal. Neste caso, enfim, um tóxico. Este dispositivo, enfim, com imensa informação, um, eu costumo dizer aos meus alunos que é o um mau diapositivo, tem mais sete linhas, portanto eu não vou ler, uh, que é mal. Um, dizer apenas que sabemos que há um desequilíbrio em termos de neurotransmissores, isto é, vamos ter uma maior presença de neurotransmissores excitatórios, aqui uma palavra especial para o glutamato, que é o mais importante, também o aspartato, ou então uma diminuição no número ou na sua atividade dos neurotransmissores inibitórios, destacam-se tanto a GABA e a glicina. O que acontece numa fase inicial, quando o animal começa a ter os primeiros ataques, Há, ou temos um conjunto de neurónios que vão despolarizar em conjunto. Isto é, vão ser capazes de dar origem a uma manifestação que vai ser depois perceptível. Esta, 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 esta forma de agir é, do ponto de vista orgânico, há uma tentativa de inibição desta despolarização que, enfim, quando ela portanto, se consegue produzir, são excitados a nível do mesmo hemisfério ou de noutro hemisfério, ou mesmo a nível de tálamo cortical, outros neurónios, portanto, zonas contíguas. Ora bem, utiliza-se muito esta expressão das células pacemaker, portanto, aquelas células que têm uma capacidade ou um padrão intrínseco uh, de despolarizarem, um, e o que importa dizer é que se nós não corrigirmos, uh, enfim, quando é necessário este tipo de situações, este uh, uh, número de células ou os focos vão aumentar. Isto do ponto de vista biológico é muito importante fazermos esta leitura. Ora bem, em relação aos ataques focais ou parciais, nós aqui até uns anos atrás uh, diríamos que quando temos uh, um foco epilético localizado numa zona distinta, por exemplo, no lobo temporal esquerdo, diríamos que estávamos perante um processo focal. Por exemplo, uma neoplasia, um processo vascular. Hoje em dia sabemos que não é bem assim. E cada vez mais parece que não é assim. E de facto temos muitos animais com epilepsia, portanto, sem que haja uma causa aparente e que se manifestam apenas uh, com ataques focais ou então focais e que se generalizam de seguida. Em relação aos ataques focais, eu trago-vos aqui, enfim, eh, várias, vários exemplos. Este é um animal, portanto, com alteração, sobretudo a nível dos músculos faciais, com alterações autonómicas também, tanto com a hipercialia. Um animal 
que não respondia portanto, aos estímulos auditivos, chamássemos por ele. O próximo vídeo foi um vídeo oferecido a uma colega, a doutora Catarina. É um animal portanto, que aparentemente não tem alteração do seu estado de consciência e que de repente começa com movimentos involuntários, neste caso da cabeça, sob o plano horizontal. Este vídeo podemos levar aspectos, enfim, um bocadinho fora da epilepsia e falar também de alterações dos gangos da base, enfim, poderá estar na gênese, é uma área, portanto, ainda de não muito fácil reconhecimento. Portanto, outro exemplo de manifestação focal. Este é um animal uh, que os vídeos trouxe do Royal College de Londres, uh, onde é um animal que imagina uh, moscas a passar e que enfim, tenta-as apanhar. Portanto, são aquilo que nós diríamos alterações do seu comportamento. As moscas, portanto, não existem. Portanto, ele é que as imagina. Ora bem, sem dúvida que pode ocorrer e sabemos que cada vez mais surgem este tipo de situações de generalização secundária. Este artigo é um artigo que eu convidava-vos, enfim, a depois a ler, isto está, está nos vossos dados. Antes de mais, pedi-vos desculpa, eu entreguei à Associação de Estudantes a comunicação há um mês atrás, dá um mês para cá, enfim, foram sendo alguns artigos e eu juntei a no sentido, enfim, de tornar... Uh, isto mais atual, portanto, se entretanto depois uh, quiserem, portanto, mandando-me um e-mail, eu posso mandamente fazer chegar um pouco mais de informação. Uh, este artigo do, do Luc Poncelet é um artigo interessante, onde ele de facto fala sobre a questão da epilepsia uh, focal de tipo idiopático, portanto, que é algo que não se falava há, então, há uns anos atrás e que penso que é algo que temos que levar em conta. Isto já comentamos da generalização ou, ou, ou da possibilidade do ataque ser generalizado, logo desde o início, com manifestação uh, da alteração do seu estado de consciência e associado, geralmente, a sinais motores bilaterais. Portanto, vamos ver depois um vídeo ou dois, neurologia sem vídeos, portanto, enfim, não seria neurologia. Um, estas convulsões, portanto, vamos classificá-las, as convulsões generalizadas ou primárias, ditas de grande mal, são as mais frequentemente observadas Uh, em medicina veterinária. Sobre a classificação de exervos, isto vale o que vale. Nós tentamos, enfim, somos clínicos, arranjar prateleiras para as coisas. Um, e, de facto, uh, nós seguimos um pouco aquilo, aquilo que a Liga Internacional para a Epilepsia Humana faz. Só que eles reúnem-se X em X anos e arranjam classificações diferentes. E a medicina veterinária vai um pouco atrás. Enfim, uh, portanto, uh, e às vezes temos dificuldades em encaixar as coisas. Uh, tipicamente, elas são de, de forma tónica ou clónica em que há uma fase tónica e depois clónica, vamos depois, depois ver isto em vídeos, uma fase, animais que têm apenas uma fase tónica, também vos trago um vídeo, animais que têm apenas uh, uma fase clónica, aliás trago-vos o vídeo, é do de baixo, enfim, também não podia trazer muito, demasiados vídeos, senão ficava sem tempo, esta bem mais rara, animais que <coughs> apenas perdem o tónus musculares nos músculos extensores, isto levanta-nos problemas, quando na anamnese eu penso, por exemplo, num problema cardiorrespiratório, Será neurológico ou não? Não é fácil. E as mioclónicas, onde temos como que fasciculações musculares bem localizadas. Já metem membros ou então músculos da cabeça. As ausências em medicina humana, de facto, elas são bastante frequentes. O que é que nós temos? Uma alteração única do estado de consciência. Esta situação é de difícil reconhecimento em medicina veterinária. Há quem mesmo diga que elas, por e simplesmente, enfim, não existem porque não estão documentadas. Ora bem, temos aqui um, um São Bernardo, uh, enfim, que está uh, já numa fase uh, inicial da sua convulsão, numa fase tónica, ele caiu do lado, perdeu o seu estado de consciência. Uh, há animais que fazem opistótonos de forma mais marcada, uma extensão dos quatro membros, ao qual se segue o um movimento de pedalagem, portanto, um, movimentos clónicos que duram, enfim, de forma variável, segundos, um minuto às vezes. O animal, uh, reparem... Uh, está com alteração do seu estado de consciência, é um animal que se estiver dentro de casa, este é um problema que temos, um animal deste num apartamento, a ter um ataque, não é fácil, enfim. 
ou manter. E se pensarmos em animais que não respondam bem à medicação, é um dos problemas, portanto, que o cliente pode ficar desesperado. Isto é um caso muito simpático. Ora bem, trago-vos aqui outro vídeo de um caso que depois, mais logo, o Dr. Francisco vos vai apresentar um animal com uma alteração. Este vídeo não vai correr. Queria tanto correr, se não vai correr. Não vai correr. Há mal se vem por bem. Uh, vocês ficaram para, para a comunicação livre do Dr. Francisco Fernandes, que deve, deve andar alguns por aí, e que seguramente portanto, vai ter um vídeo aqui deste animal, portanto, isto está ultrapassado o problema. Este vídeo, de facto, inseriu. I don't know if you in states you still have problems with computers. Yeah. Once in a while we have problems. É que eu não sei se se eu vou reiniciar. Eu quero dizer que sempre que estou com este técnico, o Sr. Paulo, já tenho problemas. Durante a minha formação, mas sempre nos resolveu. Portanto, eu penso que é uma sina que me persegue. Sempre que falo e está presente este senhor, tenho problemas. Passa-se aqui alguma coisa. Mas também não precisa correr o vídeo. Entra a seguir, entra a seguir. Não, 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 Mais, 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 os objetivos, como clínicos, são determinarmos a etiologia e, desde logo, sabermos se o, que, o que estamos a ver se é neurológico ou não e, se possível, chegar à causa. Uh, é evidente que o cliente, mais do que um diagnóstico, o cliente quer um prognóstico, quer saber o que é que vai ser do cão e, portanto, e devemos também conseguir o fazer e depois, e vamos ver já e de que forma, se vale a pena ou não iniciar o tratamento. Ora bem, em termos de história clínica, é fundamental conhecer, se possível, o pedigree, se o animal está ou não corretamente vacinado, se houve traumatismos, e nomeadamente traumatismos, diria no mínimo, até seis meses antes, portanto, em termos de traumatismo crânioencefálico, possíveis agentes tóxicos, enfim, é evidente, conhecer a história médica e cirúrgica poderá sempre ser vantajoso. Outro aspecto importante, enfim, e para quem é clínico, e estou a ver que há alguns clínicos, é que quando um cliente está a relatar um ataque, frequentemente está muito ansioso, diz que o ataque demorou meia hora e não sabe mais nada, portanto só diz ataque, ataque, ataque. Enfim, nós vamos prepará-lo para uma situação futura, que é com a ajuda de meios, nomeadamente câmaras, telemóveis, ou pelo menos um registro escrito, que o faça. Quanto tempo é que durou o ataque? De que forma é que começou? Um, se tem aumentado ao longo do tempo uh, e de modo que nos possa trazer em futuras consultas a informação relativa e que possa ser objetivo. Porque nós, médicos veterinários, e isto em medicina humana também se passa muito, lidar com, com a epilepsia é lidar com uma boa história clínica, é com a anamnese. Uh, portanto, e nunca ninguém deve fazer uma consulta de epilepsia, a primeira, que não dure pelo menos 
40 minutos, portanto, porque há muito a conversar com o proprietário. Este artigo saiu na Lancet, muito interessante, em 2009, onde, de facto, se dizia que no nosso mundo digital há uma melhoria boa em termos de, de, de neurologia humana, e nós também poderemos dizer o mesmo em termos de neurologia veterinária, relativamente à questão da utilização dos telemóveis, onde os clientes chegam à clínica com o registro filmado. Isto facilita-nos muito a vida. Outro aspecto importante, e esta aqui já, de facto, em termos de, de exame, na clínica, no hospital, é observar se entre os ataques há alterações várias. Nomeadamente, se o animal tem alterações de estado mental, se é um animal que era calmo e de repente se é um animal que é agressivo, se é um animal que tem déficits visuais quando não o tinha, se tem alterações proprioceptivas, e já fomos falando aqui de proprioceção, um animal que tem dificuldades em dormir, que passa a dormir mais horas, enfim, alterações que possam denotar algo estrutural presente no encéfalo. É evidente que, como em qualquer processo, uma base mínima de dados é obrigatória. Exames de diagnóstico mais avançados, enfim, de acordo com a situação. Se vocês tiverem um cão que suspeita de um problema hepático, um exame mais detalhado em termos de funcionamento hepático será decisivo. Se eu tenho um cachorro com 3 meses e o cão tem ataques e para disso em outro tipo de sinais, aqui há um PCR que o cão possa ter uma esgana. Em termos de imagem, está aqui 7 anos, enfim, eu poderia pôr 5. E por vezes, enfim, temos que fazê-lo de forma bem mais antecipada. É obrigatório num cão que tem ataques e que tem mais de 7 anos, e que nunca teve ataques, e é um cliente que sabe tudo sobre o cão, esse animal deve fazer uma tomografia ou ressonância magnética, portanto, à cabeça, está bem? É obrigatório. Não vale a pena tentar, porque provavelmente haverá uma causa que vocês possam descobrir. Pelo menos de uma forma em geral. Não é sempre assim, mas é frequentemente. Ora bem, dizer que é evidente que a probabilidade de ser uma, uma situação idiopática, sem causa aparente, vai aumentar se o primeiro ataque surge entre o ano 1 e o ano 5. Há quem põe entre os 6 meses e os 6 anos, enfim, uh, utilizem uh, enfim, a barreira que quiserem. Animais, geralmente porte médio, ou um pouco acima. Uh, animais com raça pura e que já tenham componente hereditária bem documentada. Uh, e em que o período entre os ataques, portanto, o período uh, interictos, seja considerado normal. Uh, e geralmente tem ataques espaçados 4 semanas. Pondo isto de forma prática, se, se vocês tiverem um cão com 8 anos de idade e o cliente vos diz que o meu cão teve um ataque na semana passada, hoje de manhã teve um e acabou de ter outro, provavelmente o vosso cão que tem não é um cão com uma epilepsia idiopática. Portanto, terá ou devem encontrar alguma causa. O ser sintomático, enfim, tudo ao contrário, portanto, animais ou muito jovens, animais com menos de um ano de idade, ou animais com mais de sete anos. Em relação, enfim, são apenas exemplos, atendendo à idade, animais jovens, enfim, um real especial para os quadros infecciosos e as alterações, enfim, de natureza congénita, entre o ano 1 e o ano 5, Encaixa-se perfeitamente, então, a epilepsia idiopática e, sem dúvida, com os tumores cerebrais, mas não só, em animais com mais de 5, enfim, 5 anos de idade. Ora bem, os nossos objetivos. Este é outro problema. É que o cliente, geralmente, quando vem à consulta, quer um remédio e quer que o cão fique curado. Não vai ficar curado. Doença cerebral crónica. Ele vai ter sempre epilepsia, ninguém se livra dela. Agora, felizmente, hoje em dia, o que é que conseguimos? Que a maior parte dos animais consiga morrer por outra situação qualquer que não a da epilepsia. Uh, estamos a falar, neste caso, de epilepsia idiopática. Portanto, o que nós devemos dizer ao cliente, olha, vamos tentar diminuir a frequência, a intensidade, a duração dos ataques. Por vezes, um animal tem um ataque cada três meses, se passar a ter um ataque cada seis meses, é bom, é um objetivo realista, bem conseguido. Um, e em animais que têm alterações graves no pós-ictus, diminuir ou retirar, portanto, esta, esta situação. Ora bem, dizer que o proprietário é aqui um ponto fundamental. E diria que a maior parte dos falhanços como clínicos em relação à epilepsia deve-se ao proprietário. 
ou ao veterinário que não conseguiu convencer o proprietário. Porque há proprietários que, enfim, apesar desta conversa toda, ao fim de três meses o cão está sem ataques, o que é que faz? Isto é como um antibiótico, a gente está curado a infecção, param o medicamento e param de forma abrupta ainda por cima. E há depois o aparecimento de problemas graves, como por exemplo, clusters e estados epiléticos. Portanto, o proprietário aqui é peça fundamental. Ora bem, ideias, enfim, quase regras em relação a quando devemos iniciar ou não uma, um tratamento médico para a epilepsia. Se temos uma alteração estrutural, eu tenho um processo tumoral para além de pensar na quimioterapia, na radioterapia, numa intervenção cirúrgica, este animal também deve ser medicado. Se houve um estado epiléticos, que é sempre grave, um, mais do que três ataques generalizados num período curto, portanto, de 24 horas, se teve dois ou mais clusters num ano, ou então aquilo que é mais frequente, enfim, nós fazemos, uh, porque a maior parte dos animais enquadram-se aqui, quando o animal tem dois ou mais ataques num período de seis meses. Portanto, não pensem duas vezes, deve iniciar a medicação. Em situações em que o primeiro ataque surge durante a primeira semana, eu vejo bastantes animais com traumatismos craniocefálicos, por experiência, digo-vos que aqueles animais que têm ataques relacionados com o um trauma têm nas primeiras 24, 48 horas. Contudo, há animais enfim, que o período se dilata um pouco. Ou então, em animais em que o pós-ictus é perfeitamente apenas não tolerado pelo proprietário. Portanto, há alterações, manifestações graves entre os ataques. Este é o velhinho fenobarbital, que é barato, portanto, em Portugal e não só, e que diria que é a droga ainda hoje de eleição um fármaco de primeira linha uh, para começarmos, portanto, a uh, trabalhar uh, com estes animais. 2, 3 mg peros, bid. Há muitos colegas a receber animais que apenas aplicam uh, este produto uma vez por dia. É muito pouco, está bem? Duas vezes a três vezes ao dia. Portanto, uh, cada 24 horas é insuficiente. Este é aquele diapositivo que vocês não vão olhar para aqui. Uh, não interessa para nada. Apenas que vocês depois podem ler em casa. Aqui há... Uh, um, um estimular, enfim, uh, dos fermentos microsomáticos hepáticos, o que é que isto quer dizer? Quer dizer que eu posso ter um animal perfeitamente controlado e ao fim de uns meses é provável que eu tenha que aumentar a dose, está bem? Isto é normal, portanto não tem problema nenhum. Efeitos adversos, aqueles que costumam acontecer quase sempre, é o animal estar ligeiramente sedado, durante uma, duas semanas, uma ligeira ataxia pode ocorrer, em particular, poliúria, polidípsia e polifagia. Portanto, isto são sinais que o cliente deve saber que vão acontecer. Se não, ele vai-vos telefonar a dizer que o cão não está uh, normal. Ora bem, o brometo de potássio, uh, de forma magistral, em Portugal temos, alguns países não existe, comercializado, o Epilise, um, é também um fármaco que muitos colegas utilizam como fármaco de eleição, um, é também, portanto, uma possibilidade Uh, apenas uma nota, uh, a dieta deve ser controlada, isto é, não deve haver uma variação na dieta, já que, uh, e algo está aqui, a eliminação renal uh, do brometo vai aumentar com a ingestão de cloretos. Podemos também utilizar o brometo de sódio, eles são exatamente iguais em termos de, 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 de capacidade uh, de ultrapassar portanto, a, a epilepsia de alguma forma, Uh, contudo, uh, utiliza-se muito mais o brometo de potássio. Portanto, há particularidades próprias em relação ao brometo de sódio, nomeadamente animais com hipoadrenocorticismo, animais portanto, que têm níveis elevados de potássio e que devemos portanto, procurar controlar. Os, os efeitos adversos são muito similares ao fenobarbital. Uh, aqui um realce para o brumismo. Trago-vos aqui enfim, um artigo que podem ler, uh, onde foram feitos um, um estudo em 83 uh, animais, onde de facto os sinais típicos relacionados com um excesso uh, deste fármaco em circulação, uh, alterações de tetraparesia e alteração de consciência, com remissão também fácil dos sinais uh, quando o fármaco foi uh, baixado à dose ou retirado mesmo de circulação em alguns dos animais. Portanto, por o mesmo, geralmente sem grandes problemas, desde que seja reconhecido. Ora bem, uh, em relação à epilepsia, os livros, os artigos dizem que cerca de 25% dos animais não respondem bem àqueles fármacos de primeira linha. Portanto, o fenobarbital, o de potássio, enfim, eu falo com vários colegas um, 
da privada, eles têm números similares aos meus. Eu diria que a nossa eficácia é ligeiramente superior. Portanto, estes valores são valores, enfim, dados de referência de hospitais em Inglaterra, nos Estados Unidos, onde eles com frequência vêm animais portanto, com epilepsia refratária. Portanto, provavelmente temos mais sucesso do que os 75%. Contudo, dizer que quando é que um animal é epilético refratário. Portanto, ele terá que encaixar-se enfim, nestas alíneas, portanto, a etiologia dos ataques não foi encontrada, portanto, fizemos tudo aquilo que era possível, que estava ao alcance do clínico. O dosiamento do fenobarbital estará entre os 20 e os 35 microgramas por mililitro, portanto, e ele foi administrado durante um período mínimo de 3 meses. Por outras palavras, ninguém pode dizer que um cão é refratário, só porque passado um mês o cão está igual, continua com ataques de três em três semanas, enfim, ou com um ataque por mês. Portanto, temos que, de, de facto, esperar algum tempo. Este aspecto tem a ver com uh, aquilo que, que, que já comentamos. Nós não vamos curar a epilepsia, vamos é tentar controlar da melhor maneira que é possível. São os tais 25% que eu vos falava, enfim, são os números registados pela literatura. E o fármaco de eleição, que ainda hoje a maior parte dos colegas utiliza para associar uh, ao fenobrebital, é o brometo de potássio. Existe uma panóplia, uh, neste momento, de fármacos ditos de segunda linha, uh, que são avançados. Dizer-vos ainda que, pelo menos em termos científicos, com publicação, os dados são ainda bastante limitados, e quando digo limitados, digo em quantidade de animais que estão a ser tratados, a gabapentina, enfim, uh, a zonizamida e o leptiracetam. Uma palavra, portanto, ou outra sobre cada um deles. Este é um artigo uh, do Simon Platt, Uh, onde fala, portanto, de alguma vantagem em relação à gabapentina num número muito restrito de animais, estamos a falar de apenas de 11 animais, enfim, alguns resultados. Uh, em relação à zonizamida, que eu pessoalmente, uh, desculpem lá, uh, não tenho experiência, uh, não tenho utilizado, estas são as doses reportadas quando se juntam uh, com o fenobarbital, administrado sozinho em monoterapia, uma dose, uh, portanto, uh, inferior, a começar e depois poderá ser aumentada de forma gradual. Este é um artigo uh, da colega alemã, portanto, Andrea Tippold, e da equipa dela, onde de facto encontraram efeitos positivos e uma boa eficácia clínica de alguma forma e sem, portanto, o, uh, problemas clínicos para o animal, portanto, a zona examida, um número restrito, portanto, novamente 11 animais. Temos em Portugal a desvantagem, eu não sei se, se alguém daqui está a utilizar, é que é um produto extremamente caro. O Zona Gran é, é de facto muito caro e se pensamos isto a longo prazo, portanto, diria que não é para todas as bolsas. O Kepra, portanto, o Levitiracetam, esse sim eu tenho utilizado bastante, é de facto um fármaco que aparentemente está a ser utilizado cada vez mais e mais, funciona também para o gato, nestas doses de 20 mg quilo, tido associado ou não ao fenobarbital. Em 2008, o uh, Holger Volk, do Royal College, juntamente com o Simon Platt e esta colega que tem estudado bastante epilepsia a nível da Europa, Kate Chandler, uh, já advogavam, portanto, uh, com utilidade a sua utilização. Num artigo mais recente, este saiu há pouco tempo, uh, estou a ver aqui um nome, Natasha Holby, Karen Munhanha, uh, onde, de facto, encontraram alguma eficácia Uh, em termos estatísticos, há ali problemas com o grupo placebo. Enfim, é um artigo interessante de ler. É um número também uh, não muito elevado de animais. Uh, contudo, portanto, diria que está em aberto a sua utilização. E seguramente nos próximos meses vão sair mais artigos com o leve tira -setan. Ora bem, sobre isto não vamos aqui perder tempo. Dizer que a cirurgia é a natureza experimental. Há muita pouca coisa em termos clínicos feitos. A estimulação vagal tem sido feita na Carolina do Norte com o colega Cara Munhanha, enfim, mas o preço do equipamento enfim, torna impossível a sua aplicabilidade. A acupuntura, enfim, tem sido utilizada por colegas que trabalham na acupuntura. Eu vi alguns resultados nos Estados Unidos associado à medicação. A dieta cetogénica, pura e simplesmente esqueçam, está bem? Ela funciona no ser humano, em medicina treinária, os trabalhos serão publicados. Estamos a falar, portanto, com dietas ricas em gordura, baixas em carboidratos 
e que terão que ter para o cão uma proteína média, portanto a proteína nunca poderá ser baixa, estamos a falar de 28% para que ela seja palatável e que possa ser nutritiva, mas de facto os resultados foram nulos, portanto dieta cetogénica. Ora bem, temos o prazer de ter aqui na plateia a doutora Raquel Monteiro, diplomada em Neurologia e a trabalhar na Praça Londrina, e que está aqui presente, um, e ainda há pouco discuti com ela portanto, este artigo, um artigo muito interessante, que reúne um, mais de 400 animais e, de facto, o trabalho uh, demonstra de forma clara que há uma influência positiva na castração, portanto, machos e fêmeas, em relação aos clusters. E nesse artigo realçam uh, o boxer e o pastor alemão, enfim, como os cães com epilepsia idiopática e mais representados em termos de clusters, Uh, e, quiçá, há lá uma nota, eu falava com ela, portanto, mas ela dizia que os estatísticos foram malandros e que não, disseram, não deixaram escrever o resto, quiçá possa ser útil também, não só nos clusters, mas no controle em si da epilepsia idiopática. Portanto, eu diria, por outras palavras, se não há problemas em castrar o animal, uh, e a FIEMA em particular, nós já o fazemos até por uma questão uh, durante o ciclo éstrico, ela possa ter variação na resposta à medicação, poderá ser, portanto, algo interessante. Ora bem, chamadas telefónicas que possamos receber em relação é preciso levar o cão ou não, e é um cão epilético, vocês reconhecem, é, que já conhecem, é, em relação ao hospital. Se o ataque teve uma duração superior a 5 minutos, sim, o animal deve ser encaminhado é, para a ajuda médica ou veterinária. Se o animal, num período de 24 horas, teve 3 ou mais ataques, é fundamental também que peça ajuda médica veterinária. E depois, enfim, lá será feito o protocolo de sacos epiléticos, cai fora aqui do âmbito desta aula, desta aula, desculpem, desta palestra, isto é uma força de hábito. Um, em relação ao tratamento em casa, sempre que um cão uh, sai com conselhos e uma receita em relação a um fármaco, ele também deve sair com outra receita relativamente ao tratamento de emergência. Ou porque é muito tarde, ou porque o cliente foi de férias e é necessário, por vezes, ajudar o animal. Em particular, quando o animal tem clusters, tem vários ataques, enfim, em poucas horas, ou então na presença de uma situação mais grave, enfim, ou pelo menos tão grave, de status epiléticos. Recomenda-se, então, a administração retal do diazepam, Dizer que em alguns países, enfim, nem tudo vai mal, aqui por terras de, de Camões, nós temos desde há muitos anos o diazepam em forma retal, quem não tem, tem que utilizar as ampolas por via intravenosa e colocá-las no reto, enfim, também se pode fazer, não é tão prático. A concentração plasmática máxima é atingida de uma forma bastante boa, em 15 minutos, e tem uma ação de pelo menos uma hora. Portanto, é algo que é fácil, se vocês explicarem ao proprietário como é que se faz. Esta é a apresentação que temos cá em Portugal. Um, se o animal já está a tomar o fenobarbital, portanto, o luminal, a luminaletas, tanto a outra, a outro um, que vocês tenham receitado, administrar até o um máximo de 2 miligramas quilo. Nós temos a representação cá em Portugal de 5 e de 10 miligramas. E devemos administrá-lo por um, uma frequência máxima de 3 vezes em 24 horas. Ora bem, este é um diapositivo. Uh, eu acho que vamos chegar cedo mais ao, ao restaurante, portanto estou a ver que estou, acelerei um bocadinho mais. Uh, agora posso falar de forma um bocadinho mais, mais serena. Dizer o seguinte, que uh, o que é que nós devemos procurar como clínicos? Eu, eu, eu estou a dizer isto e estou-me a lembrar das palavras do Richard Kutter, uh, que numa formação que fizemos em, em, em Londres, ele, ele dizia, ele também tinha um espírito pequeno australiano, dizia que estava-se a borrifar para um, os valores plasmáticos e não levava isto em conta. Eu diria que, com bom senso, devemos levar o que diz o proprietário, como o cão está a reagir e, já agora, também os níveis plasmáticos. Em relação ao fenobarbital, estes são os valores ideais, entre 20 a 35 microgramas por mililitro. Eu, por experiência minha com fenobarbital e começando com aquela dose, 2 a 3 miligramas, eu geralmente obtenho sempre valores baixos. 18, 19, 21, 22, que não é preocupante, estando o cão bem. Um, em relação ao brometo de potássio, estes são os valores, 2 a 3 miligramas por mililitro, isto em monoterapia, associados, estes são os valores intermédios, reparem, 25 microgramas e mais ou menos 1.5 miligramas por mililitro relativamente ao brometo de potássio. Portanto, numa situação ideal, mas levando sempre em conta 
o animal, que ao fim e ao cabo é o mais importante. Em relação a isto, a dizer que as amostras sanguíneas devem ser colhidas preferencialmente em jejum, portanto de manhã, e, enfim, atendendo à conjuntura económica, nós no mínimo, duas, três semanas depois de começar a terapia, tanto a terapêutica com o fenómeno orbital, fazemos a monitorização e depois, diria que no mínimo de seis em seis meses, está bem? Um, se possível, portanto, enfim, de forma um pouco mais pontual. Ora bem, quando temos um animal que tem uma dose baixa, que não está a responder, em termos plasmáticos, não está a responder bem à medicação, esta é, de facto, a fórmula que vocês podem utilizar. O valor total em relação ao fenómeno orbital devem dividir de forma bidiária ou mesmo tridiária. É evidente que o TID aqui levanta nos problemas que há clientes que saem de manhã e só chegam à noite, por isso estão que ver caso a caso. Em relação ao brometo de potássio, Uh, portanto, este é o valor que vai dar na chamada nova dose de manutenção. Portanto, isto é feito de forma muito simples, calculando o valor que nós queremos, o que nós temos e depois chegamos portanto, a um valor final. Há colegas que optam por outros meios, que é, aumentam 10% cada vez, 20%, eu diria que isto de facto é bem mais científico. Um, em relação à junção do fano orbital com o brometo de potássio, um, Há sempre a possibilidade de fazermos um desmame gradual do fano orbital. Há várias formas de o fazer. Esta é uma delas, é quando eu tenho valores de, de KBR de 1.5 mg e não tenho ataques há pelo menos 6 meses, eu posso, de forma gradual, reduzir o fano orbital. Eu nunca faço esta redução em menos de 3 meses. Há animais que demoram cerca de 6 meses a desmamar por completo o fano orbital. Enfim. Cada caso é um caso, o que importa aqui é manter um contacto direto com o proprietário. E depois um alerta, isto tem a ver logo com a anamnese, é a frequência dos ataques. Eu diria que talvez é o aspecto mais importante, enfim, que às vezes os livros não, não incidem bem. Os clientes com frequência dizem que o meu cão tem um ataque uma vez por ano, simplesmente porque não olha para ele 24 horas, é impossível. Mas há clientes que saem de manhã e chegam à noite. Se o cão teve um, três ataques durante o dia, passou ao lado. Uh, de modo que, enfim... Uh, convém saber que tipo, uh, qual é o envolvimento social do animal dentro de casa. E pronto, portanto, isto é um conjunto de colegas uh, da parte da clínica da neuropatologia que trabalham no serviço de neurologia. Falta aqui a colega Justina, que estava, portanto, está de licença maternal e que faltou à foto, portanto, uh, mas uh, está aqui, enfim, em espírito e não de forma física. Muito obrigado. Alguma questão que queiram colocar? Ainda temos tempo para algumas perguntas, se alguém quiser fazer. Pronto, estamos por terminada a parte da manhã. Vamos dar então início também à sessão da tarde das Jornadas Internacionais de Medicina Veterinária com a palestra intitulada Spinal Radiographs, a Useful Diagnostic Tool, que vai ser preferida pela doutora Natasha Wolby. Eu me estou. Ok. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. See, I haven't got that down in Portuguese yet, I'm afraid. All right, this next session, we're going to talk about spinal radiographs. And the reason I really like to talk about this is that it is probably your, beyond your physical and neuro exam, it is your first line diagnostic tool for any spinal disease, okay? So, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how you actually get radiographs that you can interpret. You need to get good quality radiographs. We're going to talk about your approach to interpreting them, just briefly, and then we're going to apply that to a lot of different diseases that you can actually identify radiographically, okay? And certainly when I'm teaching students on our neurology rotation, I have a whole folder of spinal radiographs that I want them to go through throughout the two weeks they spend with us and make diagnoses, because it, it really is important that you can do this. Just a couple of words about why radiographs are relevant. If you look at the spine, obviously we see disease because of problems with the spinal cord or the nerve roots. That's why we would see neurologic disease. But they are carefully encased and protected by bone, the bone of the vertebrae, okay? 
And of course, that means, unfortunately, that diseases of the vertebrae will cause problems. Of course. Um, the other thing to say is because we want the spine to be nice and movable, we're much more likely to have problems with degeneration over time. The spine is composed of lots of individual vertebrae that are held together by soft tissue structures that can have problems over time. So you don't see that many brain diseases because of disease of the skull. Occasionally you do, but not very often because it's not that kind of movable, complex structure that the spine is. So enough about that. What diagnosis should we be able to make? Well, fractures and luxations. Discospondylitis. All the students at North Carolina know that's my favorite disease. It's one of my favorite diseases because you can take a radiograph and you can diagnose it and you can just treat it with antibiotics. That's very satisfying. Vertebral neoplasia, some you will see. Produce enough bone loss that you'll see them on radiographs. And of course, congenital defects. We'll talk about those because a lot of those are unimportant and some are very important. And then disc disease and degenerative changes. Okay? All right, diagnostic images. First thing about getting diagnostic radiographs is, ironically enough, to examine your patient. Okay? Do a careful neurologic exam. Why? Because you can find many changes on radiographs that are unimportant, they're clinically insignificant. So if you don't know what signs your patient's showing, you can't interpret the radiographs. So that's number one. So you examine your patient, you localize the signs. The other thing to remember is you've got to be very careful moving your patient, okay? You don't want to exacerbate the underlying disease. One of the worst things that we can do in, as veterinarians is make our patients worse. First, do no harm. Okay, so be very careful. And here's an example of why. This is from the good old days when we did myelograms. We don't really do myelograms anymore. But here's a myelogram from a Doberman Pinscher. Okay, and as you can see on this myelogram, there's a big bulging disc right here at C56. Pretty significant, yeah? Here's the same dog, and all that's happened is the neck has been extended a little. Now you see this big bulging disc is perhaps a little bit worse, but we also see that the ligaments dorsally are being buckled down and are compressing the cord from dorsally, and we see another disc starting to bulge behind here. So you can take a dog like that, sedate it for a radiograph, let its neck loll around, and it hits its spinal cord, and when it wakes up, when it comes around from its sedation, it can't walk. That doesn't look good. It's not what you're trying to do. So always, always, always support the spine of your spinal patients when you're doing radiographs, OK? So you really want to try and get very good lateral and VD projections when you take your radiographs. You don't want things to be twisted because it makes it very hard to interpret. If you're trying to look at disk spaces, and a lot of the time we are looking at disk spaces, you need to take multiple views because you want the x-ray beam to be going straight through the disk space. You don't want it to be divergent, OK? And always radiograph the entire spine in cases of trauma, or if you think they have discospondylitis, because they can have multifocal disease, OK? So positioning. This is actually one of my dogs, was one of my dogs, little Rosie. And she was in radiology for something else. So while she was sedate, I took some photographs. So the, the only point I'm trying to get across with these radiographs is that you really need to use sponges or something to pad the animals so that you get them straight, OK? Um, kind of problem areas. You see how we've got a little pad here under the neck? We can see the neck just loll down. Rosie has a really big, thick, muscly neck. If they've got a thin neck, you can get a lot of curvature there. Um, and you, you, the other thing to remember is where you need to focus the beam is quite a long way down from the back. You don't want to be focusing right on the dorsal spinous processes. Same thing's shown here, OK? When you're evaluating the radiographs, you need to know your basic anatomy. You need to know where things are a little bit different in the anatomy. L7 is a little shorter than L6, for example. So you need to know your anatomy. You need to look at the alignment of the vertebrae, and you need to look at that in two planes. 
It's very useful to stand a little back. Well, you're stood well back from all the radiographs I'm going to show you, so you'll see everything. Okay? If you get too close, sometimes you miss obvious things. You always need to assess intervertebral disc spaces. So for me, I start looking at the radiograph, I count the vertebrae, I see how many ribs there are. I look at things like that. Then I start to do that little step back and how well aligned is everything. Then I start looking at the disc spaces. And I will compare each disc space with the one immediately caudal and the one cranial to look at the width and see if they're narrowed. Okay? It needs to be narrowed compared to the one on each side for you to say it's narrowed. Then I'll start to look at the intervertebral foramen. You all know all the terms I'm using you're good with. Yeah? Start to look at that. <coughs> I'll look at the end plates. I'll really focus on the end plates, and I'll show you why. And then I'll actually look at the vertebrae, see what the density of the vertebrae are. Okay. And then finally, I'm going to try and just figure out where have I got degenerative changes. So we're going to show you a lot of radiographs. We can see them OK up here. Here we've got ones that are really essentially normal. I just want to make various points. One real problem area is C12. It's very difficult to evaluate, particularly in really small and really young animals. You want to look and see that the wings of the atlas are more or less overlying each other. And then you know that it's pretty lateral. Okay? Nice landmark in the caudal cervical spine is this C6 wing, okay? the transverse process of C6. Notice how the scapula is over this. So quite often we'll have real problems with the shoulder lying over the caudal cervical spine. It's nice to really pull them back. If you have an animal with really severe neck pain, even with sedation, sometimes they've got muscle spasm, a shoulder's held up, and, and you can't do that. You literally just have to read through it. The area of the spine you're least likely to see an abnormality. Where do you think that is? That's too complex a question for after lunch, isn't it? Yeah? Um, middle and cranial thoracic spine. Okay, it's quite a stable area. You're less likely to see trauma there. You're less likely to see disc herniations there. However, we do see some abnormalities. Looking at this one, the only thing I'm pointing out here are some degenerative changes in the dorsal spinous processes. But the areas that we really do commonly see problems are the most mobile areas. So the atlantoaxial junction and C2, which is a really thin, pathetic vertebra and can fracture. Um, caudal cervical spine, very mobile. Thoracolumbar junction and lumbosacral junction. Those are all areas you really want to take a close look at. Here, all I've got arrowed is some degenerative joint disease of this articular facet, which is probably completely insignificant. OK, just to look a little bit closer here in the caudal cervical spine, very, very common for us to have cases referred to us where this dog has a narrow disc space at C3, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 6, for example. And usually it's just that the film is not straight. Okay? Um, but as you can see on this one, we've got lots of overlying density because of the scapula there. But as you look on this, this does look narrow compared to the one cranial and caudal. Okay? Problem with this radiograph here is it's not truly lateral. How do we know that? We can see two ribs, okay? so it's not a good lateral. And in fact, we're pretty bad at getting good laterals at our institution, I would say, sadly. The atlantoaxial junction, we used to recommend, in order to see the DENS, the odontoid process of C2, we used to recommend a complicated open mouth view. You really don't need to do that. Okay? So here on this VD view, you can clearly see a DENS. Okay? You can also sometimes see it on the lateral, particularly if they are a little bit obliqued. You can see your dens there. So what do you think of this radiograph? Um, is it possible to have the lights down even more? I know you'll all go to sleep, but that's OK. Um, at least you can see the radiographs in your dreams. <coughs> so this is a very young Boston Terrier. Came in with tetraparesis. And of course, all of its growth plates are still open. OK, so the vertebrae look really abnormal. But in particular, C1 has a lot of different growth plates. And this looks like a fracture fragment. It's just the body of, part of the body of C1. So you need to be really careful on those guys, interpreting them. What do we have here? Here we have some degenerative changes. So we've got some ventral spondylosis here at the thoracolumbar junction and back, and at the lumbosacral junction. And here we've got some pretty impressive degenerative joint disease of the facets. 
So what's the significance of these? Are they significant? Yes or no? Or maybe? Maybe. Maybe. You can't diagnose anything off this. Well, you can. You can say they've got degenerative changes. Okay? Whether or not they're compressive and causing neurologic disease, who knows? What I can tell you is it's quite unusual to have a chronic type 2 disc herniation. We'll talk more about those in the next session without some evidence of degenerative changes. It can happen, but it's kind of unusual. So if I see these changes, I know that's a possibility. If it's totally clean, it's much less likely that we'll find a type 2 disc herniation. Okay? <clears throat> All right, what I want to do now is just go through different diseases and talk about the classic findings. So, if we start off with type 1 intervertebral disc disease, that's the IVDD. So things that we can find. <coughs> Number one is perhaps nothing at all. Sometimes your radiographs can look really normal. Okay, so normal radiographs don't rule it out. But beyond that, if we see changes, we might see mineralized nuclear material actually sitting up in the canal. We'd certainly hope to see it in a disk space somewhere, but sometimes you don't. And if you see it up in the canal, then that becomes really much more significant. We see narrowing or wedging. You all understand the term wedging, like this, of a disk space, with respect to the spaces cranial and caudal. We see a pacification of the intervertebral foramen. And sometimes you don't see a pacification because of mineralized disc material in the canal. Sometimes you just see that foramen change shape. Okay? And then very, very occasionally you see a vacuum phenomenon. Do you know what that is? Are you familiar with this? No, I'm going to show you. Pretty rare. Okay, so let's look at some radiographs. So, what can you see on this? Anything? Nothing. Anybody see any mineralized disc material? I don't. Okay? Can't see any mineralized disc material. Do you see a narrow disc space? Yes. Absolutely. A narrow disc space. If you look at this disc space compared to one cranial and one caudal, it certainly is narrowed. So that's kind of suggestive. Maybe totally incidental. May mean nothing, but it's kind of suggestive. And this dog actually came in on Christmas Day, so I remember it well. It was a really overweight uh, beagle mix, and it was tetraplegic. It was down in all four legs, so it got surgery on Christmas Day. Um, and there was no MRI on Christmas Day, so it got a myelogram. And here is the compression of the spinal cord. And in fact, once you've done the myelogram, you can, you can see the mineralized disc material. You couldn't see it on the plane radiographs, though. All right, what about this one? Can we see any mineralized disc material? Yes, we can. And also, when you look at this carefully, you, can, you can't really say that's narrowed because this is quite an oblique view, so we're not shooting straight through it. So it certainly doesn't look narrow compared with that one. Maybe if we'd repositioned, we'd have done a better job of that. But you can see that the intervertebral foramen kind of has some opacity up there, suggestive that the disc material has herniated. Okay? And in fact, that was where the um, significant compression was. Mm, now, this is my favorite acute intervertebral disc herniation radiograph. So what is odd about this radiograph? If anybody gets this right, I'm trying to think of an appropriate reward. I don't know. You will know that you're very smart. How about that? That would be the reward. What's unusual about this radiograph? Do you know what species it is? It's a species that says, meow. It's a cat, OK? So it's kind of ironic that my classic example is a cat, all right? So we can see lots of things. We can see mineralized disc material in situ, so in the correct place. What does that tell us? All it tells us is that the degenerative changes have, have occurred. That's all it tells us. We can see two disc spaces that actually do look narrowed with respect to the one cranial and caudal. However, in both cases, you see the ventral spondylosis clearly here, 
And you can see that they look sclerotic, the end plates, yeah? They're sclerosis. So it looks chronic. That looks really chronic, all right? And this cat went acutely down, acutely paralyzed. When you look at this intervertebral foramen, it's got a different appearance, hasn't it? There's a pacification of it, OK? So in fact, this was where the clinically significant disc herniation had occurred. But this radiograph pretty much shows everything you need to know. All right, what about this one? Anybody see an abnormality on this one? Beyond the clear ventral spondylosis and some sclerosis. And a collapsed disc space, yeah? What do you think this is here? And you know what? This is really easy in retrospect. Ahead of time, it's a little bit hard. That's actually a bubble of gas. It's actually nitrogen. This is a vacuum phenomenon, OK? So if you look at this on CT, look at that. There's that bubble of gas, OK? So the vacuum phenomenon can occur. It's not really any longer a vacuum, but the nuclear material herniates acutely, leaving a vacuum which pulls nitrogen out of circulation. So if you see that, you pretty much know there's been an acute disc herniation at that site. The trouble is, you only see it in about 0.05% of cases. It's really unusual, OK? But now you know. If you see that, you know. So how useful are radiographs for us with disc disease? Well, kind of sort of useful. I love to have them because I can really check the anatomy and I can see if the degenerative changes have gone, gone on and I might spot the disc herniation. There's been a number of different studies looking at how accurate they are when compared to advanced imaging. About 50 to 70% accurate. That is not good enough for doing surgery, OK? So even if I have an owner who has no money, if they bring their dog and say, can you do surgery on it just based on a radiograph, I'm going to say no, because first, do no harm. I don't want to do surgery on totally the wrong side, OK? The most useful criteria are that narrow disk space. That is the most useful criteria. The vacuum phenomenon is really useful. It's just it's rarely there. So from a practical point of view, not so useful. OK? Good with intervertebral disc disease when we have a test later? Excellent. So now we'll move on to congenital defects. So lots of these are just incidental, OK? And you have to get used to seeing these kinds of findings on a chest x-ray or something in certain breeds of dog, and knowing that it's really not a problem if your neuro exam is normal, OK? But some of them are really, really serious. The most serious is the atlantoaxial luxation or subluxation, OK? Very serious, going to kill the animal if you don't diagnose it, can be totally cured with surgery, OK? So this is one of these high yield diagnoses to make. It can be the difference between life and death, OK? So it's an important one. And it's easy to miss it, very easy to miss it. Other things we see, hemivertebrae and butterfly vertebrae. I don't know how well all these names translate. Block vertebrae, where you have two vertebrae fused together. Transitional vertebrae. These are vertebrae that are not sure what they are. Are they lumbar or are they sacral? Are they thoracic? Are they lumbar? OK, those kind of vertebrae. Spina bifida, another important one. And then the AA, subluxation, luxation. All right, let's talk about atlantoaxial subluxation. So the AA junction, to me, is like the stifle of the spine. It's held together with ligaments, which is really not the best idea, you know? Um, anyway, uh, it's designed that way for a reason, to give certain types of mobility. So what you can see when you look at the anatomy of the atlantoaxial um, joint is that the dens, the process from C2, is critically important. Why? Because that is how ligaments bind C2 to C1. So if you don't have a dens, if you have a small dens, or if you fracture your dens, you have an unstable joint, OK? So here we've got a radiograph of the classic AA luxation. So looking from where you guys are looking, you can see quite clearly, if you trace the spine, whoop, it takes a 90 degree turn there, OK? There are a variety of ways you can look at this. So a lot of the textbooks will say, look at the space between the dorsal spinous process of C2 and the dorsal lamina of C1. And you can see that this is an enormous space. So that's a very useful thing to look at. 
However, if you have a really oblique, twisted view, it can look like a big space. Okay? So a bit like the CP deficits, you always want more than one thing. And the other thing for me is to just look at where's this spinal cord going? Well, it wants to go up there, but it's having to turn an angle. And if you look at this, you can quite literally say this dog's head is falling off. Yeah? So you can see how careful you need to be with these animals. All right. The other thing I'll just say with this. So often you can get taught that this is a, a mobile functional dynamic luxation. So in order to diagnose it, you need to flex the head. OK? And sometimes we do flex the head or flex the neck, flex the head on the neck. We only do it if we're watching with fluoroscopy because you literally can paralyze them doing that. So always start with your plain radiograph first. For me, I give just a little sedation so that they'll be a little bit calmer, but they've still got muscle tone. Okay? Lie them down very carefully, shoot the radiograph. If I don't get an answer from that, if I don't see, if I see a normal dens, I might do a dynamic study but I do it very careful, carefully with fluoroscopy. The last thing you want to do is take a small breed chihuahua, say, I think it might have an AA luxation. Let's lie it down and let's flex it up. Okay? Don't do that. Not a good idea. <coughs> All right, here we have a radiograph from a Boston Terrier. The breed is significant. Okay? Seven-year-old male intact. He's been normal all his life until recently. This dog would go and fetch the newspaper for the owner every day. And the owner had noticed that he was starting to get a little weak and a little wobbly in the hind legs. OK, can you see the abnormality? There's a couple of things to look at. One is obviously the normal anatomy and the vertebral bodies. The other is to look at the alignment of the vertebral canal where the spinal cord will run. OK, so if we start by looking at the vertebral bodies, let's start with that. I can see two clear abnormalities, one right here and one right there. So these are hemivertebrae. You see the vertebral body is really short, OK? Um, very, very common in the screw tail breeds, OK? Boston Terriers, French Bulldogs, Bulldogs, all of those breeds, very common that they have hemivertebrae. It's often totally insignificant, but occasionally it's significant. When you look at this, you classically found them around T8, T9, very classic place to see them. But we also can see them at the thoracolumbar junction. Those are the two sites that are really common. They can occur in other places, of course, but those are the really common sites. And for me, when I'm looking at this and trying to decide the clinical significance, the truth is, unless I do an MRI or a myelogram, I don't know which is significant. But I'm suspicious of this one. The reason I'm suspicious of this one is if you look at the alignment of the canal, you see a deviation here. Whereas here, we're just shooting straight on through. So I'm really suspicious of that cranial one. OK? Now here, we've got a much more severe case. This dog was paraplegic with no deep pain, made it to four years of age before it came that way, which is kind of miraculous when you look at his radiographs, has numerous hemivertebrae and this dramatic, dramatic scoliosis, OK? Um, so if you have a little look at this, I mean kyphosis. If you have a look at the myelogram of this, you can see how compressed the dog is. Sometimes we'll see disc herniations just in front of a hemivertebra, probably because of instability. So sometimes we can see that. All right, here's another congenital anomaly. Napoleon, nine-year-old miniature poodle, very acute onset of tetraparesis. He had a little motor, but he was not strong enough to walk. So can you see the abnormality on this one? Yeah? So we've got, if we start with the lateral, we've got two things that are significant. Number one, we really can't see a disk space here, can we, between C23? Can't see a disk space. Number two, I really can't see a dens either, OK? I'm kind of seeing this nice, smooth surface, cranial aspect of C2. If we look on the VD, if we come up here, one of the questions, of course, was, is this a congenital anomaly? Is it a blocked vertebra? 
Or is, did some trauma occur? And it's just secondary to that. Well, there was no known trauma in this dog's history. And when you look on the VD, you can see there's actually end plates, but only halfway across. This is a congenital anomaly. This is a, a block vertebra. And then when you look here, there is no dens. No dens, OK? Now, some people look at this and go, oh, here's the dens. No, that's the dorsal spinous process of C2 that we're catching, OK? Here's the cranial end of C2. There's no dens. So the reason this dog presented was because of atlantoaxial instability. He'd made it to nine years of age. And notice all of those three, last three cases I showed you were seven, four, and nine. They were older animals. So congenital anomalies don't have to present only when they're really young. They can present when they're much older. They've stabilized with fibrous tissue. And then a little trauma sets them off and makes them decompensate. OK. All right, well, I don't need to ask you what this is because I've got the title right up there, spina bifida. The question is, can you see the lesion? And I was very impressed. One of our ex-students, our graduated students, sent this case in and had absolutely seen the lesion, which is not that easy to see. So how many people think they can see a lesion? Hands up. Anybody? Don't worry, I won't pick on you. OK. I don't know if I've got a nice red dot. Oh, I've got an arrow. OK. Here's the lesion. So here we've got a dorsal spinous process, dorsal spinous process. Oh, two dorsal spinous processes. OK, so that's classically how you would diagnose spina bifida. You look for a double dorsal spinous process. May be clinically significant, may not be clinically significant. In this dog, it absolutely was. There was a little tract that came all the way up to the skin. And what had happened to this little dog was, as a puppy, it was taken to their local vet who vaccinated it. And to vaccinate it, he scruffed the dog between the shoulder blades. And the dog went crazy, went crazy, barking, biting. The vet took it to the back, did something, brought it back, gave it to the owner, and said, you need to get puppy training classes with this dog. It's very aggressive. It was the cutest little fluffy dog. And what had happened was they had pulled on that tract that was coming up to the skin, which was exquisitely painful to the dog. The owner got the dog home. It was paraplegic. This was not a good event. It did recover totally without any intervention. So ultimately, it did fine. OK, that was a sad story, wasn't it? Whew. Transitional vertebrae. OK, vertebrae with an identity crisis. Sometimes this is important. Most of the time, it isn't. So over here, we've got a thoracolumbar vertebra with a rib on one side. The only reason this is important to me is that when I do neurosurgery, I count from the 13th rib to find out where I am. So if I haven't noticed that there's no 13th rib on one side and I do surgery on that side, I'm going to do surgery on the wrong side. So we're always somewhat obsessive about looking at this. This one's more likely to be clinically significant. Can you see the abnormality? It's kind of tricky. Lumbar sacral region can be tough to look at. As you look down here, we haven't been able to get the dog straight, and that was for a reason. The dog had all this muscle spasm. We couldn't get it straight. You can see a pretty normal sacroiliac joint here, but you can't on this side. See a little bit here, and then here we can see a lumbar transverse process, whereas here we see sacral vertebra. So this was actually about a three-year-old Labrador retriever and it had already blown a lumbosacral disc, probably because of instability. Okay? And the only way we can really see that is a VD view. A lateral won't really help you. Sometimes it does a little, but VD is most useful. OK, how are we doing for time? Doing all right. Nearly through. OK, discospondylitis. So as I say, I love this disease. Infection of the intervertebral disc and adjacent vertebral end plates. OK? Notice I say plates. We expect it to be both sides of a disc space, not just one side. If we just see one side, I start to worry about cancer. Both sides, disco. Most commonly bacterial, every now and then we see fungal, particularly German shepherd dogs with systemic aspergillosis. Okay. Every now and then, this bacterial is Brucella canis. Why is that important? It's important because it's a zoonotic disease, OK? So we, I think I've seen two brucella cases in my career. 
One, of course, was when I was pregnant. Of course, of course. Um, so, radiographic signs. If you look at adjacent end plates, adjacent to the disc, not adjacent across the vertebrae, you should see some loss of bone, okay? Lysis. You can also see sclerosis, and it can really vary. It can be very, very prolific, or there might only be a little bit, okay? Collapse of the disc space often happens because it's got infected and collapsed. The structure is destroyed. You may see a vertebral body fracture. It's often like a collapse of the vertebral body. When that happens, they usually decompensate clinically and present with quite dramatic signs. Every now and then, you'll see a soft tissue mass ventral to the vertebra. So, for example, if there's a grass seed in there, you see a big abscess underneath. I saw a beautiful one that had been shot. It had been peppered with a shotgun as it ran away. And one of the little beads had come up under the lumbar vertebrae. You could see that. You could see the soft tissue around it. And then you could see the disco over it. OK, so this is a good North Carolina case. Belle was a 12-year-old intact female hound dog. She was a working hunting dog. She was also a working breeding dog. They loved this dog, and they bred from her a lot. Even though she was 12, she was still getting bred. She had an acute onset of really severe pain when she was out hunting one day. Okay? And when this dog came in, I kid you not, her hind limbs were so painful, she had such a severe nerve root signature, they were up around her head. And if you tried to extend them, she would just scream. Okay? So as you look at this radiograph, can you see the problem? It's a very dramatic one. It's so dramatic, it can be hard to see. You all see the problem? So when you're looking at end plates, what you should see is a beautiful, smooth, white line. Okay? Come down to the lumbar sacral junction, no white lines. Complete lysis of both end plates. All right. We have some sclerosis, just like we have here. Spondylosis, I mean, just here and here. We've got the L7 vertebra is shorter than L6, but this is really foreshortened. Okay, so we've lost a lot of bone on this. And then finally, we have a subluxation. Yeah? Very, very painful dog. Very painful condition. This dog got better on antibiotics alone. No, no need for any surgery to realign it. This dog did really well. When the dog finally got better, the owner said, hey, can we breed her again? And we were like, mm, how about no? Bad idea. All right, Petey, 12-year-old diabetic Pomeranian. So classically, we think of disco as being a disease of intact dogs and often young dogs. Okay? So this is a 12-year-old uh, diabetic Pomeranian. He was male castrated. Acute onset of tetraparesis. And this is a more difficult one to see. Can you see this lesion? Obviously, it's a disco lesion. And so you need to always focus on the end plates. In the Pomeranians and the little breeds like that, often their disc spaces appear a bit collapsed. It can be very difficult to interpret. But if you look here, nice white line, white line, white line, uh, no white line. In fact, we've kind of got lysis here and here. Okay? Again, white line, white line. So look for that white line, look at it in the other vertebrae and that gets your eye in for what it'll look like in that dog. If it's not present, you have to start worrying about disco. And what happened was this dog was a very poorly controlled diabetic. He had glucosuria. He had bacteria. So he had been set up to develop discospondylitis because of his diabetes. <coughs> Sasha, four-year-old female spayed German Shepherd dog, belonged to one of the head surgeons at the local big well-known hospital, Duke Hospital. The dog had weight loss and had this mild pelvic limb ataxia. It was really off its food, so this is actually a peg tube placed in here. But you can all see the lesion, I'm assuming. It's quite a clear one. Yeah? So you see here, we've got nice white end plates, white end plates, sclerosis, and lysis. So we've got a very clear punched out lesion. The difference in this dog is it's a young female uh, German Shepherd dog, and they tend to get aspergillosis, and that's what this dog had, which is a very, very serious condition for them. Okay, you're all happy with disco. You can see those, no problem. Yep. All right, cancer. 
most common type of cancer that we will see in dogs. Cats are a little bit different, though we can see this obviously in cats as well, is a sarcoma of the vertebrae. So that really affects the bone of the vertebral body or, or well, any, any place of the vertebrae. We also see plasma cell tumors and multiple myeloma, and they can also affect the vertebrae, okay, as well as other long bones. And then finally, if you do have a big soft tissue mass in the canal, it can expand and change the outline of the canal or the intervertebral foramen just by the pressure causing bone loss. So here's our first one. This was an old mixed breed dog that presented with paraparesis. Can you see the lesion? This one is such a big lesion, you can easily miss it. But sitting back like you guys are, you can probably see it fine. You see the lesion? Before I point it out, dorsal spinous process, dorsal spinous process, space, dorsal spinous process. Yeah? It's lost this whole dorsal spinous process. There was a very large sarcoma that was spreading down into the canal. Okay? Here's another one. This was about an eight year old spaniel that presented with left hind limb lameness, I want to say. And as you look at this, again, if you look at the canal, you can see a distortion of the canal here. You can also see bone loss through here, a new bone formation there, and maybe sclerosis, a little bit of this vertebra as well. And this dog, again, had a sarcoma that was situated in the canal and coming out of that intervertebral foramen. Here's another one. This was a radiograph sent in by a referring vet. This dog was, again, an older dog, paraparetic, could just as easily be a cat. Can you see the abnormality? Not the best radiograph in the world, but you can see it. Again, it's so big, it's easy to miss. And this is one that is an example of why it's important to look at the density, the bone density. As you look at this, this vertebra seems to stand out, yeah? Great big vertebra here with a lot of new bone production. So that whole vertebra really lights up. And again, it had a sarcoma of that part of that vertebra. Okay, so a lot of bony neoplasia, if it's soft tissue alone, you're not, I mean a lot of neoplasia, if it's soft tissue alone, you're not going to see on radiographs. But the truth is, sarcomas affecting bone are very common, and so you may well see it. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about are fractional luxations. First thing to say is, of course, handle the animal with care. Take a normal lateral first. Start off with your laterals and do the whole spine. If you see something that's clearly abnormal, if you can, take a horizontal beam VD. But that requires special equipment. If you don't have that, make sure there are two people moving the animal at all times so you keep the whole spine straight so you can take the orthogonal views. Okay? We very commonly see things at the LS junction, the TL junction, and then also caudal lumbar and uh, caudal cervical spines, okay? That kind of covers it all. So the first thing you're going to do when you've seen a fracture or a luxation is you're going to assess that radiograph and say, is this unstable or not? Because that changes what you will do surgically. And the vast majority are theoretically unstable, okay? Just in case you forget to do that, just remember that most of them are unstable. So in order to do this, here you're probably looking for the fracture. There is no fracture on this. This is a disc radiograph. We divide the vertebral column up into three segments. You can do two, we tend to do three. And if you've got any two of the three disrupted, you should assume it's unstable, okay? So compartment number one is most of the vertebral body. And remember the soft tissues too, the intervertebral disc, the ventral longitudinal ligament that runs down here. Compartment number two is the dorsal aspect of the vertebral body, the intervertebral disc, the dorsal longitudinal ligament, and the lateral pedicle. And compartment number three is everything else. Okay? So any two of the three disrupted, assume it's unstable. Now, some fractures, the bone embeds so hard in each other, you're not moving it anywhere. Um, however, if you sedate a dog, which seems to have been very stable, it's been transported all over the place by the owner, nothing's changed, if you sedate that dog, you relax the muscles, and muscle spasm that's protecting it can suddenly mean when you lose that, it can suddenly become unstable. 
Okay. So here's another way you can identify lack of stability. So if you look at this one, here's the first radiograph we took, and you can see a little subluxation here. There's no fracture. It's purely the soft tissues that have been disrupted. However, we have disrupted them at the facet, we've disrupted them at the disc, we've disrupted the dorsal and ventral longitudinal ligaments. It is unstable, and sure enough, without doing much to the animal, repeat the radiograph and everything's moved. So if you see things move, you know they're unstable, okay? All right, so what can you see on this one? This was an interesting one that faked me out. Why? Because it was a dachshund, and it was a dachshund we'd done surgery on before. And it came back for an acute onset of paraparesis after it had fallen from some stairs. They were stairs that had spaces in between, and it had fallen down right on its bottom. Okay? And if you look very carefully, you can see that we've got a fracture here of the lateral pedicle. And this fragment here was actually sticking into the canal. All right? And so we actually just decompressed the pedicle, and the dog actually did pretty well. But there is another fracture on there. Do you all see it? Right here. And it's not continuous with that, and the dog really did do very well, and it seemed to be stable. But I will admit, we didn't see that. We focused everything on here and treated that. So it's really, really easy to miss things. This little dog here has a pretty dramatic subluxation um, that we see in the caudal cervical spine, where the luxation is a twist and uh, a big um, flexion, which means that the articular facets get luxated and then locked together. So it can be quite difficult to address uh, surgically. Okay, here's another one that illustrates the importance of orthogonal views. When you look at this, it looks pretty normal, okay? When you look at the VD, can you all see how we've got dorsal spinous processes coming up here, shift across, come up here? So there's a very significant fracture. Try to outline it right there, okay? And then this is a very common scenario that we'll see in the lumbar sacral junction where there's a fracture through the body of L7 and then ventral and cranial displacement. So you have the fracture fragments sitting right here. Quite difficult to reduce sometimes. Okay, now we get into the weird and wonderful. Some developmental disorders or disorders that are really hard to classify. So the first is multiple cartilaginous exostoses, can be called osteochondromatosis. We see this in growing dogs. Uh, things resolve once the growth plates have um, closed, once all uh, bone growth has ended. And we can see these pretty dramatic bony protuberances develop. And if they've just got a single lesion and you decompress them surgically, they do very well indeed. Here's another unusual one. We see this in German shepherds in their cranial thoracic spine and then in uh, large breed dogs up here in the dorsal um, cervical spine. So you see this calcified soft tissue here. What we see is calcification of the ligaments between the vertebrae and it'll go down into the canal and compress the spinal cord. So as I say, these are the weird and wonderful. You won't see these very often. Here's another really important one, and it's important purely because you can misdiagnose it as discospondylitis, which I've seen happen a few times. So this is called Schmalls nodes. Have you all heard of Schmalls nodes? Probably not, but maybe. So just to blow this image up, I said how important it is to look at the end plates and look at the nice white line. And when you look here, we've lost it. Here we've lost it, and here we've lost it, okay? This is a young dog. Um, just, it had back pain, but usually we see this as a completely incidental finding. And if I highlight these, what's happened is that intervertebral disc has herniated through the end plate into the body. Normally insignificant. How do we distinguish that from disco? The main thing is that it's a very smooth, unreactive change. It doesn't look active. It tends to be quite symmetrical on both sides. Um, and they definitely won't improve with antibiotics, okay? Is there any treatment? No, there isn't, if they're painful and non-steroidal. But if you look at them on CT, this is what you'll see, these great places within the end plate where the disc material is herniated. So the reason to show you that is it's a weird thing that can be mistaken. 
final thing I wanted to talk about is the lumbosacral region. It's a very important region because it transmits all those propulsive forces from the hind limbs into the spine and the rest of the body. So we often kind of get interested in looking at the stability of the lumbosacral junction. Few things you should look at. So here we've got a normal resting view of the lumbosacral junction. Here we've got a flexed view. And what we focus on is the position of S1 dorsally, okay? Here we've got an extended view. And you can see in this particular dog, suddenly it steps down. It appears a bit unstable. Now, the true normals are not that well established. How much movement you see, there are several publications on it, but they're not that well established. And so, if I was going to worry about this being clinically significant, I would want to really be sure that I had clinical signs that fit with that being a problem. Okay? So careful on that one. So remember, survey radiographs are not diagnostic for soft tissue diseases. I can't tell you how often we have people bring in dogs or cats saying, my dog has a disc herniation based on a radiograph or whatever their vet told them, and they haven't. They've got something totally different, okay? So be very cautious about what you say. If you were to look at this, this is a radiograph of a Doberman Pinscher. You can see this very abnormal looking vertebra here, and often people will say, oh look, it's compressed right there. In fact, this dog has a disc herniation here, okay? So be very careful. So to summarize, you need to do a good neuro exam, you need to localize the problem, and that needs to correlate with your radiographic findings for you to make a diagnosis. Always take diagnostic images, if you can, nice and straight, focused, move the animal with care. Always take radiographs. Any spinal case, take a radiograph, okay? So, can you see the lesion on this one? This was a 14-year-old golden retriever that had become acutely tetraparetic. The owners traveled about seven hours to bring it to our emergency clinic, okay? They hadn't had a radiograph taken because the vet was like, oh, they'll do it at the university. And then they'll do better ones and they'll do other imaging, so we won't do it. But the radiograph was diagnostic. They didn't need to drive seven hours for us, okay? Nice for us, we get to see the case. That's good for the owner. 14-year-old golden retriever, what's your top differential? Or are you not cynical enough yet? Cancer? Second differential? Cancer. Third differential? Cancer. And then there are all the other things, okay? Do you see this new bone here? Okay. Big sarcoma within the vertebra again. Okay, on that happy note, not so happy, does anyone have any questions? Alguma pergunta, alguma dúvida? Não há? Thank you, Dr. Natasha. Oh, you're welcome. I can leave this here for the next talk, yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah.
vamos dar então início à segunda palestra da tarde, também intitulada Common Therapeutic Modalities Utilized in Rehabilitation, que vai ser preferida pela, pela doutora Diane Dunning. You may start. Thank you. Ok, good afternoon. All right, so we are going to uh, talk about common therapeutic modalities used in rehabilitation, and it is going to have an emphasis because of Dr. Olby's fabulous lecture you just heard um, this morning and this afternoon on neurologic cases. Okay, I see a lot of her cases, so um, hopefully I do a good job taking care of them. But before we start, I thought I'd tell you where we're from. This is Raleigh, North Carolina, okay? And it's about a city of about a million people. This is downtown. It's our fabulous new convention center there. Um, and uh, this is not where the university is, however. This is the university. This is the main campus. Um, we have about 35,000 students uh, on the campus total. And within the veterinary college, we have about 900 people, 400 of them are veterinary students, okay? And this is the College of Veterinary Medicine. So this is the main administrative building um, for the uh, college. This is a brand new small animal uh, veterinary teaching hospital. It's 120,000 square feet. That's where Dr. Olby works. Now, she's, she's right about here, normally, um, but her office is over here. This is our research building, okay? We have four floors of uh, research, mostly uh, benchtop research. Over here is our large animal hospital, okay? About 15% of our cases are equine. We see about 22,000 cases per year total as a hospital. Um, here are some barns for research, and then we have this lovely, lovely, lovely teaching farm. Because in the United States, and particularly in North Carolina, our students, um, some of them have never seen a cow, ever. So we have to start from day one in terms of their training. So what we have is uh, during the first three years of the curriculum, they actually learn um, various large animal teaching skill, you know, skills in terms of how do you approach a cow, what a cow looks like in some cases. Um, horses, we also have a poultry farm, a turkey farm, so they get to work in all the areas of production animal medicine, okay? This is the front of the college. This is our new walkway. Um, we have a lot of events out there. Um, you can come and visit us. All right, that's another portion of the, the front portion. We have a very large dog head there, and that is actually uh, was uh, built in commemoration of the person who built our new teaching hospital. His name was Randall B. Terry, and he was loved golden retrievers. He had five of them, and this is one of them. It's supposed to look like a retriever swimming in water. Instead, it just looks like a decapitated head. <laughs> on our front lawn, but it is quite fun, and people come out there and they take pictures for their Christmas cards. This is our, our research building here with horses, and this, this is important. This is a huge event in Raleigh, and you guys would love it. What you do, it's called the Krispy Kreme Run. Krispy Kreme donuts in, in North America are, are big, and everyone loves them. So what you have to do, though, is you have to run about three kilometers to get the donuts. You have to eat 12 donuts within a period of two to three minutes. And then you have to run back three kilometers without throwing up. <laughs> and it happens every year, and all of our students do it. So instead of looking all proper in their cloaks like you do, this is what we do. And just because Dr. Olby did it, these are my two children. That's my daughter, Sydney, who plays golf. And this is my son, George Henry. And he actually, this is a couple years ago. He, he now has a girlfriend. It's, uh, <laughs> her name's Carmen. At any rate, we ended with Elsa. Do you remember? OK. And I just want to remind you what she looks like on day one. You remember how she was basically three-legged lame? We graded her about a four or five in the lameness uh, scale. 
Okay, you remember? And then we talked about all the different therapies we did. We did the land treadmill, we did the underwater treadmill, we did the swimming, we had massage, we did acupuncture, okay? And we worked on her about three days a week. Whoops, let's try that again. And this is what she looked like on day 10. Not 100%, I would not give me my, uh, an A grade on this, I wouldn't get 100%. But for 10 days out, after not bearing weight, she's doing pretty well. I'd say she's gone from a grade five to, you know, grade two or three. We still have some work to do on her. She actually had a very guarded prognosis. If you let your femoral head and neck ostectomies lose as much muscle mass as she did and go that long for being lame, they sometimes never use their limb. Okay, so that, that was pretty significant and serious, and it was caused by us. It was iatrogenic, okay? All right. Okay, so the common things that Dr. Olby sends me, okay, are intervertebral disc disease. She sends me some tumor cases. She sent me a lovely brain tumor that I'm still treating with acupuncture for her. Lumbosacral disease. We see also fibrocartilaginous emboli dogs as well and some degenerative myelopathies. And our rehab caseload at uh, Colorado State or North Carolina State is about 75% neurology, okay, and about 25% orthopedic, which is pretty common. The other thing, though, that we have with all of her cases, I don't know why it's just her cases, all of her animals are quite, you can't even see the bottom of this dog's tummy, are quite fat. And that actually affects, I'm just teasing her right now, it, not all her cases, but um, are very, very fat, and that very much affects their, um, their recovery. And usually, they will lose weight during rehab, and I think that that significantly affects their time to walking, okay? You can see this one versus that one. They're sisters, yes, <laughs> all right. This is a dog right now in our weight loss program. Um, her name is Amy, and we actually did that, remember I talked to you about the DEXA scan, the dual energy x-ray absorptometry, the measurement of how much fat to muscle mass. Guess how much body fat she has? Let's see, in the percentage wise. So normal, you'd like to see in the 30s, 25, 30, just like in people. So when I was in college, I was about 16% body fat. Now, unfortunately, I'm about 30, right? Well, she is at 50, 50% 50 body fat, which is extremely obese. And so that is about a nine out of nine body condition score. And that, she has very significant orthopedic disease. So she's had total hips, okay? She's got elbow dysplasia, all right? She's got stifle disease. She's had cruciate surgery in both her knees. And part of the reason for that is that she is so heavy. So right now she's on a very significant weight loss diet and exercise program. This is her actually getting the uh, DEXA scan. You can see her belly there, poor little thing. Okay, but going back to neuro, I digressed. So basically we've done, we're gonna do our assessment. That's very important. We're gonna generate a problem list just like we had with Elsa of what is going on based upon our assessment. And then that's going to dictate our starting point of what we're going to do for them. So in these cases that Dr. Olby sends us, a lot of them are very ataxic, okay? She's cured the significant portion of their neurologic disease, but they have this residual issue of just lack of body awareness, okay? And sometimes weakness. And the rehabilitation regime consists of proprioceptive conditioning, which we're going to talk about. So hopefully stimulating the nervous system to recover and better communicate with itself. We'll do a lot of gait repatterning, and then we'll do some strengthening. So this is one of her little back dogs that she sent to us. Um, and basically, I'm sorry, you're gonna get nauseous in this video. Um, anyway, the dog kept following me around, and I kept on having to back up because she all she wanted to do. But you just saw, she just is actually overall pretty good. She's a little wobbly in the rear um, and a little unaware of where her back legs are, particularly when we step off even small surfaces, okay? 
So the modalities that we would use in this particular case consist of weight shifting activity, okay, on balls, on proprioceptive or perturbative boards, um, sensory walkways, which I'm going to show you a couple of nice videos of, Cavaletti rails, we've already talked about, um, and balance boards. Okay. So assisted standing weight shifting is very easy. It's something that everyone can do, and it's used in patients once they can strongly stand on their own, okay? And they're kind of wobbly and all over the place. And the principle of this is that you throw them off of their center of gravity and try to get them to return to their center of gravity. Not, you know, throwing them against the wall or anything, but just back and forth motion, okay? And let's see. So here's a dog that we're doing that to. And it's, you know, again, it's relatively simple, you know, makes sense. This dog's a little bit weak. The other thing that we're combining with this is basically sit to stands, which are basically doggy squats and, and engaging in the quadriceps and the semimembranosus and tendinosus muscle. This dog had a very long tail that kept getting in the way, okay? Back and forth, and it's very easy to do. You do it for about five minutes a time, and it's a great way to start a session with an animal um, and get them used to the fact that you're going to be manipulating them, you're going to be working with them. A yeah, very long tail, huh? Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is another little dachshund of Dr. Rolby's, okay, and that we're doing a very similar thing. Okay, the sit to stand, allowing them to squat down. The main thing you want to do is make sure that their feet are in normal orientation, so not necessarily a wide base stance or a narrow stance. Getting them up, if they get out of line, replace their feet and start over again, okay? placing maybe a little pressure on their rear ends to kind of re-engage their um, quadriceps and semimembranosus, tendinosus, and again, the weight shifting, which you, when you have your hands on their belly, you'll actually feel them contract. And particularly those dogs that have had surgery, it's very disruptive, the surgical um, approach to the spine and trying to re-engage and get those fibers to orient and heal um, normally all along the axial spine. Okay, therapy balls. So those are, as I said, excellent. Everyone has them. They're usually used in parties, okay? But they're very good for improving balance, uh, using for weight shifting and enhanced muscle contraction, okay? The peanut balls work particularly well for those real small dachshunds, and we use them a little bit differently because we put the entire dog on the ball, okay? Um, and you use a gentle rocking motion back and forth, and what they'll do is they're not using their legs, but they're going to naturally, involuntarily engage their abdominal musculature to try to stay on top of that ball, okay? And here we are. Same long tail. Okay, and we're going to be shifting back and forth. And again, you need to be careful that you don't let the dog obviously fall off the ball. It's a one-person activity, usually dependent upon the size of the dog. But again, just gentle shifting, and you'll actually feel them riding themselves back up. Pretty simple stuff, but very, very effective. Okay, and very effective on the dog that can't exercise. <clears throat> this video is terrible, too. You're going to get sick. Okay, so this is another dog, a bit bigger, so we can't put him all the way on the ball, but we can put him across the ball. And again, we position the legs in normal standing position. I think I'd had like too many glasses of wine during lunch when I took this video. Okay, and then we're going back and forth, okay, and, and rocking motion, getting them oriented on the ball. The peanut balls are wonderful because they're more stable. Here's a bigger dog. This dog actually had a tibial fracture and wasn't using the limb very well, okay? And again, similar to that um, yellow lab you saw, we're going and loading and offloading. You can actually see the quadriceps muscle engaging here each time as we step on the ball back and forth. Balls are wonderful things. Okay. We even do St. Bernard's, okay? In larger animals, um, you can get, you, the balls are of varying size. They range anywhere. The ones that you get at the lower end ones, you need to be a little bit careful because the dogs can put their nails through them pretty easily, cats as well. So you want the higher grade ones that are used in physical therapy, okay? 
You can individually work the limbs and you can, it allows the therapist to control the amount of time that the animal uses and places weight on the limb and again the, that core musculature training. Okay, let's talk about sensory pathways. <clears throat> so all they are are um, alternating surfaces. Okay, so uh, I actually got my wish. I didn't get my swimming pool like you have, but I actually have a proprioceptive pathway. And what it is, is it's a pathway that's linear, and it goes from sand to gravel to bark uh, to grass, and then I have Cavaletti rails, okay? And so basically what it does is it increases in difficulty uh, of navigation, and animals that have a taxi and proprioceptive difficulties, it's very hard. You know when you've walked on the beach, right, how, much dif how different it feels to walk on sand versus walk on dirt or cement. It's a similar thing. So there's different stimuli that go into your brain. And as the animal becomes accustomed to it, they actually improve over time. This dog was very, this isn't a great video, but I'll show you another one tomorrow. Um, he's only mildly a taxi. So there we go from sand to gravel, to bark. This was an intact male dog and he had to stop everywhere <clears throat> to grass. And then you see the start of the Cavaletti rails there, which we've placed down very low um, for him. He's not gonna wanna do that, so we're gonna come back. Okay, and so it's, again, it's very easy and you can also vary the grass length by, you know, how you mow it and the longer grass becomes more difficult to walk through. I mean, you can make the surf, these are the surfaces that I like. I would suggest, um, I'm not complaining because they gave this to me, I would make it longer each pathway. You know, we have about, I would say six feet. <clears throat> I would make each one the length so you, the dog, if you had a Great Dane or a very large dog, that they could take more steps in each area. But that's something that very functional that you could do in your outdoor areas with your animals. <clears throat> Okay, Cavaletti rails. Again, those rails are poles that are spaced apart, usually having several choices there of where you can put those rails. This is the setups that we use. However, you could use almost anything, ladders. You don't even have to have the side braces. Um, it's just basically having the animal, particularly ones that are ataxic, have the visual s stimulus of what they have to do, communicate all the way down to the leg. And that's a pretty complex pathway, as Dr. Oldley will tell you. It also, in orthopedic patients, encourages limb use, increased flexion and extension and active range of motion. And again, the visual placing is very important. Here's another one. You've seen this one before. Not any, any there you go. Oops. All right. And again, you, those are very easy to construct for very little money. Balance boards, again, we use a lot of these, particularly in our ataxic patients for enhanced proprioception and gains in strength. Okay, let's talk about gait repatterning. Repatterning. Uh, this is very important, particularly for patients that are very s seriously compromised. This particular dog unfortunately had um, almost total, complete loss of neurologic function, okay? And actually is probably not gonna recover in the long term. So this is, this is actually more for show than anything else um, because she, she doesn't really even have motor function anymore. Um, any rate, but what it is, is we often use the land treadmill, we'll also use the underwater treadmill, it allows the, the therapist to stay in place and actually place the limbs in the normal pathway and the normal ambulatory function. Um, hopefully giving stimulus back to the cord and to the brain of where she should be placing her feet. My computer seems to be very unhappy at the moment. Extremely unhappy. Talk amongst yourselves.
Help. <laughs> this is why Macintosh rules the world. Did that. I, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I made you come. Okay. Let's try that again. Okay. Hopefully, that won't happen again. So in patients that have proprioceptive deficits, we try to modul modulate or manipulate the afferent input with the placement of the feet. And the modalities that are available, again, are sensory pathways, cavaletti rails, land treadmills, and underwater treadmills. The land treadmills are very useful because you have variable speeds that you can place, timers, um, you can alter the incline in many cases. The only, and most people actually have those at home, or at least in the United States we do. We, we use them to hold laundry. Um, we don't actually run on them, um, but so you can actually have therapy programs for people that have that at home with their animals. The only problem with the human treadmills are that they are usually sh too short for the giant breed dog, so there is a type of canine treadmill that is especially long. It's also much more narrow, but most large breed, giant breed dogs can fit on it. And again, we use it for patterning gait and encouraging early uses of the limb. And that's a wonderful thing. And most treadmills are only about, you know, anywhere from a 1,500 U.S. dollars to anywhere like 3,000 3, U.S. dollars. Again, inexpensive. There are human and veterinary versions, and they're versatile and, and almost available anywhere. They're also very good for immediate post-op, although I put lot, most of my patients very early into water. The rule of thumb is you don't put post-operative patients until about seven days. I'll go as early as anywhere from three to four, as long as there's a good fibrin seal of the incision. Um, if an animal has a UTI, you don't want to put them in any of your pools, so urinary tract infections or even extensive skin infections. That would be a contraindication. Or if they were extremely debilitated that you were worried that they might drown. Um, and again, they can be used by um, people at home for home exercise plans. So this is a dog that we had that had a four-limb paresis, and you can see on the land treadmill there, walking you know, intermittently on the dorsum of his paw. One of the things that we did for this particular patient so that we could actually exercise him and, and strengthen the limb is to use the land treadmill, but then put him in a splint, okay? Um, usually just temporarily, okay, but that seemed to work very well in this particular patient as he was recovering from the neurologic deficit in his fore um, to actually keep his muscle mass and regain function more soon. This is a dog that actually has a, a rear limb lameness that probably was mildly painful. We probably should have had him on more pain control than we did. And you can see that almost three-legged lame, just like Elsa that I showed you before. What we use for this dog is actually a somewhat of an inversion tactic, which I don't normally like to use, but we actually put a therapy band on his good leg right here. You can kind of see it right there. So that he would actually place more weight on his, right, his, his abnormal limb or his left limb, okay? And I don't normally like to do that, but in the cases that have been chronically, chronically um, 
non-ambulatory in their one limb, they oftentimes you do have to resort to that, but you never do that until you have appropriate pain management and, and the more positive aspects of intervention have been utilized. So underwater treadmills, those are my favorite, okay? And again, tomorrow we're gonna to be talking a whole hour almost on underwater treadmills. But that uses the natural buoyancy of water, okay? They have reduced gravity, they have diminished concussive forces, and it allows for early assisted therapy, okay? So in dachshunds, it's wonderful because uh, particularly those that have lost their motor function or have lost their vol any voluntary control, this is where you're gonna see them move first okay, um, in the water. And you can see actually in this particular case how he's holding his right leg mildly further forward than his left. Okay, so a couple days from now he's actually gonna start moving that, or even sooner. It also has resistance training that they can have improved cardiovascular health um, as well. In terms of saw, uh, massage and range of motion, again, we, we talked about this last time. The benefits for this really are increased local circulation, decreased dependent edema, which we see a lot in our orthopedic patients, reduced muscle spasms, um, it provides sensory input, and that's important for proprioceptive and ataxic deficits, and then it's relaxing. And we use it often as a warm-up to the rehab regime. Neuromuscular st stimulation. Really, the indications for this are muscle re-education, um, it prevents disuse atrophy in extreme cases, and it reduces pain. We will commonly use a medium frequency and an alternating current when we use um, this particular modality, but patient comfort really is key. This is not my go-to um, type of therapy, but we, have, we use it on occasion for neurologic cases. And how it works is muscle re-education and recruitment it can partially reverse the neurologic muscle weakness. It can slow or reverse osteopenia in research cases, and it can improve muscle mass and blood flow. However, I'll tell you that these things work best if you can combine this with therapeutic exercise, okay? I don't know if you have those late night TV commercials on like we have in the United States. So when I have insomnia, sometimes I turn the TV on, and you'll see these people on TV that are sitting on the couches with the electrical stimulation devices so that they drink beer and then they get this incredible musculature that it doesn't happen I'm sorry it, so um, those people have spent a lot of time in the gym okay and the same thing holds true for here um, is that you're not going to get complete benefit or muscle re-education just by this alone it will probably stem the tide or um, help slow the process of the muscle atrophy but it is not going to give you a six pack of an abdomen or really burly muscles, okay? It is very good, however, for pain management, altered pain perception, and decreased muscle spasticity. Most cases, however, don't need it, all right? And again, this particular machine, um, usually these days, they're actually combined with an ultrasound unit. Um, they can be very costly, 30 to 40,000 US dollars, okay? Um, you can find less expensive ones, but you're not going to use it that often. It's very nice to have in your clinic, but that's not going to be your go-to device, all right? Um, indications for cases, pre-existing muscle loss, um, and if you're, you're really having a slow return to function. But again, it's best used in tandem with therapeutic exercise programs. How, what we do with them is actually um, we'll use them when we employ them two to three times a week for a 10 to 20 minutes at a time. The waveforms that we usually use are a symmetrical biphasic. There's also a waveform called Russian stimulation, and as you can derive from the name, it's pretty sharp and an intense type of stimulation. Animals usually don't like this. They use this quite commonly in people, but you can explain to them what's going on. In animals, it's a little bit more difficult. Pulse duration and frequency in the duty cycle are nowadays preset, but it's always nice to know what you're getting when you're dialing things in on your machine. Um, and uh, the, the duty cycle for muscle strengthening is anywhere from one to three to one to five. So on, off, on, off. And you can increase the ramp by um, uh, slowly. So you should start out with zero once you have your pads on 
and then work your way up. And what I've always told people that are going to use this is try it on yourself first. Okay, that's really important. So you know what you're doing to the animal um, and don't just apply the pads. But that's pretty common sense. Okay, let's talk about aquatic therapy. Again, this is partial weight supported walking. This dog's not doing much walking at all, huh? Okay, with some gait retraining and again, using the buoyancy of water. In research in people, um, this is actually shown to markedly improve gait and it's a very safe environment to exercise. Let's talk about carts, slings, and assisted ambulation. These are all excellent tools, okay? And this is how I see rehabilitation, is this is that step beyond that we can offer animals, particularly for diseases or prognoses that don't necessarily have a whole bunch to offer, okay? Like, for example, that animal that's in chronic pain, what can we do in addition to the drugs if the drugs aren't just working, okay? Or the dog that has neurologic dysfunction, to the point that they probably won't walk again. So what can we do to either facilitate spinal walking or what can we do to you know, increase or improve the quantity um, and quality of the animal's life? So in terms of carts, there are multitudes out there for each and every different type of animal and they all have their pluses and their minuses. Uh, but it really allows for improved mobility. But one thing that we've found with um, owners of these dogs is it's a mental thing for the owner to put their animals into a cart. And once you've gotten over that, um, because most of them say, I don't want my dog to go into a wheelchair, you know, that they'll be upset. And you actually show them that their animal can go into a cart and they can be happy, and they usually are extremely happy to be moving around on their own. Um, it usually changes the owner's mind. And it has pretty significant positive psychological effects. But you don't go out right away and buy them, make them buy a cart, because a cart can be very costly, anywhere from 500 US dollars to a couple thousand, depending upon the size of the dog. But here's just some cases that we have, and we have quad carts for animals that have both forelimb and rear limb difficulties, or we have the, the kind of two-wheel carts. Um, and a lot of them now have the all-terrain bicycle wheels on them that actually do quite well, and, and one of our technicians who has a habit of adopting animals that only have two functional limbs, um, and makes all of her dogs in her house, that's a requirement, they have to be black dogs, and they have to be paralyzed to enter in her home. She has like six or seven of them. They all run around on these carts all day, and occasionally she'll find them at home like stuck in a tree. But they're very, they're very um, ambulatory. She's a little bit crazy. Don't tell her I told you that. So. Um, Here's another one. This is Rachel, that one that you saw on the land treadmill before. She's permanently paralyzed. This is probably how she's going to ambulate the rest of her life, okay, because she has little to no deep pain. But they work very, very well once the animal understands kind of their, uh, their new way of ambulating and how to get around things and how wide they are with their new wheels. One thing you have to watch with these guys is when they step off stairs, however, they do have a tendency to turn over. And they have these nice little bands in the back to suspend the limbs as well to keep them from dragging. Hmm? Okay. Here's just some other things, fun things that we do, but not as commonly, particularly for muscle building. Honestly, the land treadmill, underwater treadmill do great just on their own, swimming. Uh, but if you need that added extra um, bit of um, additional resistance, you can apply things like weights, okay? I wouldn't go, even in the large giant breed dogs, much beyond one or two pounds per limb, okay? And that makes a marked difference. Usually what you, ha you have to do is actually um, apply it above the um, tarsus here um, in the rear, uh, and that works pretty well. On the forelimb, it's a little bit more difficult to get it actually to stay. Um, you can, though, with some maneuvering of tape and elasticon and things like that. Other things that we use are resistance bands. Occasionally, again, not as common. You'll do that more in the forelimbs just because weights are more difficult to attach there. And dogs do pretty well. You just need to make sure that they aren't ataxic as well in their forelimbs because they have a tendency to fall down. 
For the high agility dogs, we have an agility training program. Another great thing to do is make some play sessions out of this. So this seems like a lot of fun, and it is. Um, but for this dog, what they're doing is actually improving their quadriceps muscle. He actually had bilateral patellar um, luxations that they surgically corrected. So going through on a crouch through a tunnel actually improves the quadriceps mechanism and functioning of the limb. We also have hoops and ramp jumpings. Again, this is for the more athletic dogs for the training programs here that we utilize. And again, like I said, most of our dogs end up to be better trained and obedient after they end up in therapy, so. And then the final thing that we talk about is a dog sit to stance. Now this dog's much more enthusiastic about it than most of our patients, but um, going actually down to a, a down position, that's for the forelimbs, it's great. It's just like a push-up or a plank type of activity uh, in a dog. Um, and then the sit to stands again, are, are like dog squats. And that's something, again, that we'll commonly do for owners as they go home. It's something that they can do easily. And we'll have them do that twice a day, in the morning and night, for anywhere from 10 to 20 um, sessions. And, it, and it's really great for uh, muscle building. Okay, so talking about prognostic points, um, particularly for neuro cases, again, most of the cases that come in that have deep pain, we can get them back particularly with rehabilitation, and we can get them back early and, and, and stronger. Most neurologic function, um, in the case of intervertebral disc disease, comes back within the first two weeks, um, but the ones that go beyond there really benefit from rehabilitation. The exceptions to that would be dogs that are obese, dogs that are very large um, or have more neurologic deficits. And in those particular cases, the hydrotherapy, the carts and the sling are um, a very, uh, you know, they're very indicated. The other thing that we've seen quite commonly in practice, you wouldn't think that some dogs are not, not motivated, uh, but the neuro case that I'll show you tomorrow, um, he just, just didn't want to get better. I mean, he was actually quite happy with lying around on a mat. And so we've, we've had a few cases that actually, if they had just tried, they would have walked much sooner. Um, most of the animals will, will want to try, but you'll, you'll occasionally run across those. And again, final outcome is dependent not only on the etiology, the chronicity, the type of surgery, but the post-operative care. This is an unusual case that we're going to be working on when we get back. It's a goat, and it had a massive homunculus um, infestation and which actually caused it to be grossly anemic and, and caused the, the goat to go down and be recumbent for an extended period of time. Unfortunately, it wasn't caught early, so he had chronic fi fi fibrous contracture of all four limbs, okay, and decubital ulceration over its bony prominences. So I gave this, do this um, goat a very, very poor prognosis, but we have very enthusiastic house officer and interns, and they've been nursing this goat back to care. And if I'll maybe send you a video. We're going to put him in our underwater treadmill when I get back on Wednesday um, and hopefully get him up and walking. But right now they're just doing sling-assisted walking and some pool work. And this is just another thing I wanted to show you. I showed you one before with Elsa and walking on the land. This is a degenerative myelopathy case, Felice. And he's, he came to our rehabilitation program for about two years during the tail end of his life. And this is how he walks normally. You see he's a very much older um, setter, right? But he has a very shuffling, stilted gait, really in all four limbs, okay? Kind of a walking like a crab there, too. But what we did with him is, in the water, his gait dramatically changed. And it's pretty, actually, it's, it's pretty amazing just playing with things that are very, you think, very simple in terms of improving one's function. And that function would carry on throughout the week. The more we exercised him in water, the better he walked on the land. So um, it's pretty remarkable. And we kept this dog going, who progressively got weak because it is a progressive, you know, debilitating terminal disease for about two years from his initial diagnosis. Okay, and there's another one. 
again, we, the dogs just like to watch each other. I don't know what it is, but there's our, our dog who was in for a, uh, obesity, and she was very fond of this dachshund, and she would just sit and watch and make sure that he was okay. Okay? All right. That's all I have, hopefully. Thank you. Ah, tem alguma pergunta? Não há perguntas, dúvidas? Ninguém? Quer perguntar nada? Thank you, Dr. Diane. Uh, vamos fazer agora um intervalo de 15 minutos. Ok, so here of course we have the poster child for an acute disc herniation. Yeah? So you can see for purposes of confidentiality, we've hidden this dog's eyes. But I should also say that really in the dog world, they don't recognize each other by looking at their eyes. No? They really recognize each other by sniffing their bottoms. So we'll cover that up as well. So we'll start right with the dachshund, okay? The acute Hansen type 1 intervertebral disc herniation. So a quick description of what it is. You already know what it is, but we'll just review that. If you look at this picture of an intervertebral disc, you have an outer edge of the annulus fibrosus. These are circles of collagen, OK? In the center, you have the nucleus pulposus. And notice how it's not truly in the center. It's a little eccentric. It's a little dorsally placed, all right? So with an acute disc herniation, what happens is the nucleus pulposus, that's normally well hydrated, dehydrates, undergoes chondroid metaplasia, so turns into cartilage, if you like. It dies, and then it becomes calcified or mineralized. This material is the material that is herniated. It shoots out dorsally through little holes in the annulus, into the spinal canal, where it both contuses and compresses the spinal cord, OK? The volume of this material that's herniated is very variable. And the speed with which it's herniated is very variable as well. So we're going to get very different types of injury, dependent on volume and speed. We classically see it in chondrodystrophoid breeds. Dogs age three to six years, that's the real peak. It can happen quite a lot older. It can happen younger, but it would be very unusual at less than two years of age, just because the degenerative changes haven't taken place. Okay? We can also see it in cats, and we'll also see it in large non-chondrodystrophoid breeds, Labrador retrievers, Doberman pinchers, chows, Sharpays, all kinds of other breeds. Okay? Typically with dogs, our most common site is around the thoracolumbar junction. So T1112 to L23 are about 75% of the cases. But we can, of course, have the cervical spine as well. And if we've got time, we'll talk about that. Cats, we usually see thoracolumbar junction or an overweight, big, fat, old cat's caudal lumbar spine. Okay? Here we've got two CTs, Im uh, two CT images that are illustrating the disc herniations. Here we've got a lumbar spine of a dog in transverse section. You can see it's lumbar because you can see the transverse processes. Here we're within the intervertebral disc and you can see all this mineralized material. And up above it in the canal, you can see this large glob of mineralized material, okay? Over here we have a cat, exact same thing. We're in the middle of the vertebral body here, but you can see this disc material that's herniated. Okay. We also have the description of Hansen type 2 disc disease. Okay. In this, the intervertebral disc has again undergone de degeneration. It's dehydrated. It's undergone fibroid metaplasia. So it's rather different. It does not mineralize. And what happens is the annulus overlying the nucleus will hypertrophy and protrude up, compressing the cord. And quite often, parts of the dehydrated fibrous disc nucleus will also push up into there. So rather than a sudden explosion, we've got this gradual compression. So it's rather different. In fact, it's a completely different disease. You can't really treat the two the same way. Classically, older large breed dogs, German Shepherds, for example, 
However, small non-chondrodystrophied -chondro breeds, it's very common, miniature schnauzers, chihuahuas, breeds like that can have multiple terrible type 2 disc herniations. So it's not exclusively large breed dogs, okay? Very, very common in cats, never causes a problem in cats. If you look at them on necropsy, you will see these type 2 disc herniations, but it's not usually clinically significant. What does it look like on MRI? You're not going to see anything on CT because it's soft tissue. The CT, we can see that mineralized disc. You won't see a type 2 disc. So on MRI, what might we see? So a bulging annulus over a degenerate dehydrated disc. There's one in the cervical spine. Here's one in the thoracolumbar spine. Very severe, significant disc herniation here with the cord dramatically compressed over it. Okay. And then we also see it very commonly down at the lumbosacral space. Again, big disc herniation, very smooth borders to it because it's a slowly progressive uh, event rather than a sudden explosion of disc material. The truth is, I think there are about 10 different types of disc herniation. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through all 10. I'm just going to mention one of them. This kind of disc herniation gets given a lot of different names. So it can be called a traumatic disc herniation or a missile disc herniation. Sometimes it's called low volume, high velocity disc herniation. Okay? But what you see are little bits of nuclear material that's often well hydrated. It's not a degenerate dehydrated disc material. Disc material will suddenly herniate and really contuse the cord, but it doesn't compress it much. It's a contusive injury. Okay? Now, this is something that really irks me. This often now appears in the literature as a type 3 disc herniation. Sometimes I even see it as a Hansen type 3 disc herniation. Hansen did not describe three types of disc herniation. Okay. So I tend not to call it this. I tend to call it a missile disc. All right. But you'll see a lot of different names for that. What does it look like? Well, here we've got an example on a myelogram. All right. And this, we're just assuming it's what's happened. We've got a dog that's gone down acutely. You can see lovely contrast that then gets a little bit thin through here, and eventually lovely contrast, and then we lose the column, then it reappears. Something going on right there, okay? So we just kind of infer that from a myelogram, but if you look at it on MRI, you can see it quite clearly. So here on this MRI, how familiar are you all with MRIs? Probably not too familiar, a little bit, okay? This is a T2-weighted image, meaning that fluid looks white. So your normal intervertebral disc has a lovely hydrated nucleus. See these lovely white nuclei? This one doesn't look the same. Okay? You can also see there's a little bit of a bulge there. There's a little bulge here, but it's more significant there. And right overlying it, we see white signal. We see edema within the spinal cord. Okay? If you look on transverse section, you can see it right here. It's hit one side of the spinal cord. We have this edema in one side, maybe a little bit of disc material there, but it's not really a compressive injury. It's more a contusive injury, okay? So these guys don't need surgery. All right, so moving on. We're really going to talk about acute disc herniations now, honestly, partly because we understand chronic disc herniations less well, I would say. So if we look at the pathophysiology underlying the disc herniation, what happens to the spinal cord, okay? We see two types of injury. I already mentioned we see contusive injury and we see compressive injury. How do we treat compressive injury? We decompress it, exactly. So we love compressive injury, particularly if we love surgery, all right? I love surgery, so I like compressive injury. So here you can see this is a dog that unfortunately did not get the chance to go to surgery. It was euthanized. And we cut through a mid-sagittal section of the vertebrae. You see all this cheesy disc, and you can see how it's up in the canal. And you could decompress that. All right, so we can treat that. Then we've got the conducive injury, and that's much harder to treat. So we're going to talk a little bit. I could talk for about 10 hours on that. We'll talk for about five minutes on that. All right, so let's, let's move on with that. So we say two things happen with conducive injury. The first is the primary mechanical damage to the spinal cord. The second is that initiates a whole series of biochemical events that causes an increased zone of tissue death. Okay? 
This really predominantly occurs over 24 to 48 hours. Now, if you're really a pedantic about it, you'll say, no, it goes on for years. It does go on for years. But the most significant events are within the first 24 to 48 hours. So let's talk about this a bit more. Contusive injury, direct parenchymal and vascular injury. This is our mechanical injury. So for example, that can be devastating. Look at this. This is obviously not a disc herniation. This is a trauma case. And this has devastating mechanical injury. This dog's not going to get better. Okay? So the primary injury can re be really problematic. With disc herniations, the more common thing that we would see is that because of some disruption of the axons and of the blood vessels, if you just look at them grossly on histopath, you'll see that there are patches of hemorrhage everywhere. We can still make out the gray matter. The white matter is looking very odd because changes have already started. Okay? So then we move on, and I apologize for these slides because they're kind of busy, but it's me trying to simplify things down. It's just not that simple. So after we've got our direct parenchymal and vascular injury, we initiate other events. So first of all, we'll see hemorrhage from the vascular injury. Okay? We'll see ischemia. We'll see loss of blood flow because of that parenchymal damage. And we'll see release of neurotransmitters. Now I'm really simplifying things. There's a million different things that go on, but these are probably the most important. So some of the neurotransmitters, for example, glutamate, will cause dramatic changes in extra and intracellular ions. So if we look at sodium and calcium, very quickly sodium concentrations go up within nerves and within axons, very, very quickly, and then there's a more prolonged increase in calcium. Okay? We'll talk about what that does in a minute. We see a failure of energy because of this ischemia. Hemorrhage will result in free radical productions. It'll also compress the cord more. Yeah? The energy failure results in free radical production. High sodium and calcium results in energy failure. Mitochondrial failure, energy failure. You see how everything kind of interplays. You get the message. All right? Once you get into this cycle, everything feeds into each other and ultimately takes you to this point. Okay. So just to show you what this would look like, here's a spinal cord shortly after an injury. Um, this is a thin section that's been stained with toluidine blue, so you can see structures really well. All this is white matter, okay? Here we've got little thrombose blood vessels. They've already started to thrombose. And here we see all of these white holes. This is edema. And what's important about this is it's intracellular, and it's because of those sodium levels going up. It's pulling fluid in. So will steroids help that? The answer, the correct answer, is no. Okay? So corticosteroids won't help that intracellular edema. It's due to a metabolic failure and that dramatic influx of sodium. Okay? So I'm just going to highlight a few points. So corticosteroids, what else do they do? Well, they inhibit glucose uptake by both glia and neurons. Right after an injury, you've got neurons that are saying, shall I live or shall I die? Give it some steroids, oh, it's going to die, because it's not going to take up its glucose. Okay? Also, in the longer term, it inhibits attempts at regeneration and sprouting, so it is going to limit your plasticity in the longer term. So I would prefer it if you did not give these patients large doses of steroids. They're not indicated. They've not been shown to be beneficial. Not a good idea. Large doses of dexamethasone, no. They'll take away the pain, they'll make the animal feel better. They're not going to improve the outcome, and they may worsen the outcome. Okay, so what can we do in this cycle? We'll talk about a few drugs. So one is polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Another is methylprednisolone sodium succinate. That's a steroid, okay, so I'm a hypocrite already. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the final one is how can we influence the ischemia? So we're going to start by talking about the ischemia, okay? So what affects the perfusion of the spinal cord? We all know that the spinal cord and the brain need an excellent blood supply, need excellent oxygenation, or they're going to die very quickly. So it's a very basic concept. We need to maintain blood flow. So one thing's happened. That primary mechanical damage has damaged the blood vessels. We can do nothing about that. It's happened. Okay. The next things that happen are all of these uh, neurotransmitters, inflammatory mediators, free radicals, cause vasospasm, cause damage to the endothelial cells, cause thrombosis. 
We're not sure if we can do anything about that, OK? More on that. Next thing, and this I put in yellow because we can do something about this. So normally, your nervous system will auto-regulate its blood flow. So if you have a drop in blood pressure, it'll vasoconstrict to maintain perfusion. If you have an increase, if you cough, your brain does not blow out, OK? You get vaso, vasoconstriction or dilation accordingly for whatever you need for the nervous system, all right? However, the minute you injure either your brain or your spinal cord, they lose that ability to autoregulate. So if there's any decrease in systemic blood pressure, they're very susceptible to decreasing uh, perfusion of that injured cord. Another thing that's really obvious, spinal cord compression affects the blood flow coming in, yeah? Affects the perfusion. So decompressing them and decompressing them promptly makes a lot of sense if they're compressed. So what should you do? Measure blood pressure in your patients. Less important in disc herniations, but I would still recommend it. And treat them if they're hypotensive. Measure their oxygenation and treat hypoxemia and decompress ongoing compression. So very sensible rules. These kinds of things have dramatically improved the outcome of head injury. The same can be true of spinal cord injury. So very pertinent with trauma, perhaps more so than disc herniations. But I tell you, you do not want to neglect the most obvious things that you can influence. OK. So what about drugs? Polyethylene glycol. So polyethylene glycol, it's again a really basic concept. It's a fusogen. It fuses cell membranes. Okay, So it's used a lot in cell culture where you want to fuse cells together. And the theory behind this is that just like with brain injury, when you injure the cord, you injure a lot of those axons. They get little small holes developing in them that let calcium, sodium, etc. in as well. It's another route for iron entry and then that enhances the damage so if you can seal up those holes you will decrease that whole cycle of events and there's certainly a lot of research that suggests that this could work very well so about eight years ago 2004 a phase one trial was performed in dogs these were dogs with acute disc herniations that came in and had paraplegia and no deep pain sensation no nociception and in this trial, they didn't use any controls. It was a phase one trial of is it safe or not. They had an outcome of 60% of their dogs recovered the ability to walk. So what happened then? It was actually a very nice trial, but they published it against historical controls. And in their historical controls, they said only 20% of them got better. So this is the wonder drug. The problem is their historical controls were terrible. In our hospital, 60% of dogs with no deep pain get better with surgery alone. Okay? So we actually took this into a multi-center trial. We were very intrigued by it because we were really hopeful that this would be beneficial. Um, and we compared it in paraplegic deep pain negative dogs. We compared it with placebo and with methylprednisolone sodium succinate. We have finished recruiting cases. We have just about finished the analysis. We're going to write it up very soon. So this is hot news. Okay? We didn't show any benefit, sadly. No benefit in our hands. We use the exact same protocol. OK, so methylprednisolone sodium succinate. How many of you are familiar with the MPSS story? Yeah? OK. So what's interesting about this one is there have been some very large human clinical trials done. And the ones that were first done were done in the United States. They're called the NASIS trials. And in these trials, they found that there was a very small benefit to a particular subgroup. And that subgroup were people who were treated within the first eight hours after injury. Okay? So they were giving really high doses, 30 mg per kg, and then 5.4 mg per kg per hour. They did actually a couple of different protocols. This is the protocol that worked for the really acutely treated people. At those doses, they argued they were using it not as a corticosteroid, but as a free radical scavenger. And they have nice data to back that up. Okay? Certainly, if you get outside that eight-hour window, they saw them get worse. And so their theory was that most of that free radical damage was happening in the first eight hours. And so if you hit them after that, you just got the bad glucocorticoid effects, not the good free radical effects. Okay? So that was the story. Um, there's a lot of controversy over these results. 
Um, a lot of things I won't bore you with about the data, for example. But so one thing would be the way they scored people was a very classic scoring system where you score segments and you ask people, can they feel? But quite a lot of their patients were in a coma when they came in. So how did they quantify them? You know, there, there are a lot of things that were a little bit odd. Um, so let's just leave it as there was a lot of controversy about these results. So again, we were really intrigued by this. Up to this point, we'd said, you know what? If we see a patient within eight hours of injury, and it's paraplegic, and it has no deep pain sensation, we might as well try it, OK? Because certainly there's experimental evidence, and then these, these, these NASA's trials. However, we rarely saw patients within that window. So it was actually pretty unusual that we ever gave it. Very rarely saw them in that window. The other thing to remember, and you'll see when we go over prognosis, is any dog with an acute spinal cord injury that still has no susception can and should get better, OK? It really should. I'm very disappointed if they don't. So do we need to give very high doses of a drug that might have side effects? We probably don't. So we took this drug, though, and we put it in our multicenter clinical trial. And again, we did not see any benefit. Okay? And that was using it the way we could use it as veterinarians. So it's not using it within an hour of injury, because we simply don't see the cases then. We see them within 24 hours. Okay? So in our hands, we were unable to show benefit. OK, so that's given you a little bit of background, type of discs, and a little bit of pathophysiology. So compression, we're saying we can decompress. Contusion, all we're saying is, well, let's make sure their blood pressure is good. And let's make sure they're well oxygenated. OK? So now let's talk about the mechanics of a disc herniation coming into you. So diagnostic approach. Obviously, you're going to take history. You're going to do a physical exam on every case. So let's pick it up from there. You're going to do a neuro exam, of course. And from that, I want you to walk away with two things. Where are the signs and how severe are the signs? So localize the signs, grade the severity. Two things, that's all you need to come away from it with, OK? To localize the signs, and right now we're talking about thoracolumbar disc herniations. If they have intact reflexes, T3, L3. Absent reflexes, L4, S3. Truth is, it's a bit more complicated than that because we see spinal shock, et cetera. We're not going to worry about that, OK? Basic rule. Severity, there's a very simple scoring system that most people use, I would say, the vast majority of neurologists would use for the clinical assessment, because this allows us to put them into different prognostic groups. So if they've just got back pain, they're a grade one. Pretty unusual we see that with a disc herniation. They've usually got neurodeficits. Grade two, they're still ambulatory. So they're walking around, but they're ataxic and they're paraparetic. Grade three, non-ambulatory paraparesis. So they've still got motor, but they're not strong enough to bear weight. Grade four, they're paraplegic. They're paraplegic, but they can still feel their feet. They have no susception. Grade five, the ones we really worry about, paraplegic with no nociception. They've lost all sensation. It's a very simple scoring, OK? Grade five, these are the ones we worry about. OK. So because we worry about that, we've got to talk a little bit about how you assess pain perception, because it's not always that easy. Critical for prognosis. What we must do is differentiate between a local reflex and a conscious response. We're looking for a conscious response. So we have to apply pressure to a digit, not the skin, OK? The digit, you apply pressure to a digit with some hemostat forceps. Just your fingers is not enough. Now, if you do your first examination of the animal, you pinch them with just your fingers and they cry out, that's fine. You can stop there. But if they don't, you can't say that they don't have deep pain until you've used forceps. Okay? What I typically do is a two-point crush, if you like. So I'll have the animal in a comfortable position. They may be lying on their side, but if they're lying on their side and struggling, that's not going to help me okay? because I can't tell what's going on, in which case I'll have the owner hold them with a leg hanging over. Just make sure they don't get bitten, OK? That's never good. So then with my forceps, I'll do a gentle squeeze, which would usually elicit a withdrawal reflex. So I see that withdrawal reflex, I keep the leg flexed, keep a little pressure on, and then I do a heavy squeeze and look for that cerebral response. Why two-part squeeze? Sometimes if they just snatch the leg back fast, it moves them and they look around. So doing a two-part squeeze, wait, big squeeze, allows you to differentiate that. 
I will do medial and lateral digits of both hind feet, and I'll do the base of the tail, OK? And sometimes it's fine, it's easy. You know for sure they've got deep pain. Sometimes it's not so easy. So let's just talk, look at this dog. So of course, this is not an obvious one. I'm not going to show you an obvious one. Look at this little dog. Look at these for heavy forceps. One squeeze, heavy squeeze. Can that dog feel? Certainly, it's got a lot of pressure on that digit, and it's not biting anyone. So if it can feel, it's the nicest dog in the world. Yeah, what's interesting, let me show you this one again. What's interesting with this one is clearly it does not have normal nociception, clearly. However, when that big heavy squeeze is put on, it does shift around a bit and lick a little bit. So I think it's got a little bit of nociception, but it doesn't have much. Okay, so this needs to be treated as if it has no deep pain. So just show you that again. Squeeze, then just watch this dog. He's looking away. Heavy squeeze. Oh, lick and shift. But it doesn't know where that pressure's coming from. It can't localize it. Okay. So to diagnose it, we've done on your exam, physical exam. Obviously, we want the animal to be a typical signalman. That makes us a bit more comfortable, puts it higher on the list. So the young dachshund, sure. The English Mastiff, no, probably not. You know? So this dog was sent in to us as a one-year-old English Mastiff, acutely down, with a diagnosis of a disc herniation. Wrong breed, too young, pretty unlikely to be correct. Okay? So you want to, it could be, uh, but pretty unlikely. So you want to deal with the obvious things. We always do routine blood work and a urinalysis. It's amazing how many of these dogs do already have a urinary tract infection. And of course, we're going to do spinal radiographs, and we can just zip over this. Mostly gives you an idea of if there's a disc herniation, not accurate enough for surgery. We look for mineralized nucleus in the canal. We look for narrowing or wedging. We look for a pacification or change in the shape of the foramen. And if we're very lucky, we see a vacuum phenomenon. Okay. And just to review those again, here is some slides. So can you see the lesion on this one? And just remember, this could be a trick question. I'm waiting to see how awake you were in the last lecture. Yeah, I hear some talking. So certainly, it's hard to evaluate these disc spaces. This looks narrow. This looks narrow. But yeah, it is a bit of a trick question. This dog's got discospondylitis. Yeah? Can't see the end plates. See nice end plates? Can't see the end plates. So that was a trick one. All right? That was mean, wasn't it? What about this one? I think you can all see collapsed disc space, can't you? Yeah? What's interesting about this one is it was like a 10-month-old Great Dane. You can see the growth plates are still open, and it had fallen on its head. So that's why it was a traumatic disc herniation. OK, what about this one? See anything on here? The red spot. You can certainly see a mineralized nuclear material there. This is right at the end of the radiograph. We can't assess its width. But one thing I think I forgot to say in the last lecture, T1011 is always a bit narrower than the other disc spaces. OK? Anyway. All right, to definitively diagnose it, we need to do advanced imaging, which could be myelography, could be CT, could be MRI. OK? Um, we will always do CSF analysis if we're doing a myelogram. So before we inject contrast for a myelogram, we'll take a cerebrospinal fluid sample and we'll analyze it to make sure we're not about to myelogram an animal that has myelitis. Okay? Remember, myelitis will affect the small terrier breed, so a similar kind of group of dogs. Really, we rarely do myelograms. We do them when the CT's down, when the MRI's down or unavailable, or if owners have real financial concerns, um, then a myelogram is appropriate. In our hands, actually, at our hospital, a CT is probably cheaper than a myelogram. We do it just with sedation, uh, but we don't always. Sometimes a CT, our CT will go down. Plus, if it's not a mineralized disc, a CT is not going to help us. It's only going to help if it's mineralized. So here we've got a CT that I showed you before, and here we've got an MRI. All right? So these are the two tests that we're doing. What are the advantages? CT, very sensitive and specific for acute mineralized disc herniations. It's absolutely wonderful. You can see where that disc material is so clearly. Beautiful for surgical planning. Not helpful if it's not mineralized. You won't see it. Okay. MRI, 
great information on the spinal cord as well. So you will always see the disc material. You can always see it. There's no type of disc material you can't see. And in addition, it'll give you information on the spinal cord parenchyma. And there are some studies coming out that showing the more edema you have in the cord, the worse the prognosis. So it gives you more information. Okay. Trouble with MRI, expense, and availability. So at our hospital, an MRI out of hours is over $2,000. A CT is $300. Okay. It's kind of different. So. All right, so next thing. When an owner comes in, they want to know the prognosis before they commit to all of this workup and surgery. So presence of pain perception is the most important prognostic factor at the time they come into the hospital. There are some indicators kind of later on from imaging, from how they do in the first few days after surgery. But what owners want to know is before they commit to all that money. Okay? And here's my rule. All dogs with intact pain perception have the potential to recover both motor function and continence. A very small percentage won't, probably because you caught them early and they were still deteriorating. Okay? But in general, 95 to 99% of these guys can get better. Very important point. Okay? So if we look at prognosis dependent on how we choose to treat them, with either conservative management that we'll talk about in a minute, or with surgical management. We can start to look at the grades, okay? Grades one and two, dogs with just back pain or dogs that are ambulatory paraparetic. So they can walk, dogs that can walk. With conservative management, excellent odds of getting better, okay? Excellent. Grade three, non-ambulatory paraparetic. Grade four, paraplegic. These guys behave pretty similarly. If they can't walk but they can feel their feet, with conservative, they have about a 70% chance of getting better, which sounds pretty good unless you're in the 30% that don't, in which case you feel like your dog was never going to get better. Okay, it was a bad choice. Grade five, dramatic change. Without surgery, less than 5% chance of getting better. Okay, very, very different. So what can we say about conservative? Trouble is, even though for a grade three and four dog, a dog that's non-ambulatory that has pain perception, that have better odds of getting better than not, if you go the conservative route, and there's not good data to support this yet, nobody's really done the studies, they tend to recover more slowly than surgically treated dogs. Not always, okay? If they haven't herniated much disc material, they're going to recover quickly. But if they've herniated a lot, they're going to recover more slowly and often to a slightly lower level. The gait's more disconnected, they're more abnormal. But the biggest problem is they have a really increased chance of a recurrence. They've got about a 50-50 chance of a recurrence as compared to a surgically treated dog that was fenestrated, and we'll talk about that later, has about a 5 to 10% chance of a recurrence. Okay? So if we treat these guys surgically, grades 1 and 2, really, I mean, it should be a 100% chance of getting better. You never like to say that when you're doing a spinal surgery. Things can go wrong. Things are never 100%, but they should get better. Grades three and four, better odds than conservative. Really, it's close to 100%. It's better than 90% chance of getting better. Okay. Grade five, about a 50-50 chance of getting better. So the only one that's clearly, clearly different is a grade five. It's a really big difference. Very easy decision. These guys need surgery. Grades three and four, they do better with surgery. They also have less of a chance of a recurrence, but they could get better and do pretty well with conservative. Grades one and two, a walking dog, you're fine going conservative. If you have recurrent episodes, you probably need to do surgery, but you're fine going conservative. Okay? So, trouble with surgery, well, cost, surgical risk. So, if I for, see, for example, a 12 year old dachshund that has congestive heart failure, and has become paralyzed because of a disc, but it can still feel its feet and has a little motor, it's a grade three, you know what, I'm gonna treat it conservatively. If it's a three-year-old dachshund, I'm gonna recommend surgery, okay? So conservative management, so what does this mean? So just to summarize, very appropriate would be our first choice for any ambulatory dog, grades one and two. Inappropriate for grade five. These guys need to have surgery recommended. It's acceptable for grades three and four, though it wouldn't be my first choice. It's definitely acceptable. Okay? What does it mean? 
OK, so this is where we start to get, I think, into a contentious bit. So what we were always taught in the past, and I was taught in my residency, strict confinement for four to six weeks, meaning they go into the crate, the picture that uh, Dr. Dunning showed earlier, they get put in prison, and they get left alone, and nothing happens. I am just like Dr. Dunning. I don't think that is in their best interest. So they need to be confined. However, they need to have a rehabilitation plan with that. The purpose of confinement is to avoid them jumping, twisting, turning, doing things that will cause more disc herniation. Okay? The purpose of the rehabilitation is to keep those limbs moving, is to start those limbs moving if they're not, uh, to maintain joints, to maintain muscle integrity, to build new neurologic pathways. Okay? So we need to combine the two. We need to treat pain if they're painful. Okay? So how do we treat pain? Avoid corticosteroids. Corticosteroids will make them feel great. Let me tell you, you give them a shot of steroids, they'll be bouncing around the next day. But we're going to inhibit the healing of that annulus, inhibit any plasticity, and make them much more likely to feel so good they bounce around and herniate more disc. So avoid corticosteroids. Non-steroidals are very appropriate. I say avoid aspirin. A lot of owners have aspirin at home, want to give them aspirin. It's just if we're going to end up having to do surgery, that complicates it because it affects uh, blood clotting, OK? It's still fine to do surgery if they've had aspirin. It's just more difficult. Muscle relaxants are effective. How many of you have ever had back or neck pain? You're probably too young for that. Oh, a few of you there. And a lot of that comes from the muscle spasm. So if I palpate or see a lot of muscle spasm, I'll use a muscle relaxant. It can really, really help them. And then opiates are very effective. And fentanyl patches, butorphanol can be sent home with owners. I don't know what you have available here. Uh, but those are very um, effective pain relievers. And then just keeping the animal confined, not having them bouncing around, will really help with their pain. And so we'll often find an animal comes into us with thoracolumbar problems, paresis, quite painful. We put them in a cage overnight. We give them a little opiate, a little muscle relaxant, and the next day they feel dramatically better. Okay? Send them home. They bounce around at home. They get painful again. Okay? Then it's important, I said, that we rehabilitate them. And I really don't need to say more about this because it's also already been covered in great detail. In general, what I would say is we're somewhat cautious in a dog that has not had surgery for the first two weeks because if disc material is herniated, we know there's a hole in the annulus and that more disc material can herniate. So we don't want these guys doing anything too athletic, but we definitely want to be working them and working their, uh, their limbs. So we'll just move on from that. So then this, I think, is really important. What are the expectations? So multiple times, I have seen owners bring in dogs six weeks after the dog became paralyzed. Okay? And what happened was they went to the vet with their paralyzed accent, and the vet said, gave them the odds, and they decided they couldn't really afford workup and surgery. They wanted to do conservative management, which was very appropriate and OK. However, let's say at that time it had a little motor, um, but was unable to walk. They put it in its cage, they followed the instructions, the dog became unable to walk. But they said, well, we're only one week out, we haven't done six weeks yet. We haven't done the full treatment course. So let's keep waiting, because if we wait longer, maybe that'll be better. And then six weeks down the line, the dog's paraplegic with no deep pain and is a disaster. Okay? So this expectation is very, very important to convey to the owners. So we should start to see improvement within a week. We really should. If conservative management's going to help, they should start to improve quickly. Okay? If they've got a ton of disc material there, they probably won't improve that quickly. If they just had a little disc material that hit the cord hard, they will improve. Okay? So we're starting to sort out which ones really need surgery and which one's going to be okay without. If you have an animal that's parapyretic, so it's got motor, it's just not strong enough to walk, they really should be walking within two weeks. That's what we would typically see. If they're paraplegic at the start point, they should, within two weeks, have some motor, some decent motor. If they don't have those things by those times, or if they worsen in any way, the conservative approach is not working out very well for this patient, and the owner needs to reconsider. OK? Make sense? Other things. Sending home a paralyzed dog with an owner, you're sending them home with a medically complicated patient. They need to be well informed, so they need to be able to manage the bladder. More about that in a minute. They need to recognize 
if their dog deteriorates, so you need to show them what their dog can do and explain clearly what a deterioration would be. They need to understand the complications, decubital ulcers, self-mutilation that can happen really quickly and is very disconcerting. And they need to bring their pet back into you for you to recheck regularly so you know what's going on, okay? Bladder management. There's so much to a disc. You see, I could go on and on and on. Um, all right. So about 30% of dogs that have an acute disc herniation, even if they recover, will develop a urinary tract infection in the first 12 weeks after their injury. So we definitely want to make owners aware of that and have them monitor urine. Um, definitely, owners can monitor for blood, so the color of the urine, and smell. All right. However, some of these UTIs can be occult, so you do need to do cultures occasionally. Okay. If you just send them home on antibiotics just to stop a urinary tract infection, if they're going to get one, they'll still get one. It'll just be resistant. So we don't usually use prophylactic antibiotics. Okay. So the management rules. Any patient that's paraplegic cannot typically urinate. If you lift the patient up and it leaks urine everywhere, it's not urinating. It has a bladder that's this big with very high pressure, and putting pressure on the abdomen to lift them up is making it leak. Okay. So whenever you pick up an animal, it leaks urine. That is usually a bad sign, a warning sign. Okay. We try to empty bladder three to four times a day. Okay. Typically at our hospital, we use manual expression. If we can't express them, particularly the males, we'll use intermittent catheterization. If it happens that it's a female that we can't express, and that's incredibly unusual, but happens about once every two or three years, we'll put an indwelling catheter. All right, until they can urinate. But usually just manual expression will do it. And the vast majority of owners can learn to manually express their pet with no problem at all. We can also help them by giving drugs to relax the internal and external sphincters. Diazepam and phenoxybenzamine, another drug you might use is prazosin. Okay? So you can help them pharmaceutically as well. All right. So we've talked about the conservative aspect. Now we'll talk about surgery. So the aim is to decompress the spinal cord. But the second aim is to reduce the risk of a recurrence. All right? You will only do that if you do fenestration as well as hemilaminectomy. All right? So just to talk through these surgeries, in the, in the bad old days, they used to do dorsal laminectomies. They didn't get the disc material out very effectively, and they were more likely to get a laminectomy membrane. We don't really do that anymore unless there's a particular reason for it because of where the disc material is. Hemilaminectomy is the standard of care, I would say, where we drill a nice hole in the lateral pedicle so that we can see the spinal cord. Okay? Mini hemilaminectomies or pediculectomies are done by some groups to try and lessen the invasiveness of the procedure, and you would end up with just a little hole down here, potentially, perhaps coming up around here to try and get the disc material out. Fenestration is where you go to the intervertebral discs themselves you cut a little window in the annulus, and you scoop out the center, the nucleus. It's actually quite difficult to do in the thoracolumbar spine, more difficult than a hemilaminectomy, and so people may choose not to do it. It takes time. Uh, but we'll typically fenestrate all the at-risk discs, so T1112 to L23, and that really does reduce the risk of a recurrence. There still can be a recurrence, but you make it less likely. So surgery, very appropriate for any dog that can't walk. So grades three through five, and I would say it's vital for grade five disease. Okay. If you've got a dog that has recurrent bouts of paraparesis and spinal pain, it is acceptable for that as well. It's higher risk, of course. Postoperatively, you manage them in the exact same way as I outlined for conservative management. But we're going to get their rehab going pretty quickly um, because we've removed the disc herniation. We can perhaps be a little less cautious, although they have just had a big spinal surgery. What are the expectations? Well, there are very few things that are common enough for us with lots of rechecks that we can really talk about recovery well. Disc disease is one of those. There are lots and lots of different studies. But of course, I'm going to talk about my study, because that's the way it is. I'm talking. Um, so I actually did a prospective study years ago now where I followed a big cohort of dogs that had disc surgery and I actually saw them back in the hospital and graded their function on a much larger scale than the zero to five so I could separate out their recovery a little bit better. So if we have a little look, here are dogs 
that are paraplegic, deep pain negative. Okay, no nociception, no motor. So they all start off with a score of zero. On this scoring scale, at six, they're just starting to kind of take some steps. Okay? At 11, the owners are usually pretty pleased with their uh, performance. They're pretty pleased. So if you look at zero, two, four, and 12 weeks was the time points that we got, you can see their recovery is all over the place. All right? So some of them don't recover at all, and some make an excellent recovery. Very, very variable. If they're going to get sensation back, they usually get sensation back in those first two weeks. There are a few outliers that will go to about a month. Once you get out beyond that, it's very unlikely they're going to get sensation back. If they get sensation back, they should get better. Okay? It may take some time in some of them, but they should get better. Usually, if they're on that track, the motor appears within two to four weeks. So we've got pretty clear expectations of what they're going to do. Group two, these are animals that are paraplegic um, but have intact sensation. You see how clear this curve is. These guys have all recovered. They're all up here walking. 100% of these guys did. The motor in every case appeared within two weeks, every single case. Okay? So if they haven't got any motor after two weeks, I'm wondering what's wrong. What have we missed? Is there another disc herniation? Did we not decompress them? Okay. If you look at group three, these are the non-ambulatory paraparetic dogs. They're identical to the paraplegic deep pain positive dogs. So identical to the previous group. All right. And then the other dogs that are already have excellent motor, obviously they all get better very quickly. What affects the speed of their recovery? We've looked at a lot of different factors to do with the actual dog. One is age. The older the dogs are, the longer they take to recover. Okay. And the other is weight. So this is not whether they're overweight or not. It's more size of dog. Okay? And there are some real outliers here. Guess what breed this outliers are that took ages to walk again? Can you guess? It's all to do with personality, I think. These are the fat old bassets. Okay? We had a couple of bassets in that study, and I think they skewed it a lot. Because those guys, they're not that interested in walking. They're very happy to have you sling them around. So um, they can maybe skewed that data a little bit. All right, if I was to say ascending myelomalacia, do you know what I'm talking about? This is a problematic syndrome. So in general, you will tend to say to owners, well, the worst outcome of this disc herniation is that your dog remains paralyzed forever. Well, that's a pretty bad outcome. But there is a worse outcome, and that's death, all right? So ascending myelomalacia has also been called the ascending syndrome. And in a big study we did, it occurred in about 10% of dogs that are paraplegic deep pain negative, so the grade 5 dogs. And what happens, okay? So what happens is progressive thrombosis of the blood vessels up and down the spinal cord. It happens over a period of days, may start about two days after surgery. You may actually see clinical evidence the time they come in. We don't really have time to talk about that. But... Um, Often it's like two, three days after surgery that you start to see this happen. And as it causes this necrosis, they lose the reflexes in their hind limbs, then they get weak on their thoracic limbs, and then they stop being able to breathe. Okay? So this is a potentially fatal disease. And I say about 10% because the big cohort of dogs I followed, about 10% of them, I think it was 11% in my study and 9% in somebody else's study, developed this. However... In our big multi-center clinical trial where we've got 70-odd paraplegic deep pain negative dogs, 17% of them develop this. Okay? So it may be higher than we realized, um, the incidence of this. What was, does it look like? Well, here's a myelogram from the old days. A needle was put in here, started the injection, and the cord started to fill up with contrast. So the person doing the myelogram said, oh, I must have placed that needle badly in some way, and put one in in front. Same thing. It's because the spinal cord is toothpaste. It's got no structure to it. It's dead already. Okay? Here we have an MRI showing it, and you can see, same thing, all along here, we have edema within the cord. Really extensive edema. Now, you know these guys clinically look different. Their abdomen has no tone. And if you look at their paniculus reflex, it'll be higher than it should be for the disc herniation. So you can pick these guys up early um, if, the, if it's already started. Okay? All right, how are we doing? So it's 25 to 6. I can talk about cervical disc disease or go straight. It depends how much you want me to talk about. 
Five minutes. Do you want to do cervical disc disease or future research? Future. Cervical disc, so do I. Okay. You, you can cervical talk more disease. 10 minutes. 10 minutes? <gasps> oh, do we go back? Oh. <laughs> All right, cervical disc disease. Here's a classic cervical disc disease, not a classic breed. See the posture? Painful, painful, painful. Can walk around fine. So what are the differences? So really, cervical disc disease, acute discs, we're talking about pretty much the same disease process. So pathophysiology is the same. The disc degeneration is the same. Herniation is the same. Breeds at risk are the same. Peak age of disc herniation is the same. Conservative management is the same. OK? Differences. Much less likely to have severe neurological deficits. Usually, they just present with severe, severe pain for a variety of reasons. One reason that's frequently touted is that there's more room around the spinal cord. When you actually do the measurements, I'm not sure that there is. Okay? So maybe the disc material releases more slowly. Um, the pain comes from nerve roots running through. It's a very mobile area. Running through that disc material, they get very, very painful. Okay? The decision about whether to do surgery versus conservative management is different. So we said for thoracolumbar disc herniations with just pain, I'm going to manage them conservatively. Even if they're ataxic and a bit paretic, I'm going to say conservative at first. With a neck, I feel a little different. That's their major sign. Prognosis is a little bit different. Surgical approach is different. Here's a case. This is little Miss Ellie. She's painful. The owner says her neck's swollen. It's all the muscle spasm. She's walking around. She's a little ataxic. She looks lame. She's got a nerve root signature. Yeah. I'm sorry, these look so bright up on the screen. You can see her looking. You can see the whites of her eyes. You know she doesn't want to move her neck. Poor little dog. Okay. More of this story. All right. There's little Ellie. Here are the radiographs from Ellie. See anything? See how we've got shoulder all the way across, making it difficult to see? It's because she had so much spasm. We do have a disc that's looking rather suspicious there, in spite of all the overlying bone. It does look like there's mineralized material. It looks narrowed. Okay. So what would you recommend to the owner? Here are your three options. Conservative management with prednisone and cage rest. Number two, advanced imaging and surgical decompression. Number three, conservative therapy with non-steroidals and tramadol. Here are your three options. This is the first time the dog has come in. It looks exactly like I showed you. So who would go for number one? Who will go for number two? OK, we've got some takers for two. You know me, I'm an aggressive surgeon. I like two, too. What about number three? Yeah, it wouldn't be wrong to try that. Absolutely wouldn't be wrong to try that. We don't like number one. OK, this is why we don't like number one. It'll make him, usually make him feel better. So what the vet did was number one, OK? Um, they started on one big pig of bread per day, and the dog improved initially. As soon as they tapered it, it got worse. So they upped the dose to two migs per kig per day, OK? The signs actually kind of remained. When the dog came into us, was six weeks down the line. She had a PCV of 20% because she had GI ulceration and had been bleeding quite a lot. Okay. So, um, decisions about surgery. So, any patient for me that has really severe pain, if it's associated with a really big disc herniation in the neck, it needs surgery. It's different to the back. Okay. So what I might do is say to the owner, you know, it's not wrong to do conservative management in this dog. Why don't we sedate your dog, do a CT? If we see there's a ton of disc material, let's go to surgery. If we don't, then great, let's do conservative management. A sedated CT is not that expensive. We can do it in about five minutes flat. Um, so that's kind of the way I, I deal with these guys. The surgery we do is a ventral slot. Come on down, here's a slot. Pull out the disc material and fenestrations. Conservative therapy is pretty much the same as the thoracolumbar one. However, we may need to be a bit more aggressive with pain management. If it's going to work, I expect to see an improvement within 48 hours. Okay? Prognosis, just pain, with surgery, excellent. Excellent. Could there be problems along the way? Sure. But ultimately, it should be excellent. If they come in paraplegic, with difficulties breathing, their prognosis, they become an emergency. And if you can't ventilate them, their prognosis is not so good. If you can ventilate them, their prognosis is good. Now, I don't think we have time to talk about the respiratory failure and stuff. So we're going to gloss across that because it's pretty rare. We're going to talk about the future. Prevention. 
So, genetics. We'll talk a little bit about genetics, and then we'll talk about how do we convert the poor old paraplegic dog to the super dog. This is Mickey. He lived to be 17 years of age at the vet school. He was my beloved little paralyzed dachshund. A lot of character. So genetics. So certain breeds are overrepresented, and the dachshund clearly is overrepresented, even in the overrepresented breeds. They account for about 50% of cases in any case series, about 19% of all dachshunds, and as common as 75% in certain families. It's not a simple mode of inheritance, so it would be difficult to figure out genetically. Also difficult to figure out truly whether a dog's affected or not, because most dogs will develop mineralized discs, but only a few will actually herniate them. So what do you call your phenotype? So a little bit difficult. Prevention's definitely better than a cure. If you could identify genetically which traits to breed away from, you could really help them. You would really hurt neurologists and neurosurgeons, because that's really a large part of their practice. Okay. There are several groups looking at the genetics. They're struggling a bit because of the phenotype. We're about to start looking at it in corgis. Okay. Then there's some unusual therapeutic studies. Um, of placebo-controlled blinded clinical trials, the only one that's been written up prior to this, well, no, actually, there's a couple, but one of the main ones that's been written up is one using an electrical stimulation unit called an OFS unit. This is what these units look like. And basically, the idea is that you put little electrodes either side of the injury, and you stimulate them with an alternating electrical current because axons will regenerate along an electrical field, just like skin will heal along an electrical field, bones will heal along an electrical field. Okay? And so this group at Purdue did a very nice blinded clinical trial, and they saw a change in pain perception in these dogs, treated dogs. They didn't see anything else, and so it's not really been picked up. They've actually been put in humans, 10 humans with complete injuries, and seen a change in pain perception with them. Okay? And the stuff at the moment is kind of halted in FDA approval zone. Another interesting study has been performed by Nick Jeffrey and his group at Cambridge using olfactory nerve and sheathing cells. Now, these cells have properties of Schwann cells that enhance regeneration and properties of astrocytes that are important for reconstituting the environment of the nervous system, central nervous system. Okay? So you can actually obtain these by biopsies of the olfactory bulb. And you can grow them so you can do autologous transplants. And Nick Jeffries published a phase one trial and shown that you can safely do this and successfully do this. They've now, I think, completed a blinded placebo control trial. They've presented the data verbally, but it's not yet been written up. And there are some interesting results. It's not a miracle cure, but there are some interesting results. So that's something to look out for. And then there's the stem cell work, mesenchymal stem cells. And groups have certainly started to, to transplant mesenchymal stem cells into the injured spinal cord, myself included. A group in Korea have done this acutely and felt that they've seen a benefit. It's a bit difficult to interpret their results, OK? So just one little word. Here's Mickey again when he was old, but still smiling, you see, OK? We have a spinal cord injury program um, that I started from my lab because we do a lot of spinal cord injury work. And our mission is that we're dedicated to improving the outcome of acute and chronic spinal cord injuries in dogs. And then, of course, we hope that will translate to other species. And we run a lot of clinical trials. So we run this multi-center clinical trial looking at methylpred and polyethylene glycol that's now complete and hopefully will soon be written up. We're doing one looking at the effect of cranberry extract on urinary tract infections. Okay, that's kind of midway through case um, recruitment. We've done a couple of trials using drugs that enhance conduction in demyelinated axons in chronically paralyzed dogs. And both trials are in the process of being written up. Both showed a benefit in a chronically paralyzed dog. Okay? We've got a trial going right now where we're transplanting Schwann cells and adipose-derived stem cells. It's a placebo-controlled trial in chronic paraplegics. That's midway in case recruitment. And we're about to start a trial looking at glial growth factor 2 as a protective drug for acute spinal cord injury. So we have a lot of different cases, uh, different trials going on. And you can imagine every case that comes into NC State, we're like, which trial can we put it in? There's got to be a trial we can put it in. OK. The other thing we do is we have fun. And we try and provide some support for the community of people who have paralyzed dogs. And one of the things we do is we hold the Paralympics. And the people dress all their dogs up, 
And so we have best dressed dog and cart, and people do a wonderful job. Uh, but we also have a race. So here's one of the chaotic races. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Wilhelm, he's persistent, he's going to win. <laughs> so we have great fun with things like that. And a lot of what people need is they just need support for their paralyzed dogs. Okay, so to summarize, accurate neuroevaluation, take spinal radiographs. If you follow the conservative route, keep checking on your patient. Make sure it's the right route and it stays the right route. Grade 5 cases need surgery as soon as possible. Very easy, easy, easy decision. They need surgery. Watch out for genetic tests coming in. They may well in the future. And then also there are a lot of different clinical trials going on that may help us decide if there is a wonder drug that we can give to prevent that secondary injury, uh, injury from developing. And also whether transplantation techniques will become routinely available and will demonstrate efficacy. Okay? So... There's Mickey in his prime when he was a young boy. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. I'm you didn't much time talk. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Agradeci que guardassem apenas um minuto para iniciarmos as comunicações livres. Cada comunicação terá duração de 15 minutos e iniciaremos dentro de momentos. Obrigado. Recordar só, portanto, que vamos ter quatro uh, comunicações livres que estarão em competição por um prémio fantástico e que vão ter cada orador 10 minutos, exatamente, e dos quais se segue 5 minutos para discussão. Estes 10 minutos serão obrigatoriamente uh, cumpridos, está bem? Portanto, vamos começar... Uh, com a, a mestranda Ana Rita Pinho, que vai apresentar-nos um caso clínico de meduloblastoma. Bem, muito boa tarde. Eu vou então apresentar um dos casos clínicos que vou descrever na, na minha tese e que neste caso será sobre um meduloblastoma que foi acompanhado na referência veterinária, não só por mim, mas por todos os outros colegas que lá estavam. Ora, então, apresento-vos o Scott, é um samoyé do macho, com 8 anos de idade e com história clínica, já com duração de dois meses, de inclinação da cabeça e desequilíbrio e descoordenação. Inicialmente responderam bastante bem a medicação corticoide, no entanto, deixaram de estes corticoides deixaram de fazer efeito e uh, os sinais foram agravando progressivamente, daí ter sido referenciado para consulta de neurologia. No exame neurológico. Estava a funcionar. Não. Ah. Uh, vemos que há uma hipermetria bastante clara do bípode esquerdo e uma inclinação simultânea da cabeça para o lado direito, para o lado oposto, uh, relativamente ao posicionamento proprioceptivo. Não vou conseguir cumprir os 10 minutos assim. <risos> Havia um atraso no posicionamento proprioceptivo do bípede esquerdo, que aqui é mais notório no membro pélvico, quando comparado com o membro torácico, mas é bastante evidente de recordar que a inclinação da cabeça ocorria para o lado oposto, para o lado direito. E ainda no exame neurológico, é bastante importante, é bastante notório um nistagmo vertical do globo ocular esquerdo, enquanto no globo ocular direito há um nistagmo horizontal. É, portanto, um nistagmo desconjugado, que foi induzido pelo movimento da cabeça, tal como o estrabismo que vemos no globo ocular esquerdo. Assim, no fim do diagnóstico do exame neurológico, conseguimos um diagnóstico anatómico e a lesão do Scott foi localizada no cerebelo, por duas razões. Primeiro, ele tem sinais puramente cerebrais, como hipermetria. Por outro lado, exime um síndrome vestibular paradoxal, que apenas surge quando há afecção das, das, dos componentes vestibulares do cerebelo ou da sua relação com os restantes componentes vestibulares centrais. Uh, relativamente à lateralização da lesão, 
tem sempre em conta o lado dos déficits proprioceptivos e não o da inclinação da cabeça. Portanto, neste caso, seria uma lesão do lado esquerdo do cerebelo. E foi proposta a realização de uma ressonância magnética. Na ressonância, tal como previsto, foi identificada uma lesão no lado esquerdo da fossa caudal, presumivelmente afetando o cerebelo, e numa sequência ponderada em T2. Vemos que, efetivamente, afeta o cerebelo do lado esquerdo. É uma lesão que tem um sinal hiperintenso, quando comparado com o restante tecido, e permitirá duas conclusões. Como não respeita a linha média, tem um efeito massa. Por outro lado, a compressão evidente do tronco cerebral, ali entre aquelas duas setas, indica que, presumivelmente, haverá um aumento da pressão intracraniana. E não é possível localizar a lesão em intra ou extraaxial. De uma sequência ponderada em T1, neste caso, pós-contraste, a única informação que temos é que o sinal não intensifica de maneira importante após com o contraste, a não ser naquela linha hiperintensa que delimita a lesão. Assim, juntando todos os dados que tínhamos recolhido até agora, é possível elaborar uma lista de diagnósticos diferenciais para esta lesão e nunca podemos descartar a presença de uma lesão inflamatória, neste caso um granuloma. No entanto, devido à idade e ao início e progressão dos sinais clínicos, juntamente com o facto de ter respondido inicialmente à medicação corticoide e depois desta ter deixado de fazer efeito, foi considerada uma neoplasia como principal diagnóstico diferencial. Hum, dentro das neoplasias, não, não sendo possível localizar intra ou extraaxial, considerou-se principalmente um meningioma, um tumor parenquimatoso como um glioma, um tumor de nervo craniano ou de vaso sanguíneo. E proposto a realização de cirurgia para, se possível, a excisão da massa, mas principalmente a obtenção de um diagnóstico. Assim, durante a cirurgia verificou-se que a lesão era intraaxial e, por outro lado, tinha um aspecto macroscópico muito semelhante ao, ao restante tecido nervoso, o que levou ao abandono da ideia de remover a massa e fez-se apenas uma biópsia incisional para se obter o diagnóstico definitivo. Logo após a colheita de material, fez-se uma observação microscópica e a imagem que está à vossa direita, a imagem que nós vimos na altura, tem, é, uma, é uma lesão com elevada densidade celular e células redondas e com um citoplasma relativamente abundante levou a um diagnóstico presumido de linfoma, mesmo sabendo que um linfoma primário do sistema nervoso é algo bastante raro ou pouco comum. Assim, tendo isto em consideração, foi instituído um tratamento quimioterápico com lamostina, que é um fármaco normalmente é bastante eficaz no tratamento não só de linfoma do sistema nervoso, mas também de tumores parenquimatosos, como o um glioma, que era um dos diagnósticos diferenciais, e é bastante eficaz. No entanto, é considerado um fármaco de segunda linha devido aos graves efeitos que, que produz não só sobre o fígado, mas sobre a medula óssea. E naquele protocolo de três semanas. E aqui temos o Scott. Aproximadamente duas semanas após a toma da lamostina. É um Scott bastante diferente, muito mais animado. Uh, muitos sinais neurológicos tinham regredido, estavam controlados. No entanto, o nível hepático, ele estava, o, nível enzima, o nível das enzimas estava bastante elevado e também se revelou bastante anémico, mas era previsível. Entretanto, foi conhecido o diagnóstico definitivo e era um doloblastoma. E o que é um doloblastoma? Foi a pergunta que os estagiários fizeram na altura. Um doloblastoma é um tumor uh, do, que pertence ao grupo dos tumores primitivos da neuroctoderma. Um, ou seja, é um tumor indiferenciado e este especificamente cresce apenas a partir das camadas germinativas do cerebelo. Um, é mais comum, normalmente, em animais jovens, no entanto, cães gigados parecem ser uma exceção e surgem em animais adultos. Um, imagiologicamente, a descrição é, que existe é muito semelhante à que nós obtivemos, mas como é raramente diagnosticado, não, não foi considerado nos, nos diferenciais. Tem sempre um prognóstico bastante reservado, seja em medicina humana, ou em medicina veterinária. No entanto, em medicina humana, é a neoplasia intracraniana maligna mais comum em pediatria. Hum, já em medicina veterinária, como eu disse, é cerca de menos de 3% de todos os diagnósticos, todos os tumores cranianos diagnosticados, são do lobo das tomas. Hum, em medicina humana, o tempo de sobrevivência tem aumentado, principalmente pelo tratamento que inclui hum, a excisão cirúrgica, 
e, e radioterapia, peço desculpa. Em casos mais graves, junta-se uma quimioterapia que normalmente utiliza a lomostina. Portanto, mesmo sem saber, estávamos no caminho certo. Em medicina veterinária não temos esses recursos todos. Normalmente os animais são eutanasiados ainda antes de se obter um diagnóstico definitivo. Daí estar associada a tão mau prognóstico. Então, porquê é que inicialmente pensámos que fosse um, dolor, um linfoma? Esta confusão está descrita em pelo menos dois artigos e, olhando bem para as imagens, não parecem assim tão diferentes eh, quando não há recurso a colorações diferenciais ou imunostoquímica ou até para quem não está a pensar que vai encontrar um dolobulastoma. Assim, achámos bastante aceitável termos feito essa confusão e, a nível terapêutico, não havia muitas alterações a fazer. E, assim sendo, chegámos às três semanas, à altura em que deveria tomar nova dose de, de lomostina, no entanto, o nível de ALT, fatais alcalino, e os níveis de hematócrito não permitiam que o Scott voltasse a tomar lomostina. Iríamos agravar toda a sua condição uh, física. Então, optámos por outro protocolo, citarabina mais antilprednisolona, que, por norma, é aplicado a tumores hematopoéticos como linfoma. Uh, no entanto, como a citarabina penetra muito bem pela barreira hematoencefálica e a sua hepatotoxicidade é quase inexistente, optou-se por este protocolo. E temos então aqui o Scott. Quase duas semanas após a citarabina, tinha regredido bastante, a maioria dos sinais neurológicos regressaram, estava muito mais desequilibrado, mais prostrado e bastante desconfortável. E como já estava melhor a nível hepático e da anemia, ponderou-se regressar à, à lombostina, para ver se conseguíamos voltar a ter o Scott mais controlado. No entanto, os proprietários não permitiram, nem essa nem qualquer outra opção de tratamento quimioterápico e foi apenas instituído um tratamento paliativo para tentar prolongar a qualidade de vida do Scott. Este tratamento foi composto por tilprenizolona e tramazol, que parecia ter algumas dores e, infelizmente, uma semana depois, o Scott foi eutanasiado. Pronto. Agora, porque é que, não sou eu, mas o Dr. João Ribeiro, o Dr. Joaquim Henriques, consideramos que este caso era interessante uh, para, para vos trazer aqui. Uh, aqui estão os sete artigos que eu consegui encontrar de descrição de casos clínicos de endoloblastoma. Portanto, o seu diagnóstico não é uma novidade. No entanto, destes sete, seis conseguiram o seu diagnóstico após a morte do animal. Apenas este refere o seu diagnóstico em vida. Volto a lembrar, foram os que eu consegui encontrar. O Dr. João Ribeiro também não conseguiu encontrar outros. Um, e neste artigo, refere-se um terria de 6 anos, que fez ressonância, foi detectada uma massa intracraniana e acabou por ser diagnosticado como um tuloblastoma. Esta massa foi, foi retirada cirurgicamente. Uh, no entanto, não houve qualquer tratamento adjuvante e não havendo melhoria de sinais clínicos, o animal foi tonaseado três Falta semanas um minuto. depois. Um, portanto, no nosso conhecimento dos três, dos três autores, um, o Scott seria o primeiro uh, cão que, ah, esqueci-me de dizer, também há registros em gatos, porcos, vitelos e macacos do lóbulo estômago. Uh, não é só no cão. Um, assim sendo, no nosso conhecimento dos três autores, este seria o, o Scott seria o primeiro caso a ser descrito de um cão que, tendo sido diagnosticado com duloblastoma em vida, foi, uh, foi capaz de iniciar um tratamento que controlou os sinais clínicos. Não foi durante muito tempo, sabemos isso, mas durante aproximadamente um mês ele esteve bastante bem e durante mais duas semanas esteve razoavelmente bem, com boa qualidade de vida, que é, para nós, uma novidade. Pronto. Muito obrigado. Estão abertas as inscrições para 5 minutos.
Rita, uh, penso que não ficou muito claro se depois de ser este animal foi feito algum exame anatomopatológico? Ah, foi, foi. Uh, eu não sei se posso mexer. Uh, entretanto, após a ressonância, após a cirurgia e após a instituição do tratamento com a lomostina, veio o diagnóstico definitivo de medulobulostoma, uh, histologicamente. Uma questão, para colocar, se não passamos já à comunicação seguinte. Muito obrigada, Ana Rita. Tem uma questão, tem uma questão. Tem uma questão. Depois de, ser, de se ter diagnosticado o medulobulastoma, não havia qualquer possibilidade de tentativa de cirurgia? Sim, havia, claro, mas uh, os proprietários não estavam muito receptivos a essa ideia. Então, foi continuámos o tratamento quimioterápico, simplesmente. Okay. Em medicina veterinária estamos um bocadinho limitados pelos proprietários. Okay. Muito obrigado. A seguir teremos o Dr. Francisco Fernandes, que nos apresentará um case report de meninja encefalocela e tumoidal num cão. Pode passar. Boa tarde. O meu nome é Fran... o meu nome é Francisco Fernandes. Terminei o mestrado integrado em medicina veterinária cá anotado em 2010 e posteriormente fez o um internato também cá no hospital e um pequeno período como técnico. Trago-vos cá as jornadas internacionais um caso clínico do menino em cefalocel é tomoidal no, num caminho. Uh, começando com uma breve definição de meningo encefalocel, é uma produção de tecido cerebral em meninges uh, através de uma abertura anormal existente no crânio. Quando essa produção é somente das meninges, denomina-se meningocel. Uh, quando, quando a produção uh, é de somente do cérebro, uh, denomina-se encefalocel. Uh, em qualquer um dos casos, desenvolve-se sempre no primeiro terço da gestação. Uh, Ocorre-se na região mundial, com maior uh, frequência na região occipital e com menor frequência na região frontal e etmoidal. Baseando-se noutras espécies, poderão estar envolvidos fatores genéticos e ou ambientais. As convulsões são um sinal uh, neurológico mais comum e estas são explicadas, quer seja pela, pela hemorragia, pela osteomalácia que ocorre, pela desnarecência da matéria branca e, e pelo infiltrado inflamatório que ocorre na zona da produção. Neste momento há dois casos publicados, um por Jeffrey em 2005, eh, em cujo diagnóstico de meningocefalocel foi feito por histopatologia e outro em 2009 por Merkel, eh, cujo diagnóstico foi feito também por tomografia computarizada. Eh, mas aqui foi feita uma reconstrução cirúrgica da, do, da, do, do menino encefalocel. Passando ao nosso caso clínico, é um canídeo de raça Cocker Spaniel em inglês, fêmea inteira, com 4 meses de idade, que há consultas com uma história de convulsões generalizadas do tipo tónico-clónico. O filme que eu irei passar agora, espero que está operacional desta vez, é somente de convulsões clónicas. Uh, eram normalmente as convulsões que, que o, o nome da, da cadela era Polga, que a Polga tinha, eram, sempre, eram quase sempre uh, clónicas a partir de uma certa fase. Nunca, não, 
Não é? Peço desculpa. Não apresentava perda de consciência e apresentava e, e parecia ali. Ao exame neurológico, a, realizava círculos apertados para o lado direito, como temos ver neste filme. Apresentava também uh, estrabismo do globo ocular direito, déficits proprioceptivos no membro posterior esquerdo e déficits na reação de emendamento do, do, no lado direito. Também constatou-se que apresentava crata conjunto de seca bilateral, tendo na altura ter sido feito o tratamento adequado. Como uh, exames complementares, observou-se a nível da hematologia uma ligeira leucocitose, a nível da bioquímica apresentava um ligeiro aumento da LT, bilirrubina total e fósforo orgânico. Foi realizado um PCR de esgana e arlica, com resultado negativo, e foi feito também um despisto de irofilar e, e, e mitis, uh, pelo médico note e, e serologia, também com resultado negativo. Por também na altura da, da consulta apresentar uh, diarreia de, de, de cor amarelada, foi, um, um foi feito um exame coprológico, onde foi possível uh, observar que, tinha, que era positiva a giardia, também tendo sido feito o tratamento adequado. Uh, Realizou-se também a pesquisa do, do antigênio para o vírus nas fezes pelo método de ELISA, também com resultado negativo, por apresentar uh, uh, corrimento nasal uh, bilateral e, e também por vezes epistaxis, foi feito uma citologia nasal, onde se observou agentes uh, da flora normal da cavidade nasal. Como disse, como apresentava uh, por vezes epistaxis e apresentava provas de coagulação normais, fez uma rinoscopia e citologia intranasal, uh, mas só se observou de sido normal, sem infecção ou inflamação. Nesta altura, optou-se por, por passar para, para a tomografia computarizada. Uh, e, na, e aí observamos uma massa a nível da cavidade nasal com comunicação para a cavidade cerebral. Passamos à tomografia computarizada. Aqui temos o topograma, onde podemos ver os cortes uh, realizados. Uh, de referir com os cortes transversais, ou seja, assim, de, estes cortes que eu irei apresentar, irão começar da pressão rostral para a pressão caudal. Na imagem da esquerda, uma imagem transversal, a nível da pressão rostral da cavidade nasal, podemos ver a presença de uma massa anormal para o sítio, para o local. A nível, na imagem da direita, na, numa, numa imagem transversal, a nível da pressão caudal da cavidade nasal, podemos ver a presença dessa massa com maior diâmetro comparado à, à imagem rostral. Nesta imagem podemos ver alterações marcadas a nível dos seios frontais e da placa cribriforme, que são mais evidentes na sua janela óssea. Nesta imagem transversal podemos ver alterações a nível dos lobos frontais e bulbos olfativos. E nesta imagem transversal, a mais caudal comparada às anteriores, vemos alterações, ligeiras alterações dos pedúnculos olfativos. Na imagem da esquerda, uma imagem sagital, podemos ver a ausência da placa cribriforme, com passagem de tecido cerebral para a cavidade nasal. Na imagem da direita, uma reconstrução 3D da tomografia computarizada, vemos alterações marcadas na normal arquitetura do osso frontal. Nesta altura foi feito um diagnóstico presuntivo de encefalocele epimoidal. Iniciou-se um tratamento somente uh, com anticonvulsivos, uh, começou-se com fenobarbital a 2 mg a quilo, que foi uh, aumentado gradualmente para um maior controle das, das convulsões, até à dose de 3 mg a quilo para os BID. Também foi receitado de ACPAN 1 mg a quilo em SOS, uh, sempre que o animal apresentava convulsões fora do hospital. Uh, o animal esteve bem uh, durante mais ou menos 12 meses, uh, teve uma vida minimamente aceitável. Uh, passado 18, 18 meses, ele apresentava 4 a 5 convulsões por mês, com uma duração de 1 um minuto e meio, e continuava com os círculos apertados para o, para o lado direito e estrabismo do, do, globo, do olho direito. Passado 24 meses, desde, desde que 
ou seja, aos dois anos de idade, devido ao aumento da frequência e intensidade das convulsões e em alteração do comportamento, o animal foi eutanasiado e, e realizamos a necrópsia. Nesta imagem aqui, uh, após ser retirada a pressão dorsal ao encéfalo, podemos ver uh, o cérebro, uh, neste caso as meninges e o cérebro por baixo, onde há uma extensão uh, das meninges e do cérebro para a cavidade nasal. Ou seja, vai mais ou menos até esta zona. Após retirarmos as meninges, a menisque, podemos ver a extensão do cérebro no interior da cavidade nasal. Após ter sido retirado o cérebro, podemos ver uh, a extensão do lado direito do cérebro. Uh, esta zona aqui já são, ainda já são meninges. E, além disso, o lado esquerdo apresentava alterações marcadas na normal anatomia. Nesta imagem da direita, vemos alterações marcadas da placa cribriforme, estando esta deslocada toda para o lado direito. Nesta altura, confirmou-se o diagnóstico de meningoencefalocel etmoidal. Como considerações finais, fazendo uma pequena comparação com os dois casos até agora descritos, no caso do Jeffrey, o animal teve que ser eutanasiado aos seis meses de idade, por não ser possível com o controle das convulsões. E no nosso caso conseguimos um, um controle mínimo, uh, somente com, tra com tratamento anticonvulsivo. Por outro lado, Martel, em 2009, ao fazer o diagnóstico num animal com mais ou menos na mesma idade que tinha a polga quando foi feito o diagnóstico, optou pelo tratamento cirúrgico, com uma reconstrução cirúrgica e teve o, o sucesso pretendido, que era o terminar as convulsões. Uh, daí isto ser um tratamento a ser considerado em futuros casos se for possível realizá-lo. Estas foram as referências que eu utilizei. Se alguém uh, quiser algum dos artigos que eu referi atrás, ou alguma bibliografia, uh, poderá, poderá me pedir ou, ou, pedir ou mandar um e-mail para Francisco Ayn Fernandes, que eu terei todo o gosto em ajudar. Obrigado. Tem agora cinco minutos para perguntas. Pronto. Muito obrigado, então. Obrigado. Passaremos agora à Marta Alegria com o tema Discospondilite por corpo estranho num cão. Antes de mais, boa tarde. Sou a Marta Alegria, sou aluna finalista do curso de Medicina Veterinária e venho-vos aqui apresentar um caso que pude acompanhar uh, este ano quando fiz o meu estágio curricular aqui em Portugal. Então, vamos apresentar um caso de discospondilite por corpo estranho num cão e nunca é mais, nunca é mais referir que então, a discospondilite é uma inflamação do disco intervertebral e das vértebras adjacentes. Então... O caso se refere a um canídeo, perdigueiro português, uma fêmea castrada aos 7 meses de idade e que à data da consulta tinha 3 anos. Era um cão de companhia, mas também utilizado para a caça. Veio, eu tinha a história de pneumotórax, resolvida há cerca de 2 anos, e de escospondilita em L5, que foi tratada com antibioterapia adequada. Apareceu à consulta de referência de neurologia por, por apresentar uma discospondilite recorrente em L2 e L3. E esta recidivava sempre que deparava a antibioterapia. Isto começou a surgir uns seis meses antes dela vir à consulta de, de referência. Desde a mesma altura, começaram a surgir umas fístulas cutâneas na região torácica cranial e abdomen... torácica caudal e abdominal cranial, que foram exploradas cirurgicamente, mas sem qualquer, sem qualquer... Sem chegarmos a qualquer conclusão. Os donos também referiram que ao longo desse tempo ela tinha vindo a perder peso. Foi feito então o um exame neurológico, que a marcha estava normal, como podemos ver, a avaliação craniana também não tinha alterações, assim como 
as reações posturais e os reflexos. A, noutra, a única alteração que foi observada foi a sensibilidade à palpação da coluna vertebral, lombar, cranial. Então, temos como principal diagnóstico diferencial a discospondilite. No entanto, temos que pôr também na mesa outra, outras, outros diagnósticos possíveis. Tendo então outras doenças inflamatórias, como a epidurite, um, espondilite, um, fisite vertebral, assim como neoplasias, com tumores vertebrais e, ou, ou linfoma até. Exames complementares realizados. A partir dos anos imagiológicos mais avançados, como a ressonância magnética, porque já tinha sido sujeita a vários estudos radiográficos que, de facto, tinham demonstrado que havia alterações das extremidades de L2 e de L3 e que tinham demonstrado que se passava alguma coisa na região ventral estas vértebras. Mas não tinha sido conclusivo e com os antibióticos não tínhamos, não tínhamos obtido melhoras prolongadas. Foi utilizada uma ressonância de baixo campo e foram realizadas sequências ponderadas em T1, ponderadas em T2, STIR. Foi então administrado contraste de gadolínio e, seguidamente, foram realizadas sequências ponderadas em T1. Então, temos aqui duas imagens de, uh, ponderadas em T1. A primeira é para sagital e esta é sagital. Conseguimos ver então aqui que há uma hipointensidade dos corpos vertebrais L2 e L3. E aqui também. Vemos que há, o que conseguimos observar aqui é que há aqui uma estrutura ligeiramente hipointensa, com um halo hiperintenso, que também é aqui observada, e aqui há toda uma, uma alterações de hipointensidade difusas, que não são muito conclusivas. O T1, as imagens ponderadas em T1 são boas para avaliar a anatomia. Então, de seguida, realizou-se imagem ponderada em T2, que são boas para patologias, para avaliar patologias. O que vai evidenciar são os fluidos e as gorduras. Temos aqui que é normal então, a gordura epidural e conseguimos observar então que aquela estrutura visualizada em T1 eh, teve maior hipointensidade em T2 e, e o halo à sua volta aumentou de hiperintensidade. Também consegue-se visualizar aqui que a tal a alteração que existe aqui está a fazer compressão na, na, na horta abdominal e que a empurra eh, ventralmente. Foi então realizado também um corte dorsal de, em STIR. O que é que o STIR faz? Vai suprimir uh, o que é gordura e o que vai sobressair é o líquido, tudo o que é fluido. Então vemos que aqui toda a zona para vertebral, a L2 e L3, ganha uh, hiperintensidade, tanto desta zona, mas também sistema cranial e caudalmente. Após a admissão de, de contraste, são as sequências ponderadas em T1, e que vemos que há a captação de contraste aqui das extremidades vertebrais de L2 e de L3 e captação de contraste difuso de toda esta região. Em corte transversal, para vermos realmente o que é que era aquele, uh, aquela estrutura estranha que estava ali, e vemos então que numa zona ventrolateral esquerda, na ressonância e este é o lado esquerdo e este é o lado direito. Uh, vemos então aqui uma estrutura com intensidade similar à do músculo, que isto é tudo músculo, com um halo de, uh, ligeiramente hiperintenso que intensificou após contraste. Também vemos um aumento, uma intensificação após contraste difuso desta zona para vertebral. Diagnóstico, então, foi feito diagnóstico de discospondilite e de retroperitonite ao nível da L2 e da L3, com uma estrutura que era compatível com o corpo estranho. Formulada então a hipótese de existir um corpo estranho, partiu-se para a cirurgia e depois de um tratamento médico. Cirurgia. Então, o acesso foi feito pelo lado esquerdo do animal. Temos então aqui a cranial, a caudal, o lado direito e o lado esquerdo. O primeiro passo foi fazer o, desbride, o desbridamento da fibrose que existia e da identificação então, do possível corpo estranho que se encontra aqui. Após a identificação, Procedeu-se à remoção do mesmo e a limpeza e lavagem cirúrgica profunda de toda a zona. Então, temos aqui o, o corpo estranho, que foi possível identificar como sendo uma pragana. E, e um fragmento deste corpo estranho foi então enviado para a cultura e testes de sensibilidade a antibióticos, os quais vieram negativos. O tratamento médico, então, passou pela administração 
de anti-inflamatórios não esteroides, após, uh, por ter sido sujeito à cirurgia, assim como antibióticos, durante quatro semanas ou então até aquelas fístulas vistas no, durante a consulta fecharem por completo. E repouso, obviamente. Dois meses após a cirurgia, o animal já tinha ganho peso, apresentava uma melhor atitude, ou seja, aquelas queixas dolorosas que ele tinha no início já tinham desaparecido e já tinha aumentado então o nível da atividade física. Há controle radiográfico. Foi possível então ver que ainda havia ligeiras alterações da radioopacidade, de L2 e de L3. Aqui pode haver alguma união destas vértebras e o seu aparecimento de espondilose deformante, que podem ser estas duas coisas consequências de disco espondilite. Até à data, não voltaram a acontecer mais recidivas. Então, está mais ou menos provado que o aparecimento de, de corpos estranhos deste género pode surgir por três vias. A via respiratória, por inalação, a via cutânea, por penetração e depois migração, obviamente, e pela via do, do trato gastrointestinal perfurando. Neste caso, pensamos que terá sido pela via respiratória, também sendo um cão de caça e estar constantemente em contato com este tipo de material vegetal. E então, posteriormente, devido àquele tal pneumatório que sofreu, este, a pragana pode ter perfurado as vias respiratórias e migrado até aquelas vértebras. Porquê aquelas vértebras? Porque a migração que sofre vai pelo, pelo, diafrag, pelo diafragma, vai pela crura do diafragmática e esta vai se inserir um, entre L2 e L4. E, e aqui temos a... E é como no nosso caso, se a, a, o corpo estranho situava-se entre L2 e L3, suspeitamos que esta terá sido, então, a origem do, do corpo estranho. A bibliografia utilizada. Obrigada. Cinco minutos para questões. Muito obrigado, Marta. A seguir segue-se a doutora Núria Queijas, que, cujo tema é quiroprática animal, principais subluxações vertebrais encontradas em seis cães de raça labrador e golden retrievier, com displasia coxo femoral e seus benefícios terapêuticos. Bem, boa tarde a todos. Eh, Meu nome é Nuria Otero. Vou a dar a charla em castellano, espero que não, que não haja problema. Eh, Vou falar de um trabalho que hemos feito eh, sobre o tratamento quiropráctico sem influência em oito perros afectados com displasia coxo femoral, em colaboração com a doctora Katia Motasa e a doctora Valle Sánchez Raez. Bien, como introducción, eh, diré que la displasia cosofemoral, como ya sabemos todos, pues es una de las dolencias osteoarticulares más comunes que nos encontramos en la clínica habitual, que afecta sobre todo a razas grandes y medianas, tiene mucha relación eh, con la genética, con la nutrición, con el ambiente y eh, ocurre la incongruencia e inestabilidad articular entre la cabeza femoral y eh, la cavidad eh, acetabular y a la larga eh, genera una dolencia articular degenerativa que va a provocar dolor, inflamación, una atrofia muscular importante eh, por desuso de la, de la zona afectada, de las extremidades por el dolor, pero también tenemos que tener en cuenta que posiblemente haya eh, una hipertrofia en las extremidades torácicas precisamente por compensación. Los perros sintomáticos caminan con una amplitud de paso más corto, muy característica, y también que eh, es de destacar, sobre todo para el diagnóstico y el tratamiento quiropráctico, que caminan en flexión, con las extremidades en flexión, porque el movimiento de extensión de la cadera les resulta doloroso. Bien, la displasia corsofemoral provee una alteración de la biomecánica funcional no solo en las extremidades o en la extremidad afectada. Hay que tener en cuenta que va a afectar a toda la columna vertebral. Consecuentemente, va a tener un efecto directo sobre todo el sistema musculoesquelético y nervioso y puede afectar a la salud general del animal. Como concepto, rápidamente explicaré que la quiropráctica 
es la profesión sanitaria que se dedica al diagnóstico y al tratamiento de las alteraciones del sistema musculoesquelético y sus repercusiones sobre el sistema nervioso y la salud en general. Es muy evidente que cualquier eh, alteración en la columna vertebral pues va a provocar una alteración nerviosa por compresión de raíces espinales, de nervios espinales, que tiene una repercusión directa en el estado de salud del animal. En quiropráctica, una subluxación vertebral eh, no es un hueso fuera de sitio. Una subluxación vertebral es una lesión biomecánica, es decir, es una alteración entre el movimiento de, en el movimiento entre dos vértebras, que generalmente eh, produce una hipomovilidad, o sea, una falta de movilidad, una rigidez entre ellas. Como consecuencia, pues sabemos que la raíz nerviosa sale por el foramen intervertebral, va a ocurrir una compresión nerviosa, vamos a tener un compromiso neurológico y una afectación directa del sistema nervioso, del sistema musculoesquelético y visceral también, porque esto puede afectar a cualquier órgano o víscera que esté bajo la influencia de ese, de ese nervio y vamos a tener síntomas y signos clínicos musculoesqueléticos tales como una restricción del movimiento, dolor, rigidez y espasmo muscular, una atrofia muscular por desuso, alteraciones en la postura por compensación y podemos tener falta de coordinación pues, por un síndrome neuromuscular posterior. Bien, como vemos, eh, la raíz nerviosa es muy sensible a compresiones por su localización dentro del foramen intervertebral, está rodeado por estructuras óseas y por estructuras blandas, por tanto, es muy sensible a cualquier compresión, inflamación, edema, etcétera, etcétera. Esto va a resultar en una compresión que puede afectar no solo al sistema musculoesquelético, sino también al sistema visceral. El tratamiento quiropráctico se llama ajuste, que es una manipulación vertebral. El ajuste consiste en un movimiento muy controlado y muy específico que se, se caracteriza por ser de alta velocidad, eh, con una orientación muy específica y de corta palanca. Es decir, según el segmento de la columna que estemos tratando, aquí vemos un ejemplo de un ajuste lumbar, un ajuste cervical o un ajuste de un apex sacral, pues va a ser distinta la orientación. Es muy importante colocar bien las manos, observar el, el ángulo correcto de ajuste para, pues para tener un efecto, el efecto deseado. Está dirigido eh, sobre todo para corregir un complejo de solusación vertebral, que es eh, lo que más se trata en quiropráctica, pero también se puede corregir un complejo de solusación en cualquier otra articulación del cuerpo, no solo se manipula la columna vertebral. El ajuste quiropráctico tiene un efecto directo sobre las articulaciones subluxadas, va a restaurar su movimiento, su biomecánica y va a liberar las restricciones en ese impulso nervioso de la raíz nerviosa que va por ese foramen. ¿Vale? Sobre, tiene un efecto directo sobre los receptores nerviosos que lo rodean, vamos a tener un efecto directo sobre los mecanorreceptores aumentando el input, pero vamos a tener también un efecto sobre los nociceptores disminuyendo el input eh, nociceptor, pero también sobre todas las estructuras tisulares que lo rodean. Como consecuencia, la transmisión del impulso nervioso se va a restablecer y se va a realizar de una manera libre y sin interferencias. El objetivo de este trabajo es la determinación de un patrón común de subluxaciones en la columna vertebral de animales afectados por displasia coxofemoral y la valoración de la influencia del tratamiento quiropráctico sobre el dolor, la rigidez y la movilidad y biomecánica de la columna vertebral, no solo sobre las extremidades. En ocho perros de raza labrador y golden retriever, que son razas muy propensas a, a padecer la displasia coxofemoral, con edades entre 2 y 12 años, sintomáticos, con dolor y rigidez toracolumbar, dolor dorsal, con renuencia a hacer ejercicio, a subir obstáculos, etcétera, etcétera. Pues hemos hecho un examen quiropráctico, hemos determinado las sublusaciones, los hemos ajustado según eh, el caso en, con, en concreto y también hemos determinado una frecuencia de ajustes, empezando por unos ajustes semanales y después espaciándolos quincenal y mensualmente, siempre de acuerdo con la evolución de cada animal. Aquí eh, vemos unos ejemplos de ajustes sacroiliacos, como veis los, los, perdón, los ángulos tienen que estar muy, muy bien observados y muy bien conservados, ajustes lumbares para la columna lumbar, también ajustes de extremidades pues para el fémur, para extremidades delanteras, para calcáneo, ajustes de vértebras torácicas, vemos que es un ángulo diferente, ajustes también de vértebras cervicales, tracción de la cola y trabajo sobre el ligamento sacrotuberoso que se llama técnica de, de Logan. 
Como resultado, encontramos que todos los animales que se presentaron a clínica con estos síntomas tenían en común, antes del tratamiento, sublusaciones en la región sacral, sacrilia, columbar y torácica. Es decir, toda la columna estaba afectada, con mayor o menor incidencia según el segmento. Todos tenían dolor, todos tenían hipomovilidad toracolumbar, lumbosacra y sacropélvica, y limitación de la movilidad de los miembros posteriores, rigidez y espasmo muscular. Las solusaciones que encontramos, la localización, las solusaciones lumbares las encontramos en todos los animales, en, ocho, en los ocho animales. Las solusaciones en flexión, es decir, como expliqué antes, los animales eh, afectados de displasia coxofemoral van encogidos, llevan la cadera en flexión y la espalda también en flexión. Son vértebras que tienen restringido el movimiento de dorsal a ventral. No es que estén desplazadas, no están fuera de sitio, es que no se mueven libremente de arriba abajo, de dorsal a ventral. Esto es una solusación en flexión y lo hemos encontrado en los ocho animales. Solusaciones sacroilíacas, que se llaman PI, también en flexión porque andan encogidos. Había una hipomovilidad, una restricción del movimiento de las articulaciones sacroilíacas en seis animales de los presentados a clínica. Solusaciones torácicas en, seis, en cinco animales y sacrales en cinco animales. Como destaca, para destacar, eh, que las solusaciones lumbares encontradas eran todas caudales a la tercera lumbar. Esto es muy importante porque coincide anatómicamente con la localización del plexo lumbosacro. Entonces, en un 100% encontramos problemas lumbares con solusaciones lumbares. En un 80% hemos encontrado alteraciones en las articulaciones sacroilíacas. En un 80% torácicas y sacrales. Entonces, nos quedamos con que eh, la displasia de cadera tiene un efecto directo sobre la biomecánica de la columna, no solamente sobre la cadera y, en concreto, sobre las vértebras lumbares. Como conclusiones, diré que a lo largo del tratamiento los animales evaluados fueron manifestando una mejoría clínica, tanto en la columna vertebral como en las extremidades, y concluimos que el diagnóstico y tratamiento quiropráctico fue determinante para esto porque no fueron medicados ni tratados con ninguna otra terapia. El tratamiento quiropráctico no solo corrige los complejos de solusación vertebral en las, en las vértebras o en cualquier otra articulación del cuerpo. Tiene una acción directa en el sistema nervioso y, sobre, y también sobre las estructuras alrededor del foramen intervertebral. Esto lo, hace, lo hacemos liberando de restricciones el impulso nervioso, actuando directamente sobre eso y también optimizando la función del sistema nervioso de todos los músculos y de todas las vísceras y órganos que están bajo la influencia de ese segmento espinal. Obrigado. Si tenéis alguna pregunta, pues podéis recurrir a, a nosotras en cualquier de estos correos electrónicos. Cinco minutos, por favor. Muito obrigado. Uh, eu tinha uma questão. Oh, oh, Núria, Núria, Núria tinha, tinha aqui uma questão ou duas. Um, ficaram, ficaram algumas dúvidas. Uh, em relação, um, portanto, podemos verificar que vocês detectam em 100% dos animais observados uh, subluxações. Estou entendendo, Rata, perdona. Mas posso tentar falar um pouco de portanhol? Uh, em, em 100% dos perros, sí, sí. Uh, há detectado diferentes tipos, mas sempre subluxações. Lumbar, vale? sim, sí, subluxação lumbar. Vale. Um, para mim, não é claro um, aquilo que, te, que tu falas como melhoria dos sinais espinhais, uh -huh. quais foram em concreto dados de exame neurológico que os perros tinham e depois deixaram de ter. Outra pergunta. Uh, há feito algum grupo de controle? Porque tens uma faixa etária muito ampla, 2, 12 anos. Es un grupo sí, muy disperso, sí, son... no lo sé también las características uh, de la displasia, lo grado, también sería importante, uh -huh. el grupo, lo ven es muy pequeño, para hacer un tratamiento estatístico, y si sí, lo has hecho algún grupo control. No, no hemos hecho ningún, ningún grupo de control, no, es, un, es un grupo pequeño, eh, estaban afectados de displasia, de displasias de grado medio, podríamos decir de grado 2-3, vamos, no no de un grado de displasia muy avanzado. Y, y en términos de sinais neurológicos, lo que has visto que ha mejorado. Ha mejorado mucho la movilidad, el dolor, eh, lo que son el reflejo panicular, la, la, la sensibilidad al tocar en la espalda y a, a lo que hemos destacado, lo que hemos encontrado es que mejoró muchísimo la, la agilidad, 
y sobre todo el, el movimiento de los perros y la flexibilidad de la columna vertebral. Uh -huh. También encontramos una optimización de, de todos los, los, los músculos paravertebrales y de los músculos de las extremidades. Hemos visto que tenían mayor tono muscular y mejor movilidad, no solo en la columna, después de los ajustes vertebrales. Vale, pero en todos estos eh, que has visto, sería importante hacer una cuantificación. ¿Perdón? Tendrías que hacer una cuantificación uh -huh. ¿no? para que se pueda tornar algo de objetivo. Uh -huh. Bueno, muchas gracias. Gracias. Chegamos assim ao fim do primeiro dia de palestras, espero que tenha sido de vosso agrado. Retomaremos amanhã pelas 9h40 